and welcome to the Metalheads Podcast. My name is George. This is Jay. This is John. This is Matt. This is Marcus on. And if we're lucky, we might see Will in a little while. So let's hold on and see. Welcome to this latest episode. We're going to do things a little bit differently this time. We have an extra special guest for you today. However, uh, the interview was recorded separately and uh, I was not there for it. I haven't heard it yet. haven't edited it yet. So we're going to put that at the end of the episode today. But spoiler, it's Hannes Grossman. (laughs) I don't know how he managed to do it, but Marcus San snagged as Hannes. And... uh, I had just asked him. Yeah. <laughs> How did you do it? I just asked. Very direct. Very direct. Yeah. yeah well, you down? Yeah, I can do it. Well, you know, that doesn't usually work for me, but uh, I, I'm not. I don't have the magic of Marcus on. So um, oh, this was a lot of fun. So stick around and listen. Yeah. So we're gonna. I'm we're gonna. Looking forward to hearing it. I haven't heard a bit of it yet. Yeah. Um, you better fucking ask some Triptychon questions, or I'm quitting the podcast. That's for sure. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. <laughs> So uh, stick around to the end. If you're one of those people that listens to the first hour and you're like, ah, fuck it, I'm out of here. Uh, I think you might have reason to stick around this time. I don't know. I haven't heard it. Could could fucking suck. Don't blame me if it does. Could be the best, <laughs> be the best part of the episode. Could probably. be. Nothing like, nothing like getting the confidence of the pod father. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, I haven't this heard it yet. His last episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, stick around for that. Uh hey, Jay. I, George, I'm sorry to cut you off. Jay, I will God say one it. thing. Uh, we actually didn't talk a ton, not, no spoiler, about any particular band a long time. We touched on a lot. But I think you'll be happy with the trip to Con. I had a list of boing about the Requiem because he's on the Requiem. And I really wanted to know what it was like for him to play that slow, as weird as it sounds, because that's almost more hard. Uh, more yeah, hard. I mean, I believe it's more harder. Uh, I had a ton more questions we just didn't even we, get we, to we, because, honest, yeah. he really wanted to talk about things other than music because he's lived with oh. it so long, his albums and everything like that. He really got into talking about television and movies and stuff. Well, you know so, what? Then that's another side of them people don't see so that's that's just yeah. Yeah. yeah actually he was more interested in talking about just the whole overall picture of making music not the actual yeah. bands and we'll nice. leave it at that stick right. around excellent yeah. stick around now just to make uh marcus on's friend dan happy we're gonna start with t-shirt and beer check <laughs> <laughs> we are okay wow. and we're only 12 minutes in or two minutes in or whatever yeah that's yeah fast. exactly <laughs> So if you uh, don't count that three hour interview when, yeah, exactly. That's at the end. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. when Will shows up, he's going to be like, you already did t-shirt and beer check. Yeah. <laughs> Will might be wearing a very special t-shirt tonight, by the way. I mailed oh, him something. Let's hope he's not wearing any shirt. He's I'm not a vest with nothing underneath. <laughs> I was hoping he's going to not wear no shirt at all. Uh, well, tonight I'm wearing castles. nipples, oh, nipples yeah. and hair. Maybe a little <laughs> bit of electrical tape. <laughs> electrical tape. <laughs> In X's. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Marcus on, start us off. I am wearing my Dephosphorus shirt. Yeah, uh, but what band? I think, I think they. <laughs> <laughs> or alternately, George, what did you just say about my mother? <laughs> exactly. I think their album came out last year and was on my list. I'm not sure because everything blends together when you listen to so much metal. I am drinking. Uh, the Golden Sabbath from Big Island Brew House. It is a Belgian style Abbey Ale with Hawaiian honey in it. Nice. And I quite enjoy this one. I haven't seen it in a while. Um, and then I came across a bunch, so I, I bought like five of them. Nice. It's very strong. I wish more breweries would uh, venture into Belgian styles in the U.S. Right. Anytime like I a, see the Belgian, a Hawaiian guy, I Belgian. Grab it. That's yeah. sort of like a. Icelandic, you know, Chilean band or something. And also, Sabbath is in the name. Mm-hmm. Oh, what was the name of it? I missed that. Golden Sabbath. Oh, nice. I yes. guess I didn't miss it. Which is kind of what they are right quickly. now. They're kind of Golden Sabbath right now, aren't they? <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> yeah. true. Golden Years. All right, Matt. Okay, me. Uh, I have my Triptychon shirt on, and if anybody is watching at home, you will see me wearing that same shirt in the interview. I wanted to just maintain the continuity of my 
visual. Oh that's my, my back patch for my, uh, yeah. my my battle vest. I took it off of that charge site. <laughs> and then um, what John Matt didn't tell you is he's been wearing it since the interview. <laughs> yeah, You've all been wearing it at the like same shit. time since the interview. Exactly. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to sound continuity. bigger wanted, than my just, house. I wanted to sound the same, so I wore the same shirt just so people <laughs> listeners couldn't tell that there was a break in what was going on. <laughs> um, John, interesting note. I have a I have a Belgian based brewery within it's about a 25 minute bike ride from my house i've been there a few times it's wonderful uh, but tonight i'm drinking it is called old breed by a brewery called indeed it is a bourbon barrel aged barley wine ale i've been drinking a lot of these recently mm. uh, and on the side it says the secrets in the barrel and i would agree that's true but i'm not going to share the secret Jerk! <laughs> I, like, a bitch. I almost feel like that's like a soiling green moment or something, you know. Well, you know, I worked at KFC. I'm not going to tell you the secret recipe for that either. We are soiling yeah. green. That's exactly how Matt's shirt smells. I do smell like soiling green. <laughs> and you are listening to the Metalheads podcast. Like and you can pry it from my cold there. dead hand. <laughs> I feel like that was. The voice. Were you emulating somebody there? Or was that just Charlton random? Heston? You have to. It's a yeah. horrible Heston. I got to listen to the. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I was trying to merge into like Jeff. Oh, Jack, because uh, of the soil Jack green, Miller. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I should have gone straight there. But you took a detour. Yeah. I that was clueless, Bill. I mean, my, imp- my impression isn't that great. So it's not that bad, though. Was, uh, <laughs> now, what were you just doing there? <laughs> it was me. Should he have just had a bad impression? It's <laughs> better when Matt has a few drinks. Do the, do the end of, uh, of uh, Planet of the Apes when he sees the Statue of Liberty. I forget what he says. He's like, You did it. You can't oh, believe it. You know, what it I can only remember from Spaceballs. Uh, All right. Well, then just say Damn like, Dirty Apes. Uh, I was just going no, no, no. to say, damn, you should say damn dirty Jay. Like, oh, Heston. Got it. Was, you know, yeah. <laughs> the only, the letter I always remember is from my cold dead hands. Yeah. Uh-huh. Actually, I always, by the way, like in the my favorite joke for about a week after he died was let's go get it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, too soon. I'm sure even now. Yeah. All right, John. So, um, if you are watching at home, uh, I'm like a performance artist. I'll be changing shirts throughout the episode tonight. <laughs> Cause I have a different shirt on during the interview. Uh, Matt, we do not have a Belgian brewery near us, so you should yeah. consider yourself lucky. Uh, I am wearing. I would like you to visit. Thank you. Fate's warning. Yes. Long day, good night. Ooh. Which should be a long day, hard night. Something coming up here pretty soon. Uh, and I'm drinking Mile Zero. It's a West Coast IPA from Front Royal Brewing in Front Royal, Virginia. Hmm. That's probably all I'm drinking tonight. I got an early morning tomorrow. Right, Jay. What are you wearing? What uh, What are you drinking your water out of, or coffee? No, I'm drinking. Uh, I just well, first of all, I made it to, to pull this off. I made it home in record time. Yes, it uh, is early for Jay. So, yeah. well, I mean, I have, I mean it's uh, earlier for Marcus on, but you know, you later. had to come from work. And the, I came from work. Eight is a lightning speed, and now I'm having what I always have after dinner, which is blue bottle iced coffee. Delicious. Trust me. I am wearing my Slayer. This would be the final campaign tour shirt on the back. It says Oakland arena, which would be, there was two shows after that. And then there was no more Slayer. So this is the third to the last Slayer show. I try not to wear it too much and it still looks in pretty good shape because it does commemorate a pretty special show. Yeah, indeed. Nice. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm wearing my pig destroyer, uh, plague, like plague mask. I have to sure. make a comment on that. I mean, do your beer first, but I have to make a comment on that big destruction. Sure, sure. Well, um, started with something I picked up while on vacation last week in Georgia from uh, Jekyll Island Brewing. <laughs> it's a hop dang diggity IPA. I do declare this this accent stolen from my cousin Vinny. Oh, I didn't catch that. That was actually pretty good. That was the sort of a lilting. The game. judge, uh, Herman Munster guy, had a kind uh, of a okay. accent like that. Well, your biological clock is ticking. <laughs> <laughs> From there, I moved on. I got to, it. Is it any good? No, 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 is it. that beer any hey, good? She did get an Oscar. Let's be, you know. <laughs> so uh, I did my first ever beer exchange <clears throat> with uh, a friend of mine in Texas. And mm. uh, I sent him a shit ton of zombie dust and, uh, and some adroit theory. And he sent me uh, 
like four different things. Uh, one of which is Stash IPA um, from, I think, Independence Brewing. It's the name of the brewery. Yeah, I've heard of them. Okay, good. Uh, it's got a cool. It's got like you know. I feel like. You can't, is that a you Texas can't. beer? Is it, I think. it is. He sent me a bunch of Texas beer. I sent him zombie dust because he couldn't get it there. And, uh, you know, okay. I was going to send How him some more mailing list? local stuff. But, huh? How do I get on that mailing list? Um, you no zombie dust out here on the West Coast. Well, uh, you can guess you have I'll to ask. You off. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, in an in unrelated matter, George, could you send me some beer? <laughs> <laughs> so, I did. I, my comment on your shirt was merely that I. Uh, was swimming today as i so often do and i was using my underwateraudio.com thank you uh-huh. <laughs> void were prohibited Ka-ching. and um and i had thrown a head cage on there and i haven't listened to it since God, probably last year and the song the last song came on and i was like it's i was just reminded how good that fucking record is and also how heavy that how fucking heavy dude anyway that was it i just had a head i picked i Big destroyer experience today that like really pleased me. <laughs> and if the planets stay aligned, we'll see them in a little over a month. Not playing well, that, I, but yeah. So I'm going to go on a little pick destroyer uh, rant. Uh, no, not rant. Uh, you Deep dive. You there you go. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, and you know, so synchronicity, nicely done. Indeed. All right, so let's move on to the news as much as I would rather not, because what the fuck has been going on this past month? Is there a fucking pandemic going on or something? Not that, well, actually one of, one of them could is. could have but, contributed to two of them as far as I'm concerned. Right, so it's been a rough month. These are not done in any order, by the way, to disrespect anybody. No, well, <laughs> it's more of order of first. order of what happened is what okay, I'm going no. by. Good. So okay, first well done, off, well we had uh, the death of Mike Howe, the uh, sometime singer of Metal Church, who replaced uh, David Wayne. Active singer when they when he died. He exactly. was in the band and when he died. Yeah. And uh, I don't know the details other than they're saying that it was a suicide. Um well, actually, I have a thought on that. I'll share what I read. Well, they, they was, said he hung uh, himself, so. Th- they did, but they said, um, um, Metal Church put out a statement that said they felt he was failed by, bear with me here, the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry. So but, I think that he got addicted to opioids or something. Right. That's what I'm guessing, in that yeah. he just couldn't hack that and 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 he, he took oh, he, 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 he took. Day. He took the outdoor, but, and I think I, I, I feel like somebody I know did that as well. Um, I don't know the exact details yeah. on that, although I know that was an issue and, and that's what he did. Um, well, isn't it what Chris, happened to Chris Cornell too? Is they also, uh, well, he did uh, the doctors for the, oh, well, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, he had said that night he was taking, what was the one he was taking? Um, I can't remember. I I believe his wife said, you know, the doctors had failed him and the prescription he was taking, like caused him to be out of his mind. Well, you know, a lot of these, as somebody that has a lot of prescriptions, um, not a lot, but a couple, uh, or (laughs) who just watches TV and gets bombarded by, uh, disclaimers from, from, uh, drugs, uh, a lot of things that you can take, they say, you know, might cause suicidal thoughts. And uh, I find it odd that Chris Cornell and Anthony Bourdain was right around that time too. And now Mike Howe, but they all hanged themselves. I always find that. And Robin Williams choice and Robin Williams. See what he had dementia though. Yeah. But I I, I don't have anything. How did Michael Hutchinson do it? Did he, 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 his was a little like autoerotic, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And Um, David Carradine. David Carradine. David Carradine. <laughs> so, yeah. oh. I don't know why I laugh, but it is funny when David Carradine does apparently. Oh. Well said. I, I will say one thing. I like Mike Howe. I thought he was a great singer. Saw him on the last tour. It was Megadeth. This was a killer show. Megadeth, Metal Church, Amon Marth, and Suicidal Tennis. Suicidal. That was a fucking great tour. Right. Yeah. And I had the good fortune to meet Mike Cow, and he was such a nice guy. He was just a yeah. fucking... I mean, you, we say that so many times, but he was just this regular dude. You know? Yeah. It was just like, That's what everybody's you know, saying. 
and happy to sit around and have a conversation, take a picture. Nice guy. Yeah. I don't know if you've gotten the latest decibel yet. I just got mine yesterday. And uh, the carcass yeah, cover. Yeah. Like three issues ago. I don't know. I mean, I got like two issues in two weeks, so I don't know. I don't know where we are anymore. But uh, but Albert's, uh, you know, little uh, editorial at the beginning uh, talks about it. And I thought it was really nice. And he does uh, have like the suicide hotline at, uh, number at the end, which I thought was pretty classy and cool. And uh, there's also one of the other guys. I don't remember his name now, which one it was. But uh, somebody also did an article on him. So, oh, um, nice. Yeah. yeah. He's he only 55. In- did you see he lived yeah. and died in Eugene, um, John? Eugene, yeah, uh, or, Eugene? Or not Eugene? No, no, Eureka. not Eugene. Uh, Eureka, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, it's up in Eureka. Eureka. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised to hear that. Huh. Yeah, Which, he, by the way, a lot of opioid problems up there. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot going on up there. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's sad. I, I saw them at Prague Power, and he sounded amazing. Uh, yeah. I was when they were touring with was it Saxon? Some people might know I know them by sex on, uh, but I think that they did a tour together and they added them to fill in on a Thursday night. And it just, they were awesome. Maybe Saxon was with Armored Saint. I can't remember, but I saw them there and he was out talking with everybody. I saw yeah. them back in the day. I want to say it was the blessing in disguise tour, but it might've been human factor because I, I feel like I remember going out oh, that shirt's lame. I don't want that. Cause yeah. I, you know, I didn't like that cover. It was just kind of, eh. Um, but it was definitely one of the his first two albums with with Metal Church that I saw them back in the eighties nineties. How old was he? Somebody remind me. Was he 50, 55? 55. 55. 55. That's sad. But you know, yeah. if you think that's the last of the fucking horrible death things, <laughs> think again. We got plenty more where that came in. from. <laughs> We're just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. So then the next day, or possibly the same day, but not reported until the next day, Joey Jordison of Slipknot and various other things. Not a fan, but, you know, certainly Still. a well known dude. Uh, he died as well for reasons unknown thus far. Has, have they ever announced that? I mean, I know he had some physical issues, didn't he? Uh, he yeah. did. From uh, playing? Yeah, a friend of mine is a big fan. No, he had a. He had he a. He had multiple sclerosis. That's what yes. it was. Yeah. That's what it was. He yeah. lost the power in his legs, I think. Yeah. yeah. So that, and that was his that was his main aspect of his drumming was his his footwork. Right. Yeah. So it could be any number of complications. Yeah. That. And yeah. I, I'm not a fan either, and that's not like to be like a shit. It's just no. But but another guy that everybody who spoke about him was like nice fucking guy you ever met, man. Mm-hmm. So many nice and tributes to him. So he must have been like a really good dude. Yeah. He's yeah. a pretty good player too. I mean yeah. That's what I. I mean, I never really listened to Slipknot or anything, but people keep saying what a great player he was and how influential he was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for a lot of kids that are growing up. Yeah, definitely. Fan or not, only forty six. That's my age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fan or not, yeah. it sucks when somebody goes like that. Yeah, I mean, we don't. I, I'm sure not all of us can can be have a consensus that we're all fans of the the names we're going to mention of the bands, but it doesn't matter. They're all part of that world the yeah. people man they're people yeah yeah but and, they're, and they're people yeah yeah obviously and then the day after that because <sighs> so. death didn't take a holiday because your nuts weren't already sore yeah for getting kicked dusty hill of zz top passed away <sighs> right and he was off the tour wasn't he at that point didn't he yeah he, he, for he, like two days two days you know? yeah Damn. Yeah, he had left he the tour. A, he took a break because he had a hip issue. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know if the death is related to that because it hasn't I'm, been said. I'm guessing you know. he had a heart attack probably, but he could have gotten an infection. Who knows? Lost, he could have been like, I'm off the tour. I might as well just drown myself in hookers and cocaine. You don't know. <laughs> oh, no, that's John Entwistle. Oh, I mean, right. He the tour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But well, I, I'll. Maybe take a charge on this one really quick because I'm a huge ZZ Top fan, especially the yeah. early ZZ Top stuff. I just love them. And I would, you know, actually, what I would say is I would recommend watching the Netflix ZZ Top thing if you I haven't. I haven't but seen that is, yet. Sam, the yeah. Sam Dunn. He, yeah. Yes, the Sam Dunn thing. He is such a charming and sweet individual, and he talks about his love for Elvis and that, which I love listening to. And you, you can tell he's a fan. Apparently, Elvis used to go to this restaurant where his mom worked in the fifties, and and he's just like like this kid talking about Elvis. And he he is so obsessed with Elvis that he said he realized he might have a problem, as it were, when 
I, they had, he had, he had to have two dressing rooms. I think it was at each show. One was for him and one was for all the Elvis stuff he brought on every tour <laughs> just to look at. Oh, man. But an, and also by an exemplary singer and player, the guy had a voice like dynamite. And, um, I would also, I, I put it on my Facebook page, but check out from the live album Fandango, um, the, Back, um, back, back to our love affair medley. Trust me, you're, uh-huh. you will hear one of the most amazing things. It's like 14 minutes long, yeah. And they do just scat, they scat through it, do all these really cool things, and it's just like these guys are fucking balls out. And he's the coolest part on the whole thing. So yeah, yeah. yeah I Sorry. listened to that the day after. It was really good. But yeah, that was a shocker. Yeah. So what, shocker. what we should have instead of news, we should have called this in memoriam. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that. like they do on the Oscars and stuff. Um, Next up, um, yeah, besties. but we so just spent more. We spent more time on each person than the Oscars does. So, oh, yeah, that's like <laughs> next, next, <laughs> next, next, this next, next. Although I don't never, I haven't watched the Oscars. Or, no, to say the Grammys, we'll do the that. Grammys too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but Neil nobody Kirk watches away. They show a picture and then boom, they're gone in two seconds. It's like whoa. Yeah. So he he was seventy two by the way. Yeah, seventy two. So this next one, uh, Eric Wagner. Two days ago, you know, we I, I put this on the script that Eric Wagner of Trouble was in the hospital because of uh, COVID pneumonia. And uh, then yesterday, was it yesterday? It was announced, yeah. Uh, they were like, boom, dead. 62? 62. And COVID pneumonia. Can I just say that again? Unvaccinated COVID pneumonia. Go get Before your fucking shots, people. Further. <laughs> Hold on. Before you go any further with that, we have no idea why he wasn't vaccinated. So I, Fair enough, but still. Yeah. Well, what if he, he couldn't get vaccinated? There's plenty of people. I know. I, I know. I know. Of, yeah. I know. It, oh, the, the drummer, drummer, bass player, whatever. Yeah, and uh, not, uh, what was what was the band? Uh, I don't think it was a band I liked. Uh, Maybe it was. Exodus, wasn't it? Who? I think. Drummer from, is, isn't it drummer from Exodus? Who's it? Who's no, no. Surgery? Somebody... Uh, yes, you're right, though, John. Yes, that's just. I know you're talking. I can't think. No, of there was some musician, it was a drummer, bass player, or something like that, um, for a band. I don't think it was a band I liked, but I, I saw the article on it, and he has a condition, and his doctor advised him not to get. Uh, oh, sure. God, I almost had it. Um, anyway, his doctor advised him not to get the vaccine because because of his existing condition. And so he didn't, and the band booted him from their two. They booted him. Period. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Who was that? Yeah, go ahead, and I'll. I'll I, I can't yeah, remember. I'm I mean, sure it was we'll somebody I've heard of, point. but. Um, yeah, it's I guess, not a good band. No. Yeah, I, I feel like it was like a pop punk band, you know, like a Green Day kind of band or something, or right. it wasn't Green Day, but you know. Um, yeah, might, I mean, we I don't know the circumstances it. of it, but I mean. You should get vaccinated. If you're going to die because you just choose not to get vaccinated, hard to have sympathy for me. Die with your boots on, motherfuckers. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, if there's a reason. Yeah, I just think that it's it's irresponsible for anyone to comment that doesn't know. No, fair enough. enough. Yeah, and I and I obviously there are people that have issues. I just don't think it's for any of us to either criticize or support. We just don't know. Right. Um, and but if you're like, I'm not getting it because, I mean, I've got a friend that I've been fighting with, and he's going to hear this at some point, so, motherfucker, get your shot. Um, and I'll see him this weekend, so he won't know I said this. But, um, <laughs> but you know, if you're doing it because you think there's tracking things in there or because it's a conspiracy, you need to shut the fuck up and get the shot. If you have an, a condition that prevents you from getting it, well, fine. I'm going to stop you there because not, and I'm not defending anyone, but I hear everyone say that it's because they're either conspiracy theorists or crazy white ringers. And that's just not the fact. Yeah, I didn't say that they no, are. I, know, I said, that, if you are, <laughs> it's, just, it's always what I hear people say. And I feel like we're now tearing each other apart. Oh, well, you definitely we, are. We, we don't know are. what's going on. And trust me, I mean, I got mine as soon as I could, as yeah. soon as the fucking county allowed me to, yeah. you know. Actually, I would just, just to back that up a little bit, I will say this. You'd be surprised, and, I, and I'm not joking, how many people in Berkeley won't get it. Because oh, I know. That's Jay. as far left as you can go. So, I, you know. It's the same yeah. in D.C. Does I have granola yeah. in it? No, Jay's not kidding. Uh, well, same in D.C. It, that's why actually, I bring that up. That's not far off, George. It's, it's not. It is like a question about. Is it vegan? Yeah. By the way, is it, is I, it a uh, vegan shot? Is that what you just said? <laughs> I looked it up and um, thank you for the levity there, George. <laughs> You're really worth mentioning. But the guy that got kicked out of the band was kicked out of Offspring. 
Oh yeah, that's really? what it was. Okay, well I like them. Uh, I don't like them lately, but I like the earlier stuff. So yeah, it's just it's such a crazy subject now to talk about because there's so many swirling things going around oh, in the big, hard. big pit, and then it's just confusing. So I'm not trying to fight you guys, but I just I'm so tired of. Like neighbors on next door <laughs> fighting with each other. It's like, dude, I wanted to see whose dog shit on my lawn. And there's a picture out there. And here I am hearing people fighting. No, I would just say, I mean, I don't, we don't know the circumstances of why I didn't get the vaccine, but I love trouble. And we also did, uh, uh, I think one of the um, Thunderdomes was, had trouble on it. Trouble yep. first candle mess. That's right. And uh, I was fortunate enough to see trouble play when I was in Chicago and they, they, just were amazing that was a really that was the highlight of the show and that's not why i went to that particular show so uh, a, a big loss i think because they were like one of those real first doom bands like you know a candle mass in that period and uh still really love that stuff especially like the remastered version mm -hmm. of their album so um sad yeah, yeah. definitely hey, also by the way just to Make sure, make sure we don't disrespect him. He wasn't just the singer of Trouble. He had a band called The Skull too. Right. So that's just worth right. mentioning that he, you know, he, in his own right, he went out and did more. And, and it was really it good. Was, the Skull was, yeah, was good yeah, too. Yeah. Skull. Yeah. I didn't realize that he had left Trouble because he didn't want to tour anymore. I read something. He was just not enjoying touring, and then he started to Skull, and they started touring. And I was like, I just think he probably was in a strange place. You know, I'm sure all musicians get there at some point in their careers. Yeah. And maybe get reinvigorated by the new band, you know, John, and you're like, yeah. all right, I'm going to do this again. I think, yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So, uh, it sucks to yeah, be honest with yeah. you. Cause if I, I'm a big trouble fan too, especially the first three albums, um, yeah. because after the first three, they, they become more of a, a stoner band, but it's funny. They can get credit for being one of the, I don't consider Sabbath or like pentagram to be true doom bands. They, right. they yeah. started doom, but they're not, yeah part of the doom wave and trouble. i would say trouble was like the first real doom band yeah so, then okay. which finder yep. generals one okay um, fair enough uh, so I, I i gotta i have to add something then real quick john and i'm so sorry because it's completely off off subject and it's that this is this to me this that's the exact thing that I feel about the whole possessed death. <laughs> I do No, that I think yeah. possessed created death metal, but they weren't really a death metal band. Yeah. So that, there you go. I said it, yeah. I just wanted to throw that out there. But yes, they're definitely one of the, the forefathers of it. And, um, if you, well, I'm sure we'll, I'll, I'll get mentioned again. I mean, it's a legend. I mean, yeah, yeah. So. That's the thing. And that's always tough. You know, when, when somebody is part of something like starting something, that we love that it's come so far. You know, it's, it's worth mentioning too, and this is true for both Candlemas and for Trouble, that that was the metal, you know, the early metal blade era, the combat era, all those things were starting to happen all this underground thing, and everything was thrashed. So those two bands actually really stood out as like not doing what was cool at the moment at all. Like, yeah. I mean, a lot of people liked it. I'm not saying that. It's just like that was a brave and weird move in the middle of all of the speed wars that well, were 82 to 88 or whatever, you know, yeah. out just trouble. And real quick about Trouble, they get credit for helping start the traditional doom, but they also get credit for being one of the first stoner metal bands. Uh -huh. Because oh, yeah. they, mm -hmm. they, on the third album, it starts seeping in a little bit. And then the, the fourth album, which is just called Trouble, which forced them to rename the first album, which was called Trouble to mm. Psalm 9, uh, they start to become a stoner band. They're not, yeah. I don't think they're the original, but they're one of the early ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just uh, integral into the history of metal, yeah. and Eric Wagner is a huge part of that. Yeah. Typical really of a stoner voice. band to forget that they named their first album Trouble, <laughs> and they're like, let's call it Trouble, man. <laughs> oh, shit, that was the oh, wait, wait, what was the first album again? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't doubt for one second if that wasn't a label thing too that happened. Oh, sure. yeah. They had some very strange label things with Metal Blade and you know, yeah. whatever. It's yeah, a loss. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a loss. But he's yeah. not the only one. Speaking of legends, yeah. just today, Charlie Watts yeah. of the Rolling Stones passed away at 80 years old. And <sighs> I was in the middle of a meeting when I think it was Jay that dropped that bomb. It's like what the yeah, it was fuck? so unexpected. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah. I, well, so I did do 
some follow up. I'm sure you guys did too by now. That apparently, yeah. he'd had heart surgery fairly recently and was quote unquote recovering from that. And obviously, the Rick Ocasek. You call it the Rick Ocasek. Yeah, he apparently was, <laughs> by all accounts, was doing really well, and then wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, I, I liked Rolling Stones, and I have oh, no I love shame him. in saying that. Yeah. And um, and Charlie was such a weird. He's he's like. He, He's like the original Bunny Carlos, like just so out of fucking place. You know what I mean? Like uh-huh. he's this, you know, he's he, he's, he's the gentleman of the Rolling Stones. Gentleman. Yeah, he was. Well, somebody said somebody posted it. And it was uh, I want to say it was Joan Baez said he was a gentleman among thieves. Yeah, that uh, works. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know he was he was a straight straightforward dude. Yeah, I uh, I got I wanted to read this to you guys real quick and only take a second. I found a quote. Um, because apparently he dabbled in heroin in the seventies, which doesn't surprise me. He's in the Rolling Stones. Um, who didn't? Apparently, go ahead. I said, who in the Stones didn't in the seventies? Yeah. Well, this is that's what I'm getting to here. Uh, so apparently, he he said I was very fortunate never to get hooked on it. He said, but I I did try it for a while. And he said, this I'm qu- quoting from him. I fell asleep on the floor during the recording of Some Girls, and Keith, otherwise known as Keith. Uh, woke me up and said, you should do this when you're older. And then it says, Keith telling me this with an exclamation point. And I found that so funny because here's Keith Richards telling him not to do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and, but here's the here's the part of the quote that, that I thought was even funnier. He said, but it stuck. And I stopped everything at that point. Wow. <laughs> Imagine that Keith, Keith Richards being a good influence on somebody. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't doubt if he, he took his heroin then after that. But yeah. yeah. That was probably yeah. yeah. He's like, hey, I'm out, man. You, you got anything you're not using? But yeah. <laughs> if he, if Keith is telling you to knock it off, he, he would go. You think that Keith would be a deterrent? You just see what that guy did on a daily basis. You're yeah. like, no, oh, no way, I'm going down that path. Tell you, yeah. tell you right now, Keith should be the first person on the first manned mission to any planet that yep. we land on that goes on without a helmet because there's nothing that's going to ruin that guy's body. He's going to kill every disease on that planet. Well, that's just, that's the crazy thing about these deaths. You never know where you, when you're going to yep. go. It doesn't matter if you're like the healthiest person on the planet or you're, you, you've abused drugs since you were like tiny, yep. you know, uh, Tracy's mentor just collapsed dead of a heart attack. He was in pretty good shape, only 60 yeah. and he was out for a run and just, and just collapsed and died. So, and yet we yeah. still have Ozzy really unexpected. Right. Yeah, we still have right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So some of these guys, it's amazing that they've made it this far, See, I, considering I a, what they've done to the, their bodies. I read a, a story. It was an, a brief anecdote just the other day, and I want to believe it's true. And I think it probably is because it was presented in such a way that it didn't look like somebody was telling a joke. And it was just that the <laughs> it was a story from Keith Richards. And Keith Richards said they were in the hotel. This is like the brief, briefest version of it. They're in the hotel. And somebody shouted, and there was a knock at the door and somebody shouted, it's the police. And so they like went around and flushed everything down the toilet and everything. And, the, and then, it, but it was Stuart Copeland and Sting. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> I've, I've heard that before, best. Jay. I've heard I that. I think uh, it's a real story. I think that's a, that oh, like, yeah. actually happened. Yeah. Oh, here comes our, uh, Ooh, the here beefcake. comes beefcake, beefcake Will. Oh, there he is. There he is. Oh, speaking of beefcakes, Ooh, look at that shirt. Bang, bang. Stay on yeah. target. Stay on target. Stay on target. <laughs> I can't what? hold them off. I got this shirt in the mail yesterday, and it was addressed to Will Beefcake. Ah. <laughs> yes. I saw that, Will, and I thought of you. Plus, you're such a perfect male specimen. I just kind of want to dress you up, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you know that he's donating his member to the uh, Icelandic uh, Penis did. Museum? <laughs> I did. I saw that. They're going to have to put in a whole new wing. You're, you're such a specimen. I wanted to give you a shirt with a guy named Porkins on it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Jay, sure it's not a new a wing. It's a new leg. A, there was a backhanded tongue in cheek uh, motive operandi to getting me this shirt. No, honestly, I was just like, I, I saw it. And I was like, he'll get a kick out of this. No, I, I love out it. Out of all of us, you're like the Star Wars guy. And I know yeah. we are all the Star Wars guy, but you're the fucking Star Wars guy. And I was like, it, it, it's, it's funny, just perfect. The, the Looch, who's been on the podcast before, a friend of ours who will be at Decibel, uh, hopefully, in Philly. Him and I used to play Star Wars Trivia Pursuit whenever we got together. And I won. I, he always, be, like, I would run the table. And at the very end, Luch would catch up and win Star Wars Trivia Pursuit. And the one time I won, the answer was, 
Porkins. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> nice. nice. So when I saw that shirt, that's that's the first thing I thought of besides my physique. <laughs> well, it was. It's a gift of love, sir. So it yeah. is. No, I appreciate it. And you look awesome. handsome. I love it. <laughs> so, well, we were just finishing up our in memoriam section of the podcast. Oh my God! People dying every fucking day. Exactly. Basically. So yeah. I wanna I wanna raise my glass to all of those people that we just lost, and. uh Hey, yeah. We did lose one more. Not that it, oh, right, right. It Sorry. Metalheads. No, right. no, it's okay. Wah, wah, uh, wah, wah. Don Everly from the Everly Brothers, who most people may not know who they are, or know the songs, but they had some massive. Isn't that the, the ghost hits. song? Bye Bye Bluff. No, that's the Righteous Brothers. Righteous yeah. Brothers. Yeah, I knew they were yeah. some brothers. Wake Up Little Susie. I mean, everyone's heard that song at some point in their life. Yeah. But anyway, they influenced a lot of musicians that we like. And so it's like, fuck. Okay. They now really I raise my glass. Life. Yeah. It's just you know, that's a lot of people in a short span of time. Yeah. I'm sure you guys talked about but Eric Wagner. Yeah. Eric Wagner of Skull and Trouble. Yeah. Um, we did. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell this quick story and I won't bore anybody with it too much. But it was, um, I, I was definitely torn because. It was a night that the Eagles were in the Super Bowl, and I guess it was February 2017, 18. And that same night, so I'm a Philadelphia Philly, Philadelphia Philly Eagles, Flyers, don't care about the Sixers much, but um, Eagles are finally in the Super Bowl. They won the Super Bowl, but that night, the skull, i.e. the trouble, was playing at Atlas. So as soon as the game was over, because I promised my kids I will watch the game with them, I bolted probably speeding uh, to Atlas to catch most of uh, the skull set. And they played um, Psalm nine that night. Like they were playing that album. And, uh, and so I caught most of the set because the trouble waited until the game was over to go on. So I only, awesome. missed, I only missed like 10 minutes of it. <laughs> and I just remember hanging out afterwards uh, with Eric and he's sitting there smoking a cigarette in the brewery. And I'm kind of like, oh, do I, do I tell him like, look, dude, this is a production facility. You can't smoke in here. Is that code that when you said cigarette? No, no, it was actually a cigarette. Was it, it, was like cigarette? A cigarette. it was like chain smoking <laughs> cigarettes back there. And I was just like, dude, like, come on, man. And he's, he's doing it right by all the, like the barrel aging stuff. Anyway. <laughs> I sat down and had a, I wouldn't say a nice conversation with him because he didn't really seem that interested in talking to me to be honest <laughs> but eventually i said like hey man uh once you're done with that don't don't let up another one because you can't smoke in here it's a production facility did anyway. you walk over to the the to the equipment and and add to the tag smoked smoke yeah <laughs> uh, that was the smoke barrel the smoke um, barrel uh, but but so, that was it was such a great show and he's, his voice still sounded great sure yeah, that's a bummer man well, i remember yeah, that I'm, i didn't go I, I was going to um, just add, add on to John's um, or Will's uh, John's Everly Brothers thing. It, it, like they are, they are a, a larger underpinning influence to a lot of what we listen to today than you might guess. And one thing I learned, I didn't realize this. They wrote that Linda Ronstadt hit. Uh, I've been lied to and mistreated. You know, when will I find true love? Whatever. They wrote some fucking shit, dude. So you I, just yeah, lost just everybody on that one. Even me. Did I? <laughs> no, I know Everly funny. Brothers, they wrote some shit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Keith, Keith loved them. And, yeah, uh, they all did. The they Beatles did. loved them yeah. and Neil Young. And it just, yeah. the right. point of bringing, that, bringing him up is just that it was another person in a, a long line from this past month. Yeah. You know, so. Weird. Shitty, shitty month, man. Mm -hmm. What the hell? You. Let's move on then. So yeah. our next item, the new Iron Maiden singles, of which there are two. The first one is called The Writing on the Wall and just released a couple days ago. I think it was last week. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Stratego. Stratego. One of my favorite childhood games, um, which is both of these songs are from their forthcoming new album, Senjutsu which is out on September 3rd, which yeah. is not too far. It's like Soon. next week, I think. Actually, next Friday, is it? Yes. I mean, like not this week, Friday, but now. next week, yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I've listened to the writing on the wall several times, 
I wasn't sure what to think the first time, uh, but it grew on me with multiple listens. Uh, unfortunately, I've only listened to Stratego once, and I was only half paying attention, so I really don't have much to say about that one. It sounds like uh, one of the deeper tracks from um, Brave New World, to be honest with you. It's got that kind of flow to it. Huh? Um, I agree. It's, it's not as good as writing on the wall, I don't think, personally. But, okay. You know, yeah. I mean, Writing on the Wall is a really good track. Plus, it's got that video, which is amazing. Yeah, that is a great so, video. Um, I, I like Stratego a lot. I feel like both the songs have that Brave New World feel to me, and that's my all-time favorite Maiden album. So I'm I'm pretty pumped to hear the rest of the record. It's going to be a long one. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Put aside some time. But a, will aside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, was, it was funny because I – not funny. I, I thought that video was amazing. But the entire time I was watching that video, and I liked the song too. The song was pretty good. I liked the video more than the song. But I thought this this video does not match the song. Like the video is way more intense than the song is. Mm-hmm. It's almost like this easygoing, you know, kind of Western feel song. But the video is like super intense, like the super sci-fi thing. Heavy on. metal. Yeah. And I was kind of like, I like them both, but they don't go together. I, it's anyway, very entirely possible we reached out to that production facility and just said make us a six minute video and didn't let them hear the song well <laughs> <laughs> but I mean you know, I, <laughs> I, I think uh, they, yeah. they when they're doing that video they haven't done a video like that in a long time and you know definitely not an animated video so you want to put everything you can into it so I think they just went a little crazy with it what's the last one they did didn't they do one for uh, it was a off- sci-fi one it was from the it was the, off of uh, Dance of Death the opening no, track they did a no they did one after video. that they did one after that too. What's the uh, weird one with the space alien Eddie on the cover? Final Frontier. Like Final Predator. Frontier. Yeah, Frontier. Yeah, yeah. That's right. There's, yeah, a, yeah. there's a video for that. Um, yeah. That's uh, animated. Yeah. I love Riding on the Wall. That song sticks yeah. in my head. I could I can play that thing over and over and over again. And and I like that. That's what I like. The, I don't want to say sing songy, but you know the the more of the anthemic uh, uh, maiden songs. And that's what it really reminds me of Brave New World because I can sing almost all those songs. I mean, I know them by heart. And how cool were all those Eddies on motorcycles? You've got, you know, Power Slave Eddie mm-hmm. and Somewhere in Time Eddie and Classic Eddie. Yep. And, yep. you know, that was fucking I think, cool. I think what's cool, too, is that like new, like a new Maiden song that we like, we haven't heard from them in a few years. A new Maiden song brings everybody out of the woodwork. Like people that I haven't talked to in well a while, especially with COVID. They're like, oh, dude, new Maiden, like just emails and texts out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of brings that come. Not that we don't have the camaraderie with each other, but it kind of just reaches out a little bit further. Smile. I can't wait to get the vinyl. I'm, yeah. I'm excited. Hopefully it comes on the day it, it drops. Hopefully oh, it comes was, on the day it drops. When was it, George? September 3rd. 3rd. Oh, God, that's right around the corner. It is. Oh, yep. Me. In fact, it'll probably be out by the time this posts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, well, by the time we're finished recording. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Stay they're not target. the. Stay on target. They're not the only Dead ones later. Later. to release a song. Exodus also released a new song. The beatings will continue until morale improves, which is also a t-shirt that I got my father for father's day one year. And he wears it continually. Um, this is another one that I listened to half assed once. Um, I, oh, I love it. I, I definitely it. I dug the beginning the of cast, it. And, George. Mm-hmm. Huh? Would you Way say to prepare for the cast? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was on vacation. I didn't have access to things, and I, I'm I'm back for vacation two days, and I'm buried in work. What can I say? Um, I tried. I'm excited for this record, dude. I think the last two Zetro records are fucking bombs. I mean, like nuclear bombs. And so I can't wait for this one. This I'm exi- I, well, I mentioned this to you guys. I'm excited for this as anything this year. I expect this to be mm. a fucking super fun, super great, jazzed up, spiced up record. Um, I, I remember when Tom or. Uh, What's his name? Hunting? Uh, Gary Holt. When, no, when Gary Holt shared. Do you oh, remember Tom. a few months back when he shared the notes about the record? Yeah, and yeah. Written all these little personalized things next to him. I could feel his excitement. And I think it's a great song. So it fits right in with what they've done in Tempo of the Damned mm-hmm. and Blood and Blood Out. Both records, which I still listen to fairly regularly. So yeah, I'm, I'm psyched. And, and by the way, and, and speaking of Tom, though, uh, you know, in case you live in a fucking cave and haven't heard he did survive his surgery that we were talking about like i think it was last time um and he's still with us so at least he's not on that fucking list 
And they did play a show with his blessing with a different drummer two nights ago or something. Was that Joey Tempesta? Um, I, 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 yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah, he's playing with them again. Well, and, Joey um, Jordanson. Yeah, Not they, him, for uh, sure. They, but it was... Uh, and I actually saw some footage from it because, like, I'm um, friends with Zetro's kids on Facebook for some reason, and mm. they were live streaming it. Wait, and stuff. what? <laughs> They're um, well, they have their own band, and I think um, I got friended up with them that way. Huh. They they're that Hatriot thing, right? Yeah, Hatriot. That's Zetro's kids. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that's when I had an opportunity to interview him and turned it down. Oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> His he turned it down. Zetro's publicist wrote to me and said, "Steve would like to do." an interview with you and I didn't respond. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Cause I was He's like, gonna... I was like, uh, this was like, I mean, this was probably even before the podcast. This was probably back when I was just doing like reviews and stuff. And, uh, I wrote a review of it and he liked it. So he wanted to do an interview and I was like, uh, I don't know how to do interviews. <laughs> He's uh, by the way, he has, are you saying you do now? now? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but there's more of us. Strength in numbers. He's got a pretty cool podcast now. And I don't know if you guys saw recently, too, but he lost a bunch of weight, dude. He, he did. Used COVID to, like, loosely, like, 60 pounds or some crazy thing. I did some like of that, too, just not as much. <laughs> Maybe he went on my show alone. <laughs> yeah, you're wasting away, George. Well, the, the Exodus yeah. song is pretty good. I like the riff on it. I mean, I don't really care for Exodus that much. But, uh, bite your tongue, like sir. Riff. Bite your tongue. I did. I, I I don't like the vocals. I don't think I ever need gang vocals in every anything. So. You are not bonded by blood. <laughs> they, no. they don't do it that much, though. That's probably they probably don't. Well, but, yeah. Hey, Will, did you see the the album cover? Uh, excuse me. The album cover does look cool because I saw um, Decibel blasted out like fifteen hundred different ways. Didn't it also? <laughs> did it kind of have a creator feel to it? Yeah. Did it you did. think that yeah. cover? Yeah. Yeah. Like modern creator, but it's also a kick-ass looking cover. Yeah. I have not heard the song. Uh, and I think at this point, cause it's coming out in like a week and a half, yeah. I may just go dark on it and just wait till it comes out. And I, this is one of those weird things. Like I'm pretty sure I pre-ordered it on vinyl somewhere. somehow. <laughs> this is one of those drunk camping things. Like, and I, and I saw, and I saw oh, the no. decibel thing, like, Oh, you know, order the box. And I'm like, Ooh, I, I, yeah, I think I ordered that already. I don't know, yeah. and I, I literally went. La I think this was literally <laughs> last night. I went through my email, and like you know, you categorize things, and I went to that folder that like when I shop or I buy something, I'm like, I don't see. Oh my anything. god, you're gonna get three albums. I know. I, you should. I make a list. I use Evernote, and I make a list of all the things that I actually buy. So, and then I put the tracking numbers on there whenever I get them. So pretty. Organized. You're very anal retentive, aren't you? That's no, I'm just awesome. Most <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's a nice surprise, like when when the Dio comic book and the vinyl shows up, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I ordered this like a year ago." The <laughs> fucking Dio comic was great. I didn't read the whole thing because I stopped halfway through. I'm like, "What the hell does this have to do with Holy Diver?" And then I realized <laughs> you gotta read to the end. Well, Jesus, well, I guess so. But I I, I kind of thought it was more like the Anthrax thing, which I ordered and forgot about, and then that showed up. Oh, is that cool? Before. Yeah, it's pretty cool, um, but that that's more on point with like the songs and stuff. Stay on target. Just well, kinda... the Anthrax was that each illustrator did a version of the song, right? Right, and that's kind of what I was expecting with the. Because they were short, they were like you know six yeah. pages, four pages, yeah. or whatever. This short, is like an not entire like well. graphic novel based on the album, and it they give you a lot of backstory that's not in the song. Well, there's it's only cool. like 40 words in that song, so <laughs> it's like a lot of liberties. <laughs> but yeah, I would and read it because uh, I think you you'll be satisfied with the ending. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying I'm dissatisfied. I was just expecting more of like, okay, first song, we, we rock, and there's going to be something, some right. comic, right. short comic about that, and then you know, so right. on. No, and so I, go back to it and stay on target, and get you'll get it. a happy ending. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, when I was on vacation, whatever, two weeks ago, I did finish in the Dio book, which is what we're and, talking about next. Oh, okay. And then the Rob Halford book. I finished both. Of them. Nice. Oh, right nice. nice. Yeah. Speaking of happy endings. Speaking of Ronnie James Dio books, his autobiography Rambo in the dark was released recently. And I think just about everybody in the world read that, or at least everybody on this podcast or like most everybody on this Real. podcast i read it and finished mm -hmm. it thought it was wonderful was sad that it ended yep. with sacred heart but at least he got sacred heart in there because that's my favorite do album 
It's also um, ar- it's arguably his um, success apex. You know, was um, I didn't know that. I thought it was. I always thought it was kind of a bomb because nobody really liked it. You know, everybody liked the first it two was. albums so much more, but but it was actually more successful than the other two, which blows my mind. Well, more to the point, though, he also did his biggest tour for that record. That's right. the big, you yeah, know, and Drago th- or thing. Yeah, and there's also, you know, go back to whatever this was. This was like the late 80s. 1986. Yeah. So you couldn't preview albums. There was no Spotify. So you just, <laughs> if you like the first two Dio albums, you're like, yes, I'm buying this. And like, ah, you know, maybe it's not as good as the first two, but you bought it because the first two were awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I bought it because yeah. it was the first good one point. I bought. Uh, I saw Holy Diver. I was like, yeah. damn, you know, this is, of course, on cassette in like a actual record store in the mall. I'm like, Ooh, Holy diver. That looks motherfucking cool. But I was like, wait, this one just came out like last week. I'm going to get this one. <laughs> did you talk like that? So you were talking I did. Adam Sandler when you were a kid. <laughs> Adam Sandler's got two modes, angry and baby talk. <laughs> yeah. I hate that guy so much. Oh, I love Adam Sandler. Oh God. Well, I, I agree with you, George. It was it, it felt it feels like an unfinished symphony, if you will, since he literally just stopped writing at some point and didn't get a chance to really. And he wrote it many years. He, he had been writing it for years, so it was that's just as far as he made it. Um, did you notice and, the part? Well, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you notice well, the part? Gonna say, my I'll say the last that bit, and that was just that I bet we're all happy that Mick Wall was involved in finishing. Yes, Mick Mick Wall, Wall, I, I, I think he yeah. did a great job. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, go ahead, George. Um, at some point in there, he said, and we were friends for the rest of our lives or, or, or something to that effect. It was like he knew either he knew that he was dying and he wasn't going to make it like, you know, it was just a weird turn of phrase the way he said something. Who was he talking about? Richie? No, well, it definitely wasn't friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Stuff about Richie in there was great. Yeah, yeah that was. And he was very yeah, but- fair to everybody. Yeah, yeah. To both Richie and Tommy, Tommy, Tony. So, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, some of the stuff that stuck out to me was like the Vivian Campbell stuff. Or, and then the, when it got into Dio years where he's like, Hey, look, like I'm Dio and you guys were nobodies or some of like Vivian, like you were a nobody and I brought you and I paid you well. And I, I think there was like a little bit of over, over promise under deliver on Dio's part. Yeah. Uh, if I had a guess and he's sort of like, yeah, well, hey, you know, you were nobody. I paid you really well. Now you're super famous. And, you know, you have a Ferrari. Yeah. The way, the way Shut Vivian, the fuck up and, and, and say well, thanks. And he's, and he's fine. He's in Def Leppard. Now he's got a lot of money. But Vivian Campbell, the way he tells it, and I kind of believe it. And I know he's changed his story over the years. But he um, he says that they that they all made the agreement or Dio said, look, let's get three records in and then I'll make you like whole. We'll be a big part of this thing. And that and and then Vivian said he always believed that it was Wendy that kept that from happening. So he, he said he never really had any animosity for Dio after the initial. An- and I think, I think Dio, I think Dio in the book kind of hints at that, that, you know, yeah. Wendy was the driving force. He was his. Yeah. You know, she was the manager at the time. Well, Wendy and even says so. She's like, yeah, it was me. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, I think it comes out in the book that, you know, both sides are kind of right. Like, you know, hey, you, you did well, Vivian. Like we, we did well by you. But if you wanted more then you know, we kind of fucked you, too. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and again, like I said, it all turned out fine for him. So fuck whatever. Uh, yeah, you know, he, he's got Def Leppard money now. That's more money than Dio ever had. So whatever. Yeah. All right. But, you know, Sugar all over himself. I know uh, somebody we all love and think of as a legend. And which did you uh, juxtapose to the to the Rob Halford book? Did you enjoy either of them a little more or less? Well, um. You know, in a weird sort of way, because Rob Halford goes all literally goes all the way up to the last record. So because it's, you know, just released. So there was there was even talks about COVID. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's so it's so relevant and recent. Um, I'm trying to think like. And it had a glory hole. An artist. Yeah, 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 there, there was some. <laughs> it actually doesn't. Yeah, you know, I, does. I have to say, like, so I finished a book, and then there, there's a, there's a guy. My actually, my one of my bosses at work uh, loves Judas Priest, 
but is pretty like Christian conservative. And I said, you know, I just finished reading the book and he's like, Oh yeah, yeah. I've been meaning to pick that up. I'm like, you know, maybe <laughs> hard pass. Sure? <laughs> yeah. A lot of detail. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I said like, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I want to read it. I'm like, okay. And I literally gave it to him today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm a slightly more fascinated by Dio in some ways. Sure. Uh, but I mean, I love them both. I, I it's kind hey, of, Rob no, it's a toss awesome. up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I I, actually, yeah. one of the things I was fascinated about by Rob is that he spent a lot of time in Philadelphia when I was living around, like just North of the city, he was there constantly. Yep. And then he was like shagging Marines at camp Pendleton left and right to the point that he got kicked <laughs> off the base. Yeah. Like they identified him. I'm like, <laughs> uh, sir, uh, there's like this gay porn scandal and, uh, your lead singer, Jesus priest, uh, you're not welcome on the space anymore. And I'm like, yeah. dude, this guy loves Marines. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> Army <laughs> guys. He just loves Literally them. loves Marines. Yeah. Like, hey John, wow. did you, um, um, I forgot if you got tickets for the priest tour. No. I didn't. Okay. Well, then I'm not going to ruin anything for you, but because I, I, I already the, saw the set list. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. That's exactly I gonna, what I was going to comment on. I was going to say real quick. I uh, was supposed to meet Dio back. Oh God, over ten years ago, uh, just before he died, he was going to be the best man at a wedding that I was invited to, and I flew out for it. Is this your uh, photographer friend? Yep. Okay. This I was more friends with um, his wife and I was all like, wow, this is going to be awesome. And uh, he passed. I was like, fuck. I, mean, I felt bad more for um, my friend's husband because that was his really good friend. Yeah. And it was right. just a bummer. Yeah, but Slash so. was still there, right? Yeah. Slash was there. Uh, Geezer Butler was there for a while. Um, Did guys you go probably, to the wedding? You went to yeah, the wedding. I was right? there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Payne, which you guys probably don't know him, but he he's a pretty big musician in the Prague world. Um, Mike Ackerfeld was there from Opeth. Somebody else was there. I got called. Did, did he know? Uh, did he know the photographer? I'm yeah, sure. everyone. That's how everyone was there because the guys. Do you guys know the live live and loud Aussie uh -huh. live album? Yeah. If there's a picture in there where Aussie has his arms out like this. And he's like red. I think he's red and the background's blue or he's blue and the background's red or whatever. It's, it's an amazing picture. That's mm. Gene took that picture. That's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. So it was, it was kind of bittersweet, but I was happy to go to the wedding, but I was kind so of bummed. I think I tell this story every time John tells that story, which is not terribly often. So that's not calling you out, uh, but I tell that story before I shook his hand one time and I'm pleased to say I did. And I was at a show, um, was the heaven and hell reunion and uh, our reunion heaven and hell. And he came way the fuck out in the audience in um, in Mountain View. I was at that amphitheater up there, John. His name Shoreline. Me, right? Shoreline. Shoreline. And there's this little running thing that goes up around the stairs that just go down. And he just came way the fuck up. And and and, and everybody was just like looking at him, gobsmacked. I was like, fuck it, I'm walking over to him. So I walked over and shook his oh, hand. And the next nice. thing, everybody came over. But it was still <laughs> a highlight to me that I shook his fucking hand, man. You touched you know me. That's God. That's well, okay. you know, every John. time John tells that story and then every time uh, Jay tells that story, then I tell my story, which is that I saw Dio in the record theater in, in Towson, Maryland, which is the smallest, tiny fucking hole in the wall club. And so I was only like 10 feet away from Dio, which is about the best I could ever do, which is not shaking his hand. But I still have to say it because Jay said his story and John <laughs> said his story. So that's what we got to do. Right. But John, and did, my did story they... is I saw him with heaven and hell and I was like, way the fuck back. There. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, then uh, I have to say, oh, yeah, well, I saw him on the Mob Rules tour, but I was way in the back. So, hey, uh, Will, what are you holding in your hand there? Oh, I was going to say, um, so uh, reading the book, you find out that Dio was a huge baseball fan. Yep. And so for uh, um, it was just a couple weeks ago, they had like a big anniversary, like live concert uh, for Dio. And one of the things you could buy was like, you know, a ticket and all this stuff and then a baseball. So this is a quasi autographed um, hologram baseball. No, no, it's just because it's in the kit. Yeah. So that that's, that's quasi just, autographed. Well, it's got his it, it got it's his digital his, yeah. his oh, gotcha. autograph, okay. but he oh, clearly cool, he did not sign this. Right. So it's yeah. A, yeah. Hey, John, um, at the wedding, did they mention Dio? Did they uh, give a tribute or say anything about him? No, I think at okay. that point, I don't know. 
<laughs> that would be cheesy. So people there. Yeah. yeah. It, it would have been weird. Yeah. Do, yeah. Do, I guess, so you guys will remember the Dio estate sale a while back too. And, yeah. um, and I still to this day regret not because I, I could have blown $800 on a sword. I could do that. What the fuck? I don't know what I was thinking. But yeah, one of the things too. that really intrigued you, me. Hey, well, you know what? You've, you've paid eight hundred dollars to blow a sword so <laughs> <laughs> blow on a sword big, big difference so, um and um but one of the things that was a lot of his estate stuff was baseball stuff and he had like all these great things like um his personal collection of cards and like he had a do cleveland uh indians like shirt you know like a yeah. uniform and stuff and i, well, I would call a jersey one of those thank you outfit um, I would have loved to have had one Attire. of baseball paraphernalia things. <laughs> so his tops. Nah. Your baseball attire. I think I tried to bid on his passport because it had his. Yeah, real, like, oh, really? yeah I remember that. Whatever his, his, his real last name in there. There was some Motorhead stuff, too. Uh, when It was Phil. Yeah, it was Phil stuff. Phil's yeah. stuff yeah. 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 Jay, I was going to ask you, uh, when you're reading the book, was there anything that you were really surprised by because you know you wrote that uh, feature right, right. for the for the website to be all end all word. so i'm just wondering is there anything you took away um that you were surprised by because you, obviously you're a scholar of dio i'd like to think i am to the point where i've wanted to send wendy dio that article just to say please consider talking to me for your fucking upcoming documentary but whatever mm -hmm. um yeah, anyway, no, but here's what's surprising to me about Dio, and this is this was true before the book, and that is that, and you guys might forget this, I bet you George will remember, and maybe some of the other guys, honestly, Dio was pretty fucking bitter from, like, 90 to, like, 2000. Like, he was pissed at everybody he ever worked with, and he threw them all under the bus and said terrible things about them. Um, everybody, seriously, dude. Like, there, there's this one famous interview on a bus where he's, like, going through the records, and and if it's, like, a Richard Blackmore record, he goes, he'll be just like, that one fucking sucks. It's got a 14-minute drum solo. I hate it. You know what I mean? And he just, Dio was mad for a long time. So that, so I would say this, and the surprise to me is that, that he, no, not the surprise, the relief was that that bitterness left him, I think. And you, the bitterness is in his lyrics, too. So, you know, mm -hmm. like, we've talked about that, like, with Strange Highways and some of the stuff on um, uh, Lock Up the Wolves, which, by the way, if you want a good cry while you're reading this book, listen to the song Rock and Roll Eyes, or My Eyes, on Lock Up the Wolves, that'll fucking destroy you. Huh. So, no, I wasn't too surprised, in all honesty, um, I think he, that's what's so great about Dio is he's the, the authentic deal. He, he was, he never pretended to be anything he fucking wasn't. He was always straightforward. Right. And don't and, um, fucking go anywhere in a car or a plane with Dio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I liked how honest he was about his, his youth. Cause I always thought um, Dio was kind of, he used to hide his age. You may remember that too. He wouldn't tell people how old he was. We didn't really find out until he died, and um, I, I liked very much that he he very was very transparent about like, look, I grew up in the fifties. I had the pompadour, you know what I mean. I was in this kind of band, played the stand up bass. That may sound dumb, but it, he, he made his peace. I think is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was but funny. To be fair, he also got he also kind of re embraced success towards the end of his life too. So you know, with heaven and hell and all that. I remember reading in like Hip Parader magazine in the eighties, like late eighties, an interview with him and and. I'll always remember this. He said, I think I'm going to die soon. He had this like, he was like, you know, fatalistic and like, I, I don't think I'm going to be around much longer. And he was off by a couple of decades, but, um, you know, it, I was just always like, oh shit, Dio thinks he's going to die. And, you know, it worked. He just, to, to this day, and I know you guys agree on a certain level, and it's so hard to really single anybody out. I, but he is just one of my single favorite figures in heavy metal period. Yep. Me too. For, for yeah. size of talent for um, his, the way he writes his lyrics, which honestly people have long made fun of for no good fucking reason. Right. And yeah. Right. You know what I mean? And like black and white day and night, shut the fuck up. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I, I can't stand when people dig on that. And I just think he's the real deal. I, I was so glad to get this book and I can't Things wait for the documentary. I think it's a great book. My um, my first Dio exposure, I mean, in depth, sadly, was uh, that first Sam Dunn documentary. I think he interviewed him a couple of times in there, and just yeah, just yeah. being like, of all the people he talked to, Dio's interview probably aside from the guy aside from Galder, um, Dio's documentary. <laughs> Satan. Satan. 
Jason was the one that stood out to me the most just by yeah. like what his personality was like, you know, the jabs at Gene Simmons. And prior to that, musically, it was probably, um, was it Wayne's World or the Black Sabbath? Tenacious D. Time Machine, which I fucking loved. And so, you know, a lot of Dio stuff for me has been looking back and, um, you know, re reading the book was nice to kind of fill in some gaps, you know, obviously Jay, you're, you're, um, the piece you wrote kind of got me started, but then, you know, to read this and, you know, fill it in even further. And yeah, that's been cool. And, and just to say one more thing about you on that is that, and this is true. And this is another fact you guys know about it, but he was the last one to fucking leave, dude. He would come out and if there were 400 people back, you know, by, by the bus, he'd sign all 400 fucking autographs. And that guy you know, did truly give a fucking shit about his fans. You know, not just in some sort of like this will make more more popular way. He he loved that was his life. Yeah, that's that's who he was singing for. Yeah, on that on that you know those live albums we just got recently, Marcus on the uh, yeah um, on that I believe it's on that one where he says he introduces uh, don't talk to strangers and he says so now we're gonna play a song and I kind of say I, he says I and he's sincere he says I hate saying the name of the song every night because. It, it sounds so negative and none of us are fucking strangers, but in any case, don't talk to strangers. But he, he I just love that. He sort of always felt bad about the name of that song. Cause he didn't want his fans to feel like strangers We're strangers from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what a motherfucker he was. It's true. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was nice to uh, read about all that, his whole life, like the early, early, on, uh, his early in his life and, just everything about him that I actually didn't know a lot about, you know, stealing yeah, his dad's so. car. No, me either. I hope they do another one. Cause I know that he gave Wendy extensive notes. Yeah. Um, so maybe there would be a sequel to talk about what it was like for him to, to battle cancer and the years beyond sacred heart. But yeah. Yeah. I, I think I told you guys this once too. Actually, I have one more comment. I apologize, but we're talking about Dio. <laughs> and it was just that I always loved that Scotty Ian once said to him, like, what do you do to warm up, man? Like, you're fucking amazing. And Dio's thing is like, he's not that man. I, I smoke a joint and I go out. You know what I mean? That was Dio's yeah. thing. Yeah. He never warmed up, never fucking took any classical training. He's just, well, that's the way he says it in the book too. I opened my mouth and the sound came out. Yeah. It's funny because in the book, he kind of downplays like the drugs and stuff. Cause I don't think he did a lot of hard drugs and he even kind of downplays the amount of pot. But then I remember that comment. Yeah. He was like, a yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. You were a pothead dude. Like don't, don't, he seemed to downplay a little bit in the book a little. Mm -hmm. so, I yeah. think he smoked every day. I think it was a big pothead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. my, that's my point. I mean, the book does a, I have to keep making comments, but the book does a really good job of having like a conversational tone where you feel yeah. like, you know, Dio when you're reading it. And I like that part of it because he is, was a very real person and it comes across in that book really well. That, that's sometimes that's hard with biographies. You didn't always get that, but I definitely felt that when I was reading it. In, I'm, you know, it's funny you say that, Marcus, on, because there was a couple of times where later on in the book you have Dio talking and, and then there is like, a, you know, italics uh, aside where Wendy, where it's yeah. Wendy talking. Yeah. And then sometimes like I kind of forget that I'm reading that Wendy, t Wendy's talking and then I pick up when Dio is talking and I get super confused, mm -hmm. maybe in the beer. And, uh, and then I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then I have to go back and like, oh, Dio is talking now. Yeah, you know? I did that too. It is that very conversational tone. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And I actually, let me point out too that um, barring... You're dumb welcome to the Dio podcast. Uh, well, but, no, I'm sorry. But, but <laughs> barring Mick Wall, one of the things that impresses me about both of those books is that neither of them has a ghostwriter. Those guys wrote those fucking books. They're, they're good writers. And that's not common. Most fucking yeah. music biographies have a ghostwriter. That's why I was wondering yeah. what Mick did just he took the organized he it helped no he helped close some things that were left open and probably did some organizing but there not, it wasn't in the finished state we read it in let's put it that way okay he had to bring it to that because you know it was interesting because yeah, you know when it. wendy it was, came in hand. they noted it <laughs> and so i was expecting something for mick and there just wasn't so um they talk about it in the epilogue i think uh or something. There's in the, there's a forward or something where she talks about what Mick did. Okay. So how many uh, since I've been on? Since I've been on. Um, <laughs> since you've been on. Through like, like one and a half items. Yeah, maybe. pretty much. No, no, no. We're doing pretty good. We're almost no. done with news. <laughs> almost. <laughs> I, so I, I, I'm like uh, <laughs> I, I I shudder to mention Christ. this last news item because we'll never get off this either. But uh, the decibel metal and beer fest. You can get me off. I do. 
Um, What's that? Which is next month, supposedly, allegedly, in Philadelphia, is supposedly happening, and we're going, supposedly, allegedly. Uh, But Philadelphia is requiring (coughs) vaccination or proof of a negative COVID test, and now so is, of course, the Fillmore in Philadelphia. Uh, so, and so is Atlas. And so is Atlas. You guys uh, followed suit. So, yeah. Anyway, um, so I think this is a good thing because, you know, obviously if you're, if you're vaccinated or have had it, I mean, the negative COVID test thing is kind of like a, a backdoor to trouble to me, and I don't mean Eric but, Wagner. Um, well, it's, it's actually kind of bullshit because you could pick up Right, it just has to be the last seventy-two hours, but you could pick it up the day before. The day, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm not a fan of that. I don't know why they do that, but um, I guess money is probably um, the reason. It's all legal too. I'm sure it is. I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of legality involved in them being able to do that. Yeah. So people have an out. Discrimination. Yeah, but hopefully this is, will lead to a safer decibel and metal metal and beer fest. And we will all arrive and have a joyous and wonderful time. I, I got to be honest with you guys. I don't know how they're going to do it. If you're re- the other thing too is you re- have to be required to wear a mask at all times in the venue. Only if you're Unless unvaccinated. You're eating, it, eating and drinking. How is that going to work? I mean, nobody's going to have a mask on then if they're drinking. Well, right. That was especially the it, the, the the choice was either you have to wear a mask. Or you have to be vaccinated. I thought it was everyone now had to in in Philadelphia. Yeah, like D.C. is you have to be wearing a mask. Whether you're vaccinated or not, you have have to wear a mask and eating or drinking. Maybe it changed since I saw it. And that's why why Albert had made the comment in his post on uh, Facebook. Or maybe it was Decibel. I don't know who that. They're trying to work through what they're going to do with the breweries because they're all inside the venue Uh where the bands are playing. And... Mm -hmm. It's. I just can't imagine <laughs> that a lot of people are going to have the monitor drinking inside the venue. You know what it drinking beer is with a mask? The, the whole. It's called waterboarding. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what happens when you get on the boat and you don't even know what the fuck's going on? Right. I mean, are you going to be wearing a mask then? There's no way they're going to be able to enforce it. I, I watch. So I've been. I watch a lot of WWE. Right. So now they have crowds and you see them. They're supposed to be able to wear a mask and you see people with masks, you see people with masks on their chins. You see people with masks completely yeah. off so. and there's nobody going around and be like, put your mask back on. It's going to be the same thing with decibel. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be chaotic. Well, the thing, the difference here though, is that it, it's, you can only take it off if you're eating or drinking. If they had no, so if you have booze, a beer in your hand, you're good. That's the point. <laughs> Are they going to change that? So I, I just think it's going to be a clusterfuck, to be honest with you. Well, me. I think they should, if they're going to allow that, they still should have to be vaccinated. You can't come in and wear a mask if you're unvaxxed. And I'm pretty sure you can't. So if you're vaxxed, I don't care if you're wearing a mask. I mean, well, if you have the COVID tests in 17 two hours and you're not vaccinated you could come in right that's, yeah. so, that's the problem that's the whole reason why i'm saying it's it's i think they have a lot of logistics to work out still for this if there was no brewery so then i'd be like oh it's yeah, like another but, indoor i mean event. this is going to be the this is what we're going to be facing come just two weeks from now or two and a half weeks from now uh-huh. at atlas is we have the same policy it's kind of like the it's kind of like the the live venue policy you know, DC is back to wearing masks indoors. And if we want to have a show, which we are for show September 11th, there was, we wear masks. And at, when you, when you saw, when you enter that door, you have to show us a either physical or digital copy of your vaccination, vaccination certificate, or a physical or digital copy of your negative COVID test from the last 72 hours. Hey, well, I, I want to follow that up with some, what does, Atlas have to do for the customers to feel comfortable to people who are working because if all the customers are required to show proof, if you're there, you know, it's, like you it's, said, this is only show nights. So this is only for show. No, I so, know that, but there's people that are working there and this is same for in Philadelphia at the Fillmore. If you're required, you can't get in unless you have those two things. I would think then that they're requiring the people working. The to staff the should. Yeah. I'm, I, yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, 
knowing Atlas, every single person who's working there has sure. a oh, I understand. Yeah. I'm just, but you know, at Philadelphia, that's nothing that Albert or Dust Bowl can control. That's no, the venue. No, we can control that, but yeah, yeah you guys may can. Not, yeah, but it it just seems a little. And I, I'm not going down any conspiracy. Right? I just feel like if they're going to do that. You gotta. I mean, listen. There's a high probability we're going to get we're going to get the Delta variant. And stop. Oh, that, that's my whole point. Uh, yeah. I think I'm it's known, really high, John. Yeah. I've known a couple people who are vaccinated who still got the Delta variant or still got. So sorry, they still got COVID. Your friends with Corey Taylor. The How did they fare? By the way. They do okay. It was minor. minor but yeah. Anybody who got it that was vaccinated, it was very minor. That, that's exactly. the whole point. Yeah. Like it's kind of like yeah. getting the flu shot. You can still get the flu, yeah, but you're not going to get super sick from it. If you get, get wiped out, especially yeah. with this Delta variant, which I don't know if either one of them got the Delta variant, but sure, they both got sick and they both tested positive for COVID. But it was kind of like. Hey, you got the sniffles, you got the cough, you got a little yeah. fever. Yeah. It was kind of like getting a cold, like, like Bruce Dickinson. That's right. right, Bruce got it. I forgot. Yeah, but then we come home, so you come home to your family. You know, that's well, that's, that's the, well, the big feel. You know, so that's what, well. And I so, was going to go travel to my family after, but I decided not to just yeah. because my parents have some, you know, conditions. Oh. I, I don't want to. I'm not bringing anything to them. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm planning on probably getting tested as soon as I get home. Just because you know, I don't want to yeah, give anything to Jen. That's a good idea. That's so, a good idea, John. Yeah, you should always get tested for gunnery when you go away. Well, <laughs> whenever you hang out with the Metalheads well. podcast. Well, that's the whole thing. Exactly, Marcus. <laughs> thank you. I was just going to say. Okay. Which, you know, we know a lot of people go into this thing. I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, it'll be just us. And then it's like, oh, wait, well, Jeff and Steph are going. And, and I think I think John B.T. is going. going. I mean, yeah. I think so, the yeah. good news is that we're all vaccinated and we're we're going to be hanging out a lot. Yeah, and like Justin's going, and and uh, Nick from Wait, Facebook, he he's going. That he's going. Justin, yeah, yeah, I think he did. I think he yeah, 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 Justin. Yeah. How fucking cool is this? So last episode we had Justin on, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm trying to find tickets." Blah blah blah. Right <laughs> after the episode posted, uh, Jeff of Jeff and Steph. Gets a hold of me and he's like, "Hey man, I got two extra tickets if if Justin wants them," and I was like, "You're fucking yeah. kidding me!" And he's like, "Yeah, man." And so I hooked the two guys up, and and uh, whoa, Justin's going whoa. now. But uh, and, you know that I thought that was also going to be coming. I think so. That's the pretty captain's cool. Coming. Who is the captain's going to be coming? The captain. He's like my best friend from oh. Chicago, and it, uh, it, uh, he's he 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 posts on the board. Uh, a few times. So, uh, yeah, he's cool. And I think he's only coming for one day because the tickets were like sold out for like one day. Speaking so. of people in one day, is not the Metalheads Butler going for a day? He's going for one day too. Metalheads yeah. Butler! Metalheads Butler! Metal hey, do, you, do you guys know if there's going to be a pre show? There is not. At all? There's no pre show. Okay. There's, there's, actually a, that, there's actually yeah. another show happening in the uh, upstairs that day. Well, yeah, I know that because uh, I think I told you about that. Because Usually um, there's two pre-shows. There's a there's a show a week in advance. So Atlas right. hosted that one show, hosted that show two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. And then there's a show the night before. Yeah. So there's kind of like two pre-shows. Yeah. They're doing like a dead guy uh, documentary that I was thinking about going, but I was like, well, I wonder if they're going to have a, like a pre-show. So uh, that's why I ask. So maybe I'll just get tickets to that dead guy. Pre-show is cheesesteaks. Cheesesteaks and well, wieners. Gonna, I plan on eating cheesesteaks for every single meal. I've actually planned it out. I'm thinking that so. too, man. <laughs> I was like, you know, once was not enough last time. We need to go more than once. I, oh, I went more than once. I haven't had a hoagie in a long time. Oh, God, I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait to see you guys. It's pretty soon. This is a fucking month. I know. Assuming I know. it's going to be on, of course. Yeah. You don't want to assume anything. Anything could happen between now and then. You let's, me. let's uh move on and not jinx it anymore because the more we talk about yeah. it, the more we're keeping it out there. Oh, the, uh, I gotta piss though before new yeah. releases. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's we'll take a quick that we're doing. Take a quick yeah, I need a I need a refill. So you are listening to the Middleheads podcast. And if you don't listen, then the hell with you. All right, let's move on to new releases. This way's new releases. First up, we have the new album that I didn't even know was coming until it dropped was the new Between the Buried and Me album, Colors 2. This is their uh, North Carolina band's 10th album. It's like 
proggy. It's definitely proggy. Uh, I don't know, proggy deathish. Yeah. What would you call it, John? Did you listen to it or listen to it half acidly like the other albums? John? I listened <laughs> intently for the first several songs and then continued working my ass off. Yeah, it's, and it's long. You know, it's you like seventy eight minutes. You long. know, mm-hmm. I, I even texted John because when I started listening to it, I was like, "Is this a Coldplay album?" Because like the very yeah. first song is so <laughs> fucking Coldplay until until it gets heavy. No, that's that's the Deaf Heaven album. Yeah, and then yeah, oh, at man. some point I, I like looked up and I said, "Hey, this sounds kind of Voivodish." And I was like, "Wait, didn't their last album sound kind of Voivodish?" Yeah, Voivod. I had no idea it was coming out either. And I'm not a, a big fan, but I kept, I said to Dredge, "I feel like I should like these guys for some reason," and I don't. And I listened and I was like, I kind of like this album. It's so not bad. I've been it's all digging, right. I've been digging deeper into their stuff. So I know George, you told me there's a few albums. I should have a while back. You told me to, to check out a couple albums. I just, I've seen them so many times on tour and they're not the band you want to see on tour to get mm-hmm. into. Mm-hmm. It is weird, John, because they're, I mean, they're progressive. They check all the boxes, but you don't, I just don't have um, yeah, it's just, a special no feeling for them, I guess. Yeah. And that's, I'm the same way because, you know, I didn't like any of the stuff. When they were on Victory, I was like, uh, I'm not going to even check them out. I know these Victory bands, what they sound yeah. like, yeah. you know, and his his harsh vocals are very Victory all the way through. They sound like yeah. those bands and yeah. it always turned me off, but the music, the playing is out. Those guys are just unbelievable musicians, yes. whether you like them or not. I mean, it's like, fuck. The it's Parallax just, 2 was the one that brought me in. So like yeah. nine years ago. And he Coma Ecliptic was really good. That was, that was actually the one that he, was very I, voivod to me. You, you just can't see them live and say, oh, I like this band because you'd be like, wait a minute. They don't stop for like 60 minutes. Yeah. It's like, fuck. <laughs> It's I, exhausting. Um, when I was coming out of my shitty metal phase, um, colors <laughs> was one of the things I cut my teeth on and just kind of fell in love with, you know, the genre. As I evolved, I don't listen to them as much. But this is the um, sequel and, and, to that. Yeah. Well, and that's why I need to kind of, you know, I, I kind of skimmed it a little bit. And that's funny with the Deaf Heaven comic, because that's, I think, what I listened to after as I was going through things. And I was like, what the fuck? Um, but yeah, I'll, I'm going to spend some more time with this one. I think, yeah, I think, I think Heaven, I'll just make one comment. And it, I was going to make one too. Right. That, <laughs> that decibel gave deaf heaven a high number in their latest magazine, but admitted that this is not even metal. I think they gave it an eight. Yeah. 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 It's well, going to be it's on their not list. metal. Yeah. Well, okay, hello. Yeah, the la- the cover song, of the last, the last issue is. <laughs> was the lingua whatever, and that's yeah, not even she's remotely be on list too. Not oh, even God. Did not you, even remotely metal. I tried listening to that. Man, I don't get that. I, I just don't get it. I tried. You Love know, I I loves them so much. I've ripped so on much. it so much, and I and I had a conversation with James about this, and he, he I was trying I to keep it, it light, and he just didn't take it the way I wanted him to. Um, but oh. I actually can tolerate this album. Because it's not trying to be metal. Talking about Deaf Heaven or the the lingua, we've moved lingua, lingua whatever, ingnata. Yeah, know, lingua, it's yeah. It's, yeah. it's that one. And I was like, oh, I I know what this is. This is mere core. I do a I do a really heavy, noisy black metalish album, and then I do something that's clean. Is and and that's not that's that's show? not it's not meant to be a a a. a, a uh, There's a, a gripe on, on Mirkor because sure. I like Mirkor. That's what I thought. But it's neo folk and dark wave. That's what I thought. Yeah, but I just I don't get I, it. I really don't. Understand. This album's kind of fucked so, up because of our like random screaming and shit. Uh, but yeah, I like it better than whatever the fuck that last album was. So moving on, you guys hear the new carcass? Yeah. <laughs> Did you know <laughs> that it's got a button? Heaven. I thought we were talking about between the buried and me. All right. Oh, I did want to. I did want to mention the death. The new carcass. I did want to mention the deaf heaven comment that Clanchar made. Uh, Dan was like, you know, I feel like this is the lane they should have been in all the time. Or maybe I said that part, but but essentially, I was uh, confirming what he said that uh, this new deaf heaven album sounds like what they should have been doing all along, and I completely agreed with that. I'm like, this is a like post rock band that was trapped in a black metal body, and. I'm like, this is, I haven't listened to the whole thing. I've, I've spot listened to it. And I was like, yeah, it says, you know, this is, this is all right. This is okay. I'm Compared to what they it. used to I mean, do. I actually, I actually like it. I actually like the new Deaf Heaven a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's, that it's reason. Not, I haven't. Uh, it's shoegaze. It's, it's shoegaze, light shoegaze, really. But he's not like, nah, 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 nah. you know, no mm. Mars attacks. <laughs> 
All right, now but we can move on to carcass. carcass. Will is <laughs> um, the will go, will go. That we're yeah. listening to. Torn arteries. Their seventh album makes me hungry because of all the veg on the cover. Veg not veg. Go ahead, Will. You want to talk about this one? Nope. Oh, we get a sound effect. I don't know how to operate technology. Here's my mic. I like uh, no, slow now. Uh, my process. I like my French fried potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> With some carcass. Put the lotion in the basket. Sometimes. Hey, sometimes. You know. <laughs> The car cast. Well for the review of the album. This is what we're doing. <laughs> no. I listen to it on my BlackBerry. Sometimes <laughs> life is like a box of car cast. Patch, patch Mixing my movies here. Right. Right. That boy. I like how me, Matt, and John have inside jokes. That yeah. boy. Patch, he lives my BlackBerry. He lives in his heart, and his heart is a big place to live for a boy like that. <laughs> and his heart is made out of vegetables. <laughs> I love this part. I like the like Yoko's comment. Everyone get the fuck out. That goes for beep, 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 and beep, beep, beep. <laughs> hey, hey, Jay, do you want to bring this back on the rails? Reality? I will. Yeah, yeah. And, and that I think this is a great record. And um, Sergey, my dear friend and bass player, had similar comments to George. And I'm George, you sh- should speak your own opinion. But George said he had hoped it would be a little more aggressive, was his one comment he's yeah. made thus far. May make more. Really? Um, I like, I think it's aggressive as fuck. I think, but I, I think it's, it's slower. It's slower than like surgical steel. A, I think it's album. better than surgical yeah. steel. And Jay, you're, I'm, I'm quoting you in the, in our thread when you said this album has got some sick grooves and mentally. It's I precision thought. aggression. Well, you know what it's got too? It's like, it's, this is, um, has, um, in my mind, this has Bill Steer's stamp all over it. Cause Bill's the uh, fucking, Bill so you know, much. he's got the, what do you call them? The bell bottoms and all that. And this kind of has some stonery doomy riffs on it, but carcassized. And then, <laughs> and, and there's so much I like on it. It goes to a lot of cool, weird places, but my, I think my favorite carcass song ever is, I just don't want to get the title wrong. Cause it's long, like all carcass titles, flesh ripping, like well. torment limited. This, this is a 10 minute, 10 minute Epic. And by the way, a British way of saying damage incorporated. Which now, that's I what I was thinking too. Yeah, and that is such a the whole record's great, but that fucking roller coaster of a fucking cool song with no cheap riffs in it is like a high water mark on this record. And the record itself is, is this is this is a contender for me. I fucking love it. It could have been a contender. Like Maybe that you know, it's like th- this record is a record I listen to and I forget to breathe because I'm just like, wow, like yeah. w- where the fuck are they going? But you know where they're going, but you don't know. And th- your, your point, Jay, about like, I love Bill Steer's riffs. Like, yeah. they just oh, yeah. don't know so what good. they're going to sound like, but they just sound so good. Calling it yeah, now. Really? Matt's number one. Jay's number one. Will's number two. <laughs> right. It, right. Could, it could be my whole top five. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, they well, inject a, a lot of rock into it, too, but it, yep. it's still very, very metal. But the, the rock part of it actually accentuates it highlights it. it to me it's very aggressive it's an aggressive hook parade yeah and uh i i love it i think it's fantastic it, it could be my favorite carcass record to be honest i'm, with you. I'm batting that around too marcus on and the mm-hmm. great example of what you're talking about is the last song the side mm-hmm. this remorseless swing which opens with this really kind of lush uh groovy almost uh um, almost like the Maiden opening of the Maiden song, right? Uh, the, yep. um, it's not like that. It's not as Western. Running on the wall. Yep. But it's a little bit classic Rocky. And yep. then yep. that's the thing is that then the carcass kind of over, you know, saturation kicks in and it becomes a whole different riff, even though it's the exact same riff. And it was one of the reasons I said it's like a real Bill Steer record, because I think his bass has always been a little more classic. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But when you put it through those kinds of amplifiers and play it the way they do, it's yeah. different. But it's classic, but it's, but it also sounds new, which is amazing because these guys have been around for fucking ever, like 35 years, some shit. It's, it's nuts. I feel like they just keep getting better. Yep. I I, don't know how. You made a powerful statement and I'm going to back you up on it. This might be my favorite carcass record. I mean, it needs more spins because I mean, I've spun it maybe six times. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to spin it more, but it's great. It's definitely going to be up there on my list. I have no idea where it's going to fall, but of course it's going to be up there. 
I really regret not doing what Will did, which is I got some special package when I bought when I ordered it, but Will got the fucking dinner plate, and that was a. I think it's still available, isn't it? Maybe I should follow through on that. Then I can send George my regular copy. <laughs> You know, what's I funny I got, is I, I, I didn't get I didn't get one of those shirts because I was like, man, my kids will freak out with that heart. And then George was like, hey, you know what? It's all vegetables. I'm like, yeah. fuck. <laughs> I, I love the cover, actually. Yeah. I was vegetables like, do a body wait game. a minute. That's a pepper. I like peppers. <laughs> Did you watch well, the video, though? Because, of course, in the video, yeah. that heart rots. Which yeah. Is pretty, uh, yep. you know? yeah. yeah. Well, George sent a, a link for the interview they did. I think it was Rolling Stone or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Rolling they, Stone. They were talking about that. They, they really liked the image of the heart because they've done the real carcass stuff yeah. so much to right. death. Right. Yeah. Well, how about we use some imagery that kind of conveys that, but in a different way? That's Because they got the unique. vegan thing with Jeff, at least. Mm-hmm. Well, he said they were worried that people are going to think that, oh, it's the vegan thing, but it's really not that. That's what they said in the <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah, that's true. That really. Yeah. So I like that part of it. I also, by the way, I think I assume the devil rides out and and I can, from what I can make out lyrically is about the British movie, the devil rides out, which is like one of my favorite kind of weird seventies mm-hmm. satanic exploitation movies. It's great. And, um, and it would be, I'm sure I can't imagine that they're not like big fans of that. Um, I'll just say again, that I think they're super clever. They're just a cut above. There's nobody like them, which maybe you could say about every band we like, but they're just so unique. And, and they're firing on all cylinders. Yeah. So I am not disappointed in this record. It exceeded my expectations. John, what did you think of it? You haven't you haven't said anything yet. I'm a, a super carcass fan. I've got I know, most, I know. I've got most of their stuff and I like them. Mm-hmm. I think I probably like them better live than I do on album. Um I thought it was good. I won't it won't be as high if it makes my list like you guys, but I do like it. Um yeah. I was with George in that Wilson Award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's not a Wilson award. Yeah, that's, that's a, a that's a yeah. that's a J. But oh, oh. I don't really care because I got plenty of stuff to put on my list this year. I got too much actually. But yeah. I agree with George. I listened to it. And, yeah, it's aggressive, but it they definitely are have continued down this. It sounds like this should be a shock to people. They've been doing this ever since Swan Song. Uh-huh. They've just slightly tweaked their sound every album. Yes, you know, and so. But I like it. It's cool. Just, yeah, I'm not. I'm not well, a super fan like you guys. That's all. Well, well, that's what you hit upon. Something I really like. They tweak their sound every album, and I like that. You get something a little bit different each time. It's recognizably Carcass, but it's a little bit different. They they, I, they, they use their influences. They use you know what they've learned or something that they've um, that's happened to them in their their lives, and then put it into the record. And that that makes we'll say this: the opening me. track is an absolute banger. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then I heard the second track, and I was like, ah. Not so big on the second one. You know, um, I, I'm going to tell you, tell you to go listen to the, you know, uh, Sonic Flesh Ripping Torment. If anybody, like, that's my sales pitch for this record, is that song, <laughs> you know? I certainly like it better than the EP. I wasn't big on the EP. I thought the EP was just okay. Yeah, me too. Sonic Flesh Ripping Torment is my pitch for everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, my, my, my personal final comment it is, because I've said plenty, but it's that it's, um, it's got a lot more low end than Surgical mm-hmm. Steel did too, which is fine mm-hmm. with me. I don't have a problem with that one way or another, but it's definitely got a lot more bottom end to it. I also think that Sonic should make a big bottom called flesh ripping. Cock has got on Sonic flesh ripping torment and a veggie burger. Yeah. Damn right. Like a heart. Basically, <laughs> it's just it's like a heart would be great, John. Two buns and like 16 jalapenos. <laughs> You just know, like a big old watermelon and carve it out. <laughs> my, my initial comment was, I wish it was heavier. And then, uh, and then I read, I think it was the Rolling Stone interview, but it might've been a des- the decibel one. I don't know. I read them both. Um, where I think it was Bill said, you know, we don't have to be like as heavy as we used to be. There's like, we're, we're fucking old and shit. And, and I'm par- <laughs> paraphrasing here. Um, He's like, there's newer bands. If you, you know, there's plenty of bands doing like super heavy shit if that's what you want. And I was like, mm-hmm. all right, fair enough. So I, I will concede that. It's the colors that I like mm-hmm. on the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of it. If you can go through it two or three times, you're going to find stuff on there that's like, ooh, you know, you're like, wow, that was a weird yeah. little turn, left turn. And but then, George, then, you, actually, you also be, used to be a, a bit heavier and, and now you're not and you're better for it. So, hey, word to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Profound shit. <laughs>
What? what, what? <laughs> Which, by the way, so I also like, you know, I have to say, uh, um, Albert likes to get a lot of repeat bands on Decibel, as we all know. Like, there's certain bands that kind of seem to be showing up every year, more or less, pretty consistently. Pig Destroyer would be one of them. Why don't you bring Carcass every year, dude? Fuck, if you're gonna, if right. you're gonna, if you're gonna double up on somebody. Let's get some more Carcass on that fucking bill. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move through these next three albums. Well, uh, mostly quick. Um, album good. Good album. Move on. Mm, good. <laughs> Money, good. <laughs> Napster, bad. Fast, heavy, good. Okay. So the next album we have is the new Craven Idol album, Forked Tongue. It's their third album. They're a UK black thrash band. They've been uh, well-liked on this podcast in the past, and I know they're well-liked now. By, by Jay, at least, I like them as well. Well, I think Jay had it as his album of the month last month. Yep. That's why yeah, I know that he months. likes it's it. Just, <laughs> stylistically, this is just like right in my wheelhouse. It's that black and thrash, as George mentioned, with honestly like a kind of almost never more presentation as far as production goes. It's just a, two tons of metal in your face, dude. This is just a good time, you know, and it's nothing fancy in its way. That, that's maybe a shitty wow. way to put it. Is, but. it. is it like motorboating you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would Motorboat say it's relentless. It's relentless, thrashy black metal with an old soul because it definitely feels like a throwback. Yeah. It's just, it's pretty fun. And I feel like you probably agree with this, Jay. The album gets stronger as it goes, which is yeah. unusual. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, as, and I know that Goat Horror, they don't sound like Goat Horror, but this is that kind of band that has an old soul to it, as you say. And so that's just right in my wheelhouse for some reason. You know, I, yeah. I really appreciate guys that are kind of rooted in the past like that. And it's just a quality record. It's a good time. Right on. I like the elderly. Next up, it's Super not album. Fauci, it's Fulci. And that mm-hmm. is uh, an Italian death metal band and their third album, Exhumed Information, which I believe is based on a movie. My cousin I, Fulci. My cousin Fulci. Well, it's, a, it's an Italian it's a horror director. The director, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I know that. Um, and... This album uh, is pretty cool. I like it. It's it's a as bands seem to be doing these days. It's a mix of death metal and synthwave, and in fact, the last three tracks on the album are all synthwave. Um, mm. But it's a pretty cool fucking album. I dig it. Yeah, it was cool. I yeah. liked it. Yeah, it was. It was, I mean, it was all right. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it's fairly standard death metal with a, with a slightly different edge because it's got that synth in it. It's got the. No, I don't. I don't. It's I don't, not really. It's not like a lot of bells and whistles to me. I yeah. think they put. The I synth. bought it. I liked it, and I didn't think there was a lot of synth wave in it. But only the last three songs. I don't there's really know what synth wave is. So whatever. it's like it's, it's where there's a complete and total lack of metal. And it's only synthesizer. That's the last three <laughs> tracks on the album. It's not hip hop. They go death show. heaven and parts of the uh, the album. Oh, okay. It is something that's we've talked about this recently. This seems to be a new. That's like the lion's thread. daughter thing and yeah. blah blah. Lion's yeah. daughter's not a thing. Lion's daughter's daughter. <laughs> I, no, I'm just saying they. I, I, I feel like they were an early adopter. Let's put it that and way. If you had met the lion's daughter, you would understand what I mean. <laughs> Fine. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm good. Next, next, next. Ah, uh, wolves in the throne room. Primordial Arcana. Their seventh album of black metal from the state of Washington, and featuring special skills and bass playing, and possibly some backup vocals by our friend Galen from what band? Fairbro. Nathan explosion. So, uh, I mean, I like wolves in the throne room, uh, but something about this one, just, uh, you know, I, I listened to this on the beach, nobody around staring at the ocean waves. And I was like, Whoa, dude, this is pretty cool. You, and it's, it's, it's oh, like, goodness. I feel like it's got more low end. It's heavier than like typical, you know, Washington black metal bands. And, I would even, I even, I think I told John this that it, it, at times it almost feels like death metal because of what they're doing. Mm. It's not just black metal. Well, you can um, actually hear the music now, as opposed to you know those early albums like Twelve Stars, yeah. and Two Hunters. While they're great, 
they are pretty background. Yeah. You have to really Atmospheric. concentrate. Yeah. Um, but so. yeah, the production is pretty decent. And uh, there's there's some kind of synthy, almost synth wavy stuff in there too. Yeah, I'd even go to say that there even it's even almost dungeon wave because it's uh. very medieval. Some of the the rhythms, yeah. Um, but they play the black metal on top of that, which I thought was interesting, as opposed to just like the other album we just talked about from uh, Fulci that where they kind of let the synth wave go off on its own. They actually play on top of that. Yes, which is it's kind of integrated cool. a lot yeah. better. I, yeah. I mean, I love Wolves in the Throne. I think yeah. this is a great record. I, I, yeah. I'm dying to get on vinyl. I know John has on vinyl. I haven't gotten it yet. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I like it's it. really good. All right, it is a little heavier, I think, than the last record. Uh-huh. Yeah, it is. So, I, and I like that part of, of it. And they're, I mean, they're so good live. So I'm really looking forward to to seeing them play. The songs are shorter on this album too. So you're right. As, as long as they're not focused. Will. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. If you like wolves, you'll, you'll probably like it. So yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, what are we listening to? Marcus on. Oh shit. Uh, all right. So my first one is uh, unrequited beautiful ghosts on uh, prophecy productions. This is a breathtaking post black metal record. Just listening to it is like being stabbed with a spectral blade that breaks off in your heart. And then it roots and grows into flowers of soft light inside you. That's what I feel when I listen to this fucking thing. I hey, Mar- hey, Marcus, love this record. Are there any lyrics at all, or does he kind of just chant, sing a little bit? You know, I haven't looked at lyrics at all, but uh, that's a good question because I have it on vinyl. I haven't actually looked. I'll have to take a look, John. I'm not okay. positive. I feel like there is singing on it. Um, there is a lot of instrumental parts in it, and yeah. when they do the black metal vocals, it is kind of in the background, uh, but it works perfectly on this record. So I was a little hesitant when they said that when they announced this album because I love the last record so much. I wasn't sure what we were going to get, but I, I actually, the emotional core of this record really resonates with me. Um, the next record I have on my list is a band called Rye. Now, their name and the name of the album is all in Russian. So the name means Rye. I can't pronounce the rest of it. It's on a Reflection Nebula Records. This is just a beautiful, haunting album of monstrous black and doom. Uh, the LP drops at the end of September, but all the songs are up on Bandcamp now. And um, I, I've been listening to this a lot lately. So um, it's one of my favorites, actually, this year. Uh, Can I interrupt? Vale Mist. Can I rip? Yep. Interrupt? Sorry. I'm trying to squeeze an Ed word in there. Um uh, not that you're talking too much or anything. It's your turn. Um, I was just trying to find a good time to interrupt because I want to talk about you. Um, me? Yeah. My friend Dave texted me today and he was like, dude, man, Marcus really has a way with words. He's like listening to the episodes. He's like, he's like 10 episodes back or whatever, but he's like, wow, man, Marcus really speaks well. He, he should be like a writer or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like um well actually <laughs> like yeah you should i'll pass that along <laughs> yeah. you about that. <laughs> buy my comics marcuson.com yeah I, I literally sent him your website <laughs> so that's funny that's cool that's yeah. funny yeah thought you'd enjoy that it's yeah, I do. It's weird how much um, shit cross pollinates because there's people that'll listen to the Metalheads podcast and then find my books, mm-hmm. my comics, and everything. And then it goes the other way too, you know, where they'll, they'll read my comics and they see I do the podcast and then they get into it and they're like, oh, I love that album that you recommended or, you know, John recommended or, or well, maybe not Will, uh, but you know. Yeah. What everybody in the podcast uh, recommends. So I think that's really cool. I I am enjoying that, and especially bands too. I think that's why I've been booking a lot of bands for the the cast because of that cross pollination. It's really weird. Um, All right. Well, thanks for that little uh, carry on. 
George. Uh, Veil Mist, Sea Crips of the Ego Chasm. One of the worst names for an album ever, but I love this record. It's self-released. It's very inspired, energetic, melodic death metal, and it just bangs from start to finish. And uh, I think this LP actually features some of the best riffs this year. And there's also a guest solo on on one track by uh, Tyler Sturgill of Zoth, which uh, we talked about uh, recently with Justin, I think. Yep, he, he was wearing the shirt. shirt on. Yes, I really like Veil Mist. That's definitely going to be one that flies under the radar. Uh, v a e l m y s t. I like that one too. Uh, it's so good. Uh, Enigmatum. I think I said that right. Uh, Deconsecrate on twenty bucks spin. Just a sprawling, intricate, and melodic barrage of uh, death metal destruction. Um, it's almost progressive, really. I, I quite like this record. Um, Underdark, Our Bodies Burned Bright on Reentry on Tridroid Records. This is my album of the month last month in July. It's just a really skillful, heavy mix of black metal, post metal, um, shoegaze, really dynamic song structures to it. It has varied vocal deliveries that I that I really appreciate, and just engaging lyrics. Uh, they have songs about addiction. They have uh, songs about psychosis. They have songs about border control, and also shitty landlords. So it's just like it's a really interesting album lyrically something maybe jay would get into because we know that lyrics are very important to him i would uh, hope that the shitty landlords one would have some gang vocals because i feel like that could be a good, good effort yeah, that's the one gang vocal i would accept that <laughs> <laughs> uh fetid zombie transmutations on transcending obscurity records i know uh most of us really dig this record just jaw album of the month baby death. There you go. Darkly blended uh, with black metal, progressive metal, and just just dripping with these ghostly atmospherics that I really like. And some haunting solos. I, I, I just like the atmosphere on some of the songs. It's, it's really well done. That is really well um, done. That one blew me away because yes. I've heard previous stuff by, by the band. And yeah, I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, this is cool. But then, and, and, and which was enough to make me listen to it when I got the promo. And I was like, this was one of those halfway through the album, wait a minute, did I hear what I just thought I heard? And I have to start over because it's like so good. Yeah, it's really good. Um, uh, Let's see. Dungeon Serpent, World of Sorrows on Desert Wasteland Productions and also Nameless Grave Records. Um, This is a towering, um, I would say a maelstrom of uh, of layered death um, with gargantuan fuzz chug guitar attack it's uh i really like this record quite a bit um there's synth on this one as well since we've been talking about synth there's definitely some synth on there um and then another record that has some synth on it um, that i think does it better than most bands and that's hellish form remains on translation loss this is actually one of my favorite records to play it's really slow serpentine funeral doom sludge uh, with the synth and drone in it and i like to play this record at night usually when the moon is full and the ocean is like completely black that's the best time to to play it and two more this is like a george list it fucking uh, is under a <laughs> Under a Serpent Sun, uh, self-titled EP, just a really excellent high-energy blast of, uh, of death metal. Uh, I find myself coming back to it. There's a, so much death metal these days, um, but this one, for some reason, just hits me in the right way. And then the last one is uh, Witnesses. The Collapse, it's self-released. Now, this record officially drops on Halloween, uh, but the pre-order came up, and it it was put up incorrectly. And so the whole album was downloadable for like an hour. (laughs) And I happened to grab it, and I spun it a few times now. And um, this band surprised me, I think, believe it was last year, with Doom 2. Yeah. And that record really merged Mammoth, mournful doom with the emotional alt rock vocals. So I fell in love with that sound and I, and it was on my top 25, but this n- new album, it continues in that direction and that's good, but there's a new singer on it. 
for some reason. I don't know why. And I just don't like him as much. He's fine. His overall delivery, though, it just lacks that emotional punch that I that, that was in Doom 2. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't I don't feel as much on this record as I did the last one. I'm going to give it some more spins because the, the new guy is a good singer. Um, but for right now, that, that's where I stand on it. I just, I just don't like it as much. I don't know why they switched singers. I don't know what they were trying to accomplish uh, with the record because I felt like that they hit on something that was unique. And you know, I think he was just a guest singer or something because it's like the guy that does the music does the music and he just was like, hey, I got this guy to sing. And you that's know, right. Because I looked that guy up and he, he's a guy who just sells his services, right? But this new guy is the same way. Hmm. So why didn't he just go back with the the other guy? I Maybe don't he wanted a Maybe raise. He wanted something to. I'm not sure what the what, what the deal is. I have gotten kind of a little bit friendly with a guy from Witnesses. Hmm. So maybe somebody we could have on like next year since we're booked up for the end of the year. But uh, yeah. anyways, I like the record. I just I really love the last record. And mostly it was because of um, the singer from the last record. The music actually may be a little bit better on this record. Anyways, there you go. All right. Maddie. All righty. Uh, I am mutually exclusive with the new Carcass promo. Um, what I will just say about it is that when I listen to it, I am not bitchymat.com. Happy Matt. That's not good. <laughs> exactly. Vegetable uh, Matt. Are you veggiemat.com? Yeah. I, I probably should be, but no one. Vegematic. <laughs> am I, uh, yeah, less carbs, Matt? No. I am jalapeno, Matt. So my next one is, and spicy. I forgot how, I was going to mark this on a new. Matt. Spicy Matt. Spicy Matt. Dot com. Sorry, Matt. Um, go ahead. Or dot net. Um, Mark, son, I was waiting for you to mention this band because I was going to copy how you pronounced it, and I don't okay. remember what you said, but I'm going to call them Enigmatum. Not bad. To Consecrate is the album. Um, I remember when the first track came out, Forge It in Bedlam, uh, via 20 Bucks Spin. That was all that was out, and I listened to it, and honestly, the thing that made me fall in love with it was the Rototoms. This is the best use of rototoms I have heard mm. in the longest times. And what I'm realizing is that rototoms are the new sax for me in 2021 because there is a lack of sax out there. Um, even my main sax. Hey, band. Rivers of Nile's coming. Just wait. Coming. That first track lacked sax. Okay. And when you're a sax addict like myself, you need sax. <laughs> and there was no sax on that. So. Um, well, Enig made them. I'll just just interject for a second here. I listened yeah. to. A, I think there was like one track, like you listened to, or two tracks, and I immediately bought the vinyl because it just yeah. it really spoke to me like like that. And yeah, I don't I, do that well, normally. And I went to go buy it, and I saw your icon. And I was like, oh, okay, we're cool. I'm in the right area. <laughs> okay. This isn't this isn't like a uh, this isn't a one night stand. Mm -hmm. uh, next for me is just because of reading the deal book. You know, it's, I read at night before I go to bed. And so the hardest thing about that is, is like, what I'm reading is I want to be listening to it. So Elf, Rainbow, Dio, nice. um, you know, a lot of this started, Jay, like I said, when you wrote that article, I mean, I knew of Dio, I listened to Dio, I love Dio, but just delving into some of his other things. I mean, I forgot how much I love those first three Rainbow albums, um, you know, and even to like one night when I watched the show Billions and the, the dude had the Rainbow Rising shirt on in the end of it. I can't remember if it was Terror Woman or Stargazer that was like in the closing credits. And I was like, I fucking know this. <laughs> I, I would argue, I, I honestly think Rainbow Rising is one of the formative European style heavy metal albums. Like it really yeah. is because that came out like... 70 yeah but it's one of the ones that really kind of has that so guitar harmonies on it and moves along at a more heavy metal euro heavy metal pace well i've been doing this thing so in our new house we have some bike trails and i use these bike trails to get to breweries and i put tunes on when i'm going and i put stargate or i was listening to rising and then stargazer came on and then i put stargazer on again and then i put it on again and like I'm trying to think about what I may have looked like as I was biking. Cause I'm like, I literally like, I see a rainbow rising, you know, looking at people and doing all these things. And I thought this is like, this is what that music is all about and why I love it. You can't get arrested if there's kids on that trail. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately there wasn't. I was like, I was like biking through a garden. People were, 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 were working about their vegetables, which of course brings us back to carton. Carcass. 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 Carcass.
<laughs> um, I don't know about you guys, but like there are just some days I'm actually too lazy to choose music. So I let a computer do it for me. And so Spotify has this list called rewind. So one day I tried it out, right? First four or five tracks. Yes. This is what I've been listening to. And then like the next 20 minutes is like shit. I haven't listened to in like five, six years. <clears throat> totally got back into nails. Like, um, you will never oh. meet one of us came on and I was like, Oh shit, I forgot how much I love these guys. And so, mm-hmm. um, it just threw more and more of that at me. I, I feel like they're probably more in the power violence category than like a grind core, but um, really dug that and just a lot of other stuff. Um, Jay, you mentioned something earlier that was also one of the things that kept coming, you know, and it's sometimes it's just nice to just randomly get fed this shit. Um, another band uh, album, Erdve Savangalia. Um, that's my Lithuanian post metal band. I'm still listening to that a lot. Love it. And also uh, last thing for me, post interview with Hannes, um, John and I were talking about this. I like, I just didn't know how much Hannes Grossman was involved in beyond, you know, some of the obvious ones. So I got mm-hmm. his solo albums, uh, moral collapse. Uh, <laughs> what's the other one I'm not thinking of, John. Did you find the list of alkaloid? Yes. That's the one. Thank you. Yep. Well, Matt that bought like well. everything on Bandcamp Cause I saw, I, saw I was just list. clicking buttons. I didn't have my eyes open. I'm just <laughs> click, 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 click. So, Right just on. click to buy it all. Hannes Camp exactly. 3000. Exactly. <laughs> he didn't realize when he clicked the buy it all on Hannes's page, it was like 472 albums. Yeah, no shit. Dude, no shit. Hannes was so awesome. Like, you don't, I got you, him. We don't the know this. I wanted yet. to get Hannes. The reason I want to get Hans on the cast because I know how much John loves him. Obviously, I love his stuff too, but I knew how much John loves him. But to have him on the cast and have him be that cool and that much fun to talk to, it's it's just like icing on the cake, man. It's so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And FYI, John and Marcus and I, we're from the future. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you have a BlackBerry, you can find us. <laughs> All right, John, give That's us your. That's it for me. Give us your, what you're listening to. Okay. So we already mentioned between the buried and me, and it's just weird for me to say that because I never really listened to him, but I kind of like this new album. So I've been digging through their catalog, but I have been listening to the new one, mm-hmm. uh, but we've already mentioned them. Uh, a band called burial in the sky, the consumed mm-hmm. self. They are a progressive tech metal band out of Pennsylvania. I don't know what it is with me and tech death this year. I'm not a big fan, but for some reason I'm gravitating towards it. But what caught my attention and Jay, this is for you, this song, uh, you may not like the song, but there's something about it that you might like. And it's a song called anatomy of us. It's like a 12 minute song, but it opens up with this very pegs on a wing from animals like intro. Sure. So it's very acoustic and it's, it sounds like the vocal melodies are from that album right and then it just goes off the rails, you know? But it's actually pretty cool. So that's actually, a pretty intro too, isn't it? Oh god! In yeah. and of itself, that, that should be a five-minute beautiful acoustic song. But then they just throw it away and head on. <laughs> yeah. Well, then they revisit it, and I'm like, dude, that's just yeah. one song. Come on. Yeah, for sure. So um, <laughs> but again, I don't know why I'm listening to so much tech death, but um, it's very proggy too. So that's what I kind of like about it. Well, I, I was just going to say that, John. I think some of this tech death stuff has a lot of prog elements into it yeah. so they're giving you a little more color than what you're used to with tech death but uh, yeah at I least that's how i feel yeah i traditionally don't like it because i just mm-hmm. get bored mm-hmm. uh but speaking of technical and like proggy and avant-garde it just off the fucking rails uh, the third album from discord degenerations mm. this album is insane it really uh, is i i mean if you go and you list all the, for fans of it's just like I say for fans of Cynic, Atheist, Void Ceremony, Morbus, Kron, uh, Demolich. I mean, it's just like crazy. It's, I don't know what I think about it. I like it a lot, but it's really, oh, it's a lot to take in. There is a lot going on. It, it, tons. Uh, another band I got off of uh, New Music Friday, somebody mentioned this, Existence Void, Anatman. Mm-hmm. Black metal, semi-avant-garde-ish album. I, somebody had mentioned it. I saw the album cover. I was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. I'm going to, I'm going to buy on the album cover. And I listened, I was like, wow, this is fucking great. And I haven't listened to too much black metal this year and I'm digging out. So that, that'll probably actually end up on my list. I think hmm. uh, we've mentioned fed it zombie. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you, do you know the dude from fed it zombie? Well, will sleep cake. <laughs> I just did a new logo for a droid. Yeah, I know. I didn't know. I thought I, I figured Will would know him because he's from what Leesburg, George. Is that what we figured out? Yeah, I think so. 
somewhere out that way. And he's in a ton of bands, but he does all this artwork. Um, I like that album too. Uh, it was my album of the month. I will add to what Marcus Hassan said about it. There's also a very um, 80s prog metal sound to the guitar riffs, I thought. Mm-hmm. And there's some like semi-gothic metal, early 90s gothic metal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not much, just a touch. I said to George, I said, wow, this album's all over the place. Um, it's cool. Uh, it's for some reason called an EP, but it's longer than most of his albums. Go figure. Um the next one has not been released yet, uh, but I got my copy of it yesterday. It's the new Hooded Menace. Oh, the yeah. Tonus Bell. You bastard. How is it, John? It is. It's very cool. Is it a contender? Yeah. I, I, I was going to be like, hey, this is my album of the month. And then I was kind of like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm trying to be Christopher Walken here, but it's not working. Um, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, my God. Job. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> my God. Hooded Menace might be side. a contender. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> if you do that, George, you got to turn sideways and you have to kind of lift your shoulders. A few I mean, there might be is any cowbell. Because I gotta have more cowbell. Well, there's a big ass bell on the. I cover mean, the songs that have been released are great. Yeah, but uh, John's listening the whole thing. So it is definitely. Um, they were. It doesn't sound like trouble, but it has troubles uh, format, which is the kind of heavy twin guitar riff driven, but with doom. Uh, it's right. still death doom, but it's definitely more upbeat. And it's sound. Um, so don't every album they change the death doom that they do. They do funeral doom one album, then they do straight death doom. This one they've added some more color with kind of more heavy metal riffs. It's good. Mm-hmm. I like it. Uh, that's out Friday. Uh, I got two more. Uh, one that Marcus on and I I know he likes, but I don't know how much he likes this one because he didn't mention it. And that's the new Lantlos Windhunt. Oh, I do love that. I like it. I don't know if it's not as make, much as the last one. Yeah, and I don't know if it'll make my list because it's not really necessarily metal anymore it's more kind of rock and post metalish post rock shoegazy and um it's not it's, metal enough to make my list yeah. john um, and it's not as good as melting sun which no but is it's one good. of my all-time favorites it's very good i do really quite like it though it's very bright and i think that speaks to where he is in his life which is cool mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it's not it's not the Lantlos of 15 years ago, if that's what you're looking for, that's for sure. I mean, I, and I like that he's doing something different, you know, yeah. uh, I, I don't need the same album every single time, no, you know, but of I course would've... I'm, I don't know anything's going to live up to melting sun, yeah, but, but I would, I would have preferred if he still was doing something like melting sun though. Um, and then the last one we already mentioned wolves in the throne room. I'm liking mm-hmm. it. I don't know how much I like it compared to the other stuff, but uh, I, I do like it a lot and uh, well done Galen on being part of that. That's right very on. cool. Nice. I will. Um, so I'm going to do this real quick. Um, so Dan Clan Clan Chur Clown Car Clacking Clinging. Um, he, uh, he sent me this album, um, Crip Crawler. Mm-hmm. Um, Justin's into that album. too. Yeah, yeah. The, the album name is Future Absurper. It's pretty good. It's death metal. I love it. Um, then there's a band from Perth, Australia, which I've been to. It's kind of like, imagine if, um, I'm trying to think of like an appropriate, kind of like. If all the people. Los An- imagine if Los Angeles was like one twentieth the size of people but in the location completely surrounded by nothing on the West coast of the United States. That's Perth, Australia. And it's a band called Ashen and their new, yeah, it's pretty much an EP called um, Godless Oath. Check it out. It's really awesome. Uh, I've been listening to the fetid zombie. We talk about the Fulci mm-hmm. and been listening to the Crescent mm. uh, carving the fires. Of so good. Ah, Ted, I don't have my glasses on. Close enough. Yeah. The new Temple of Dread, which is like obituary worship, but I think they moved on from that a little bit. And I think they're finding their own groove, which is really nice. So if you did not check them out the last time, the new album is called Hades Unleashed. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. And Car Cass. <laughs> that's. Yeah. Hey. Right, I'll be. 
I'll be quick on my list. Carcass, first and foremost, has probably been spending more than anything else. Uh, we got the demo, or excuse me, promo for the new Warm Witch, who I've liked their last few records. Mm. I'm still making my mind up about this one. It's not a huge departure, but they're always a little different from um, release to release. I went back and have revisited a couple of times the last Metal Church album with my cow on it, just as a kind of, you know, honor the man kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming before I got on, you guys talking about my cow, right? Yep. We did. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I have been listening to everybody's albums of the month. Fetid zombie probably being the biggest one that would have been for consideration for me. Had I not gone with Craven idol, which I've also been listening to. Um, and then I'm always listening to older stuff. I seem to have listened to Scorpions, Tokyo tapes five times in the last three weeks for some reason. That's a, a, a older scorpions live album and uh yeah i'll just leave it there a bunch of random stuff too um i also made a point of listening to the both of the uh, thunderdome albums of, a couple of times this week to make sure mm -hmm. i was hey, on the right hey page Jay, this, this reminds me uh how, how's your band doing you've been playing lately yeah what's going yeah, on we got a new drummer i can officially say now which was yeah, pretty nice. cool my head is off to Sergey because I'm lazy and he's not. And he posted on a Craigslist a few times to see if we could get somebody. And we had one guy tried to get a hooker, first. ended up with a drummer. <laughs> had got a hold of one guy who ended up just being a lot of hot air. And then we got this guy who's a jazz drummer and he is bringing the sickest nice. weird shit to the table. And this is a change for him, but he sought us out based on our. And nice. So we're playing right now every week and um, he's still learning the record and we're writing new stuff and everything. So that's fantastic, Sweet. Jay. I'm yeah, really excited for you. Um, I was uh, telling uh, George and, and, um, and maybe you, you, I can't remember if you were here, but I hadn't seen Sergey since the pandemic started. So it was also a real treat to just be in the same room with him again. And if you've never played in front of a half stack or a stack, um, that's hard to replace with a bedroom amp. So when you get to do that again, and make your knees shake a little bit. That's very satisfying experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cool. yeah, we're moving awesome. forward. We're not a awesome, not a lost man. not a lost cause. And right. Sergey, I should also mention is doing a, he's moonlighting in a band I've pitched to you guys once or twice called War Troll, a good friend of ours. Oh yeah, I like War and Troll. They, they actually wear masks and stuff. And mm -hmm. Ser Sergey is just playing keyboards in the band, and he wears like a kind of sun o hood when he plays they got to play one show before new regulations hit us again mm. but i would really recommend the last virtual record this guy adam miss miss Kitch, who's the head of yeah. the band is a good songwriter i really like you it. recommend it before and i totally got into it so good stuff. I, I think yeah, it's great they, well they're working on their second record so it's nice to just be out at this rehearsal studio again and there's not many of us left you know, it really yeah. did wipe some bands out. And the, the, and Warchill's the only band there now that I even know. And then there's a bunch of empty rooms, man. So. Oh, you're so talented, Jay. I'm really excited to, to hear some new songs from you. I'm glad that you're uh, you're practicing with a new band and you're you know, doing well, you're it, too, man. You're too kind, but I will say this. I've been playing guitar like a crazy person. And my, yes, my yes, he soul has. playing has come along like I am a whole different guitar player now. And I play every day for as long as I can. So, yeah. Still working on those Randy Rhodes solos, too, by the way. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, fuck that guy, by the way. He was really good. <laughs> <laughs> Make you cry. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, I, I, I pretty much got my list out. And then there's a lot of random stuff. I'm like Matt. I'll sometimes just put shuffle and see where it leads me. And, and I obviously put a bunch of stuff on the water iPod every week. And that's a big part of listening. But constantly listening. Um, thank God for the new carcass is finally upon us. Oh, it's so good. I mean, thanks, Sate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hand it off to you, Georgie. All righty. Um, I've been listening to all kinds of stuff that's not metal, but I, in terms of metal, I've got a mere four albums for you, one of which has been mentioned. First up, I thought Marcus on was going to say this one, but Alchemy of Flesh, Ageless nice. Abominations, their first album, their Georgia death metal band. Next up, John. It's like my Metal Friday, I think, right? I think I had it in my list. Yeah, I think Anyways. so. Uh, next up, John, I think mentioned this one, Discord with a K. Degenerations, mm -hmm. third album, Norwegian death metal. Uh, I listened to that one based on, I think, Justin or... I know Justin likes it. Um, that's probably where I got it. <clears throat> third album, uh, Laceration. I found this yes. one all on my own because they put out a compilation a couple of years ago of like all their old stuff. Mm -hmm. This is, so this is their first real full length album called demise. Um, mm -hmm. and they're a California death thrash band and they rip. 
It really does rip. It does. And my last and fourth and final album, a band called Ossuary, which is Mm -hmm. not a band that has been on here before because, but there's, there's like Ashwarium or something. Mm -hmm. I thought this was that band. So I listened to it and I was like, Oh, it's not that band. Cause this is, uh, (laughs) but this is their third album called addicted to human flesh. They're a Colombian death metal band. Mm -hmm. Well, not bad, George. I thought you were going to mention like Billy Eilish or something like that. Not man. So I, I, yeah, I listened to all kinds of not metal stuff recently, lately. Right, but, right. but I didn't put it on here. So, are you are you back on a, a metal path, my friend? <laughs> you got to get back. We're, we're, we're I mean, I am the last half I, of the year. I'm just I'm just open to all things. Let's put it that way. I mean, you know, when I work out, I'm mm-hmm. definitely doing death metal or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. so, oh, which reminds me, I forgot to say my. I- have gone back to Pig Destroyer again. So Pig Destroyer is a big part of my listening too. Now speaking of that, all you right, should work out right. to Pig Destroyer to, to get some shit down there with George. So here we are oh. at the ultimate nice end of the episode. Metal Thunderdome. Jay, take it away. All right. So, um, you know, I had um, my primary motivation on the albums I chose was I knew this was going to be the episode with, um, uh, Hannes Grossman on it and he's uh, you know I think he's involved in a lot of proggy stuff um, I would call him a prog drummer and um, I, but I wanted to go back to the 80s and you know when prog was still when prog metal was still somewhat in its infancy you know but there were some things happening out there but um, it wasn't into some of the strange scapes we've gotten to today in a good way you know mm-hmm. Um, and anyway, so I selected uh, Iron Maiden's Seventh Son of a Seventh Son versus Queensryche Operation Mind Crime. Now, the more no, you didn't choice, Rage for order. order, Rage for Order. Excuse me, <laughs> but, but, I, but what I was just gonna that would have changed more. things. Wait, no, it, what? It would have changed things, and and so I did really just, would it have I, changed things? No, for some of us, <laughs> I, I did just misspeak there, but it was because I think. Operation Mindcrime would have been the more obvious choice to put up against this record. Yes. Mm-hmm. Seven of the Sun. For one thing, they were released within a month of each other. And I actually remember at the time, this is true, remembering they had set out to make Seventh Son of a Seventh Son a concept record, which it very much is not because they gave up on. So that so like sixty uh, percent now they did. Yeah, you trust me, research it. It's a concept uh, record. Yes, it is, but not every song is about the concept. They gave up on it at okay. some point. So and Bruce always regretted that. And I read an interview with Bruce at the time that said, we set out to do this and then we got lazy. And he said, and then I remember this and I love this quote. And he said, and then a month later heard operation mind crime. And I was like, well, there goes the fucking neighborhood huh. because he felt Queens, Queens had stepped up and done what they had attempted to do. Right. Now I honestly thought so. I, so, but then I started to think about Prague along the terms of technology, but which both of these records um, embraced some technology that was not common in heavy metal at the time. So I could have gone several ways here. One was Maiden really got introduced to technology when they did Somewhere in Time, which is the previous record. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was going to say it would be Somewhere in Time versus uh, Rage for Order. And I thought, well, Somewhere in Time will win hands down. <laughs> so then I thought, well, it makes more sense to do um, Operation Mindcrime versus Seventh Sun. But then I thought Operation Mindcrime kind of would have somewhat the unfair advantage there, and that even though, will I hear your distaste for it? So then I thought, no, Rage for Order. They, they, so I, so as Seventh Son, hmm. they, they does not have as much technology as um, as uh, Somewhere in Time does on it. They kind of were stepping away, but still got the guitar synth stuff on it. And Rage for Order was Queen's Reich's first attempt at technology stuff mm-hmm. that they added to it. So I think they have about the same amount of that in them, and um, and they're also both almost concept records because seventh son is not the complete concept they wanted to do. And rage for order is primarily about technology, but not uniquely. Uh, not every song is that way. So mm-hmm. I'm going to call them both 50% concept records with technology that was not commonly used in heavy metal at the time. Perhaps I overthought it. I apologize. But, um, and I also think that rage for order is Queens, right? High watermark personally, even above operation Minecraft. So with that, I'll release it to the dogs, and I'm pretty sure you're all just going to say Seventh Son, and I'll go cry in the corner. Mm-hmm. Okay, Marcus on, say it. Well, I'm first of all, I have to say, uh, 
Jay, I like that you put all that thought into it. Um, I, I had the similar thoughts when you put this out and I listened to them and uh, I really appreciate you explaining it. We got Hannes to answer this Metal Thunderdome, just so you know. So that'll uh, be in there. I don't know there. if I've told you that, but well, it's okay, in there. Actually, before you go, then can I say one more thing? Mm-hmm. It is simply that one. the other thing was Rage for Order, most of the technology in that record is drum-based. And so I honestly thought Hannes would appreciate that. There are some keyboards, but a lot of those weird sounds are produced by the drummer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll just save it. You'll, you'll see what Hannes says, but we made sure we got him to uh, make his pick. And he actually had a, a detailed reason for what why he picked what he picked, which was cool. cool. Awesome. So for me, um, I thought when you made this pick, it would be an incredibly easy choice for me because like most of us, I'm a huge Maiden fan. Uh, in fact, Jay actually mailed me his extra final copy of Seventh Son, I believe last yeah. year, because he had one. So I got a kick out of spinning the LP that you sent me, Jay. And nice. that was really cool. Your copy not, of, not that I didn't have it spun it a million times, but that your, was really Your copy cool. of Rage for Order is in the mail right now. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, so Seven Sun is a, is a good record. It's not on my high all-time maiden list. I may have talked about uh, this with John, actually. It's not on my high. Uh, it's pretty low, actually, on my maiden list. Um, but I love that it was their, I thought it was their first, first concept album, but apparently it's their first attempt at a concept album. And I the progressive elements were interesting um, that they added, you know, above what they had done on their previous record. And I believe that Bruce had more of an active role in co-writing the lyrics uh, with Steve Harris, which is also cool. Um, in contrast, I am not that much of a Queensryche fan. I don't even remember ever listening to Rage for Order. I don't think I've ever listened to this record. But I know... Uh, that Rage was a move into more progressive metal. And Jay just confirmed that uh, in his description of it uh, after their first record, uh, The Warning. So that, all that said, it comes as a very great surprise to me. Jay, you thought that everybody's going to pick Maiden. I am choosing Rage for Order. I think that Seventh Son is going to trounce this record overall on the cast and probably with our listeners. But... I really like the mix uh, of glam, of progressive metal, of uh, hard rock on Rage for Order. It's got a, a groove to it. It's got a swagger to it that I didn't expect. The solos and the melodies are great. I think that Jeff Tate shows the fuck off on this record. He's got a range of vocals that's that goes from like more aggressive than I've ever heard him. Um, but he also delivers that fucking nighttime Tate sexiness. And uh, so for me, uh, the songs on, on Rage for Order also really stick in my head a lot more than um, the Maiden record. Oh, now, part of this are, for, for listening so closely, because I, I really that, did. I listened yeah. to it a few times. And uh, I, I think part of the reason for this bit could be because this record is new to me. Right. I don't even know if I've ever listened to it. Could be a brand new jam for me that, that I've never spun. And I've, I've spun Seventh Son a hundred times, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but I have to go with my ears and my gut on this and uh, my, um, my auditory belly says Queensryche. And that's what I'm going with. Awesome. All that's, right. That's what I would hope for that people, not that you would go with that record. But I think there's something special in this Rage for a rec- Order record, and I knew I was putting it up against the Goliath, but there it is. And that's the thing that I like about this pick, Jay. Like, I never listened to it, and I was like, fuck, this is this is not even a good fucking pick. Fuck, Jay. What's he, what's he, what's he doing? What's he even doing? This is stupid. And then I listened to it, and now I completely changed my mind because I listened to it, and I really like this record. And I think that may be the best Thunderdome for me ever, personally. Awesome. Awesome. Matt, I give the here. floor to Matt. So I agree. Like this, this is a fabulous Thunderdome. And that's what I like about the Underdome, the Thunderdome. When you guys choose them, they're far more interesting than when I choose them. Um, especially when it's stuff that I'm not super exposed to. I mean, most of my maiden stuff has been retrospective. So 
an album like Seven Sun is it's probably my number three made now. I love it so much. But when it turn, when it comes to you know my my first um, Queen Trick stuff was the I want to say the Empire album. Sure. But mm-hmm. as I was pushed to look back, it was always to Operation Mind Crime, and I had maybe spun Rage for Water once. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't you know, super exposed to it. Strangely enough, in 2019, I was at this kind of, um, it was like an 80s hair metal metal festival. But Queensryche was also there, so they played live. I was totally, I mean, you, granted they have a new singer, but man, I was totally blown away by their music. So uh, they definitely opened my mind to things beyond Empire and Silo Lucidity and things of that nature. I so remember you talking back, about that. Or, yeah, it was or a good posting time. about it or whatever. Yeah. Like this album is super awesome. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I have to go with Iron Maiden, but it's not by much. I am so intrigued by by Rage for Water. The song that sticks in my head the most is uh, is it called Close to You or Closer yeah. to You? Yeah, Close to You. When you listen to it, like I literally thought I was listening to an old school ministry song, the way the drum beats start out. So to your point, Shane, the technology about the drums. And I realized because, you know, you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, so we've had time to think about it. And like those, those, some of those Rage for Order songs are in my head because I went to listen to it again the other yes. day. I was like, oh shit, that's what was in my head. Like, I really dig that song. So um, at, the, at the very least, Jay, I thank you for opening my eyes to a really phenomenal album. Awesome. Rage for Order. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. But go fuck yourself, Iron Maiden. <laughs> no, hey, it's not. It's, I'm not calling this a Sophie's choice, but I like that it was hard for for some yeah. of you so far, and I yeah. that was the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. All right, John. Uh, before I start, Matt, I will point out that the song you mentioned is actually not a Queen's song; it's a cover. So, so. <laughs> I'm going to say it's a ministry cover. No, it's not. No. All right. Uh, so I'll start off by saying, admittedly, I am not a super fan of either one of these albums. Um, I'm not a big Seven Sun fan at all. And I've never not said that. I've always been pretty strong on that. I like it, but there's something about it that just has never clicked with me in the past. Uh, but I set that aside and I wanted to give it a real fair shake because I've listened to it a ton of times, but I don't go back to it often. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the same could be said for rage forwarder. I like it, but I never really spent a lot of time with it. You know, I like Queens, right. And my initial thought was that this would be a, a killing too, because they're both legacy bands, but maiden's legacy is much more regarded obviously than Queens, right. Yeah. Cause Queens, right. Has put out a lot of, a lot of crap. Yeah. I'll be the first to say that. Um, yeah. I mean, promised land is, uh, and that's the cutoff right there. Yeah. And it's, that's back. And in that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like maiden's been putting out blast beaters, you know, for a while. I mean, there's mixed results in the last few albums too. Mm-hmm. And they had a middle period that was a little iffy, but, uh, I wanted to separate myself from all of that and treat these as if they were separate entities from, from the bands they're part of. And while I came away liking both albums a lot more, um, I still cannot get into seventh son that much. Although I, I do like songs like the evil of men do. I think that's a great song. And I came away liking the prophecy even more than I did before. I don't know what it is. I like that song a lot, uh, but Marcus on touched on something and that's, Queensryche has more earworms. It just yeah, does. It uh, really does. And it's a front loaded album and it's a back loaded album for me. Um, the, the whisper is just awesome. I think I love yep. that song. Yeah. Um, and so it's close, but I, I went with Queensryche and I was going to add that I was going with it because I was going to J this. And I figured, <laughs> why not fuck it up? I'm not letting them go out. It's you coming know, down to fucking Hannes. And you guys know what it is, and I don't. I thought John would be the only one that I'd get, honestly. And but I telling you the truth, I honestly gave both albums a fair shake. I spent a lot of time with Seven Sun, and I do like it a lot more. But for me, I think it's, and I think this probably speaks a lot to Will's opinion on this. You came in, I think, around that heavily for Maiden. If I'm not mistaken, that was your period more. Man, my period was Made in Japan. Yeah. back in 1981. So I think for me, I got to the point where I was like, I've heard this before, yeah. even though it's very innovative and it's creative for them and it's different, mm. but some of it I've heard before. And so maybe that's part of it. Maybe I hadn't heard rage before, you know, or Queensryche, but 
you know, it's close, but I went with rage for it. It's close. Uh, yeah, for sure. All right. I'm glad I can surprise you, Jay. You thought that maybe I, John I, was going to give you this. Uh, I'm well, it's not that you just surprised me, but you kind of spoke a lot of my own thoughts back to me, which I really appreciate. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I take these fucking things to heart for sure. Hell yeah. Yeah, for sure. We all do. Yeah. Well, I, I hemmed and hauled about this for about a nanosecond. Then I picked that <laughs> son. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Oh, at least you were uh, fair. I gave it a chance. No, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll have to. I will 100% admit, I've never even heard of Rage for Order. I know Operation Mind Crime because they opened up for Metallica. Mm-hmm. And I want to say I maybe had a copy of that album. And, you know, I, and I liked some of the songs on it, but it just wasn't what I was into at the time. I was into like Master of Puppets. Sure. You know, yeah. it just, you right. know. Um, and I, I've said famously many times on this this podcast that uh, Seventh Son is is probably my favorite Maiden um, album, and not because it was my my wheelhouse. Um, not to correct you, John, I will just uh, reinvent the history that you know I got in, I got into Iron Maiden in um, the third album. Uh, Number of the Beast. Uh, Number of the Beast, yes. Oh, okay. I, I thought that well, your coming of age was later, a little later on. No, Sorry. no, no, no. Like, I, I can actually document when I became a metalhead because I was 10 years old and I heard Number of the Beast and I was like, this is it. Um, but there's something about um, Seventh Son that I, it, to me, it was, and it w- was weird is um, I did learn something tonight when Jay said like it was a concept album, but it really wasn't, uh, they got lazy. Cause I always thought it was a contest album. And I, I thought it was, this is dark. Like the, the, like, you know, you have, you have number of the beasts and everything is dark, but like this all the way through is like this occult sort of darkness to it. Moon child, seven sun, you know, maybe not quite the evil that men do, but like there was, there was like, um, and you had the beginning, you had the beginning, intro and you had then the outro and it was sort of like it wrapped it all together for me anyway i love that album the synthesizers withstanding or notwithstanding whatever you say um i really like that album i've never heard rage for i did listen to it and i was sort of like i, I have to admit i was kind of like ah, i'm wasting my time like I, you know it's stated it's stated at this point without question yeah but it like it, it was just more of i've never heard of it before i listened to it i i I came in with an open mind, but that's like saying like, Hey, I'm going to put up master of puppets against, you know, yeah. some album you never heard of before. <laughs> that came out about the same year. I totally. Yeah. 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 So I mean, like, if uh, you love that, if you love seventh son, it's like one of your favorites. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard it's to put something else up against it that you've yeah. never heard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've never heard of it, but I, I listened to it and you know, it's, it's, it's all fine. Fair enough. But not even not even close for me anyway not even um, close bud so that means um, so, so far we've got two operations so it's one seven seven it's, it's three mind crimes versus two seven it's, it's going to be seven. tied yeah there's no uh, mind crimes, uh, by the two, way two, two right now okay two two uh, uh george no I, do your well, worst well actually you have to officially make your choice yeah, you, didn't. you gotta make your oh, pick, I, okay, okay. Okay, well, um, I, I really appreciate the thoughtful comments and listening on your part. Um, I, I'll i say this. John actually hit some of my – both John and Marcus sound really represented. Well, all of you guys have so far. So I'll say a couple of things. One is this. Um, I agree with John. I was an early Baden adopter, and so I honestly kind of felt like – Seventh Son was the first one where the air was coming out of the tires a little bit. I thought it was a little long-winded. I still thought it was good, but I, I – maybe John said it better, which is like, I've heard this before. And it was the first time I got a maiden record when I wasn't like super fucking excited after I listened to it, but it's good. And so take that with a grain of salt. And it's hard to describe this now though. Most, most of you are old enough to, to know this, but at the moment, at least for those of us who are like kind of in the know on metal and stuff, Queenswick was kind of the great white hope for like three records. Like it, here was this first band that came along that really sounded like a European metal band with the exception of the underground stuff. And the warning is a great example of that. That's something that comes out of the priest or maiden catalog, you know, or sort of like that. And then they took this brave step and, and 
not didn't totally change, but just added all this technology. And I also think it's a super dark record. I think it's it's almost spooky in places like London, the song London. Um, London's my, awesome, actually. My favorite song on the record, probably my favorite Queensryche song, is called Noia Regal. That's on there, um, New Religion. And then and then there's just this really thoughtful. The whole thing is about kind of bumping up against technology and yet they're kind of making it their bitch in this album. So that's kind of cool too. Screaming in the digital, I would call about call to mind chemical youth, know your regals, new religion. That's talking about, I mean, it was like, they were talking about cell phones before we got to cell phones or smartphones. Now all that stated, I also just think it's catchy as fuck. It's a, it's a total heavy metal record. I mean, it's, it's not at all like the warning. And like I said, for a while, these guys were the great white hope and, um, they kind of lost me after operation mind crime, but I would put them in the group of bands that, um, that we talk about like Mastodon and others where it's just sort of like those first four were so good, man, you know, mm, and I just wish mm-hmm, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the, the final thing I'll say about, about it is that, um, I, this was actually totally calculated by me. I honestly thought if you guys heard this record and listened to it, honestly, you'd be like, Holy fuck, this is a great record. And that was part of my motivation. Um, I didn't even say that much about the Maiden record except to say I think Infinite Dreams is a high point for Maiden. That's a great fucking song. There's a lot of really good songs on that record. That whole thing is based on the Crowley stuff and all that stuff. And to be honest with you, I'm the big seller of Chemical Wedding. Bruce accomplished in Chemical Wedding what they had set out to do in Seventh Son. So that's Bruce Dickinson's solo record. And they really did just kind of like, they got lazy and walked away from it before they finished it. Um, so I think here's this young upstart, upstart band who's kind of hitting hard and another band who's kind of dominated the field. Um, that stated, uh, Rage Forder, I, I go with. I, I think it's a lost um it's an important lost, honestly, classic to me, you know, and I'm not even that I'm not a big Queens rag salesman. You know what I mean? Like I, I get it if you don't like them, right. Whoever you are, but I think this is a special record and I honestly like it better than operation. My my crime. So, uh, I do. I think it's my favorite Queens rag record because yeah. you brought it up. I don't know if I would ever listen to it, but, uh, it's by far my favorite. Yeah. Hey, Jay, so I'll, add, I'll add one thing to what you said, Jay. I think their first three releases and, that includes the EP, our forgotten albums. Includes the EP, which, by the way, that EP, That's, I believe they recorded, and then, like, Atlantic Records was like, we'll take it. Yeah. And then The Warning was is fucking really good, too. You should listen yeah. to The Warning, Marcus. Honey, you're going to love it. It's yeah. fucking great. Oh, I've heard The Warning. I, I I listened to The Warning. I have listened to the EP. I've, I've listened to the other albums for some reason. I don't know where Rage for Order, yeah. why it got left out, but I just never really listened to it. You know, I think that uh, I started with with Queensryche because of like silent lucidity or something and went back. But for yeah. some reason, never, yeah. never got that record. But Rage for Order to me is like um, a distillation of all the best elements of Queensryche. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, the only other thing I'll say is this. I thought it was an extremely brave move that they made, and I thought it paid yeah. off. I spent it's a lot whole, different than the warning. It is. And I spent that whole summer listening to it I, when mm-hmm. it came out. I was just like, this is fucking amazing. So, yeah. yeah. George, I hand it to you. I cannot deny my infinite dreams. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say Maiden. Um, but then I will explain. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. When you said this, I was like, duh, because uh, I've harbored a hatred for Rage for Order for 30 odd years or whatever. Um, though I am a Queensryche fan. I love Operation Mind Crime and Empire's okay. Um. I had never actually listened to the entire album of Rage for Order until two days ago. I heard, uh, <clears throat> like, I think it was like a dream in infrared, or maybe it was Chemical Youth. I think that was a single. I think it was a single. And Screaming in Digital, I'd heard that. And I was like, this is fucking bullshit, whatever. And, but then when Mind Crime came out, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. But I never went back and listened to Rage for Order. It was just... Yeah stuck in my brain this album sucks and i'm not gonna like it so to be fair two days ago i i went and i listened to the whole album and it doesn't suck it's actually pretty good but it it, to it's a precursor to what 
for me, mind crime will be. It's like, okay, I can stunt to that without question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was. And I'm like, all right, I see how they get from here to here to here. I get it. And I'm like, all right, this doesn't suck in any way, shape or form. It does not. I, I admit this. Um, but I listened to this two days ago. I've been listening to seventh son for 30 years and it's one of my favorite albums by Iron Maiden. It's not, not close to being the, the, the favorite, but it is, you know, it's really up there and there's just no way that something that I listened to two day, two days ago can dethrone something like that. And I, to be fair, I'm listening to this thing and I'm going, you know, if I had given this a fair shot when it came out, things might be different, but have you noticed how, and, and I, I think uh, maybe somebody said something about like the nostalgia factor. If I go back and listen to something from the eighties that I never heard when it came out, I'm like, this is dated Ew. Yeah. but I like so much stuff from the eighties that is fucking ew to people that like, like kids these days, you know? And it's like, if, if a kid goes back, that's like, you know, 18, 20, whatever. And they go back and listen to something in the eighties and they're like, you, you know, like, I've heard this. Tears ew. for fears. Yeah. Well, no, tears for fears is a fucking rule. But um, I know. You're real. I love tears for fears. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but if you go Stop. back and listen to something like that and you've never heard it before, you're like, eh, you know, I've heard everything that came after that. There's no... You know, this is the, the, this just doesn't do anything for me. And I think that's why, George, I said it was the great white hope of that moment, because I think I can speak for probably John and myself, which is I started with Cream Strike at the EP. Like that was the first record I had. And then I got them as they came out. So mm -hmm. so by that time, then I was kind of an enthusiast. Sure. You know what I mean? And I get and, that. And, and not only that, but I was like, wow, look at this left turn they took. So. Yeah, but I get I totally, that. But you're, what you're saying makes sense, yeah. And, you know, because I'll, I'll hear stuff now, and I'm like, oh, hey, here's this band from the 80s that I'd never heard of, and if, and somebody's saying good stuff about it. Let me go back and listen to it. And I'm like, me, you know, yeah, whatever. It's okay. You know, I'd listen to it over Justin Bieber or some shit like that, but, you know, eh, it doesn't do anything for me. And I, I think it's, it's all a matter of the context of what you listen to in terms of things that are so old like this. And the direction you came at it from without yeah, question. And I, yeah. like I said, I've only ever heard the whole thing two days ago. It just can't compare to something that I've been adoring it's for decades. It, it, it's the exact same thing for me. And I went the opposite direction. Yeah. Well, obviously because you're a better man than I. <laughs> <laughs> it helps if you can and you can't, but if you can go back in time and understood what it meant at the moment too, that's the, I really can't stress that enough. Like Queensryche destroyed their legacy. They really did. And up until that moment and then on to Operation Minecraft, I mean, that's slightly with Empire, they were like this kind of like great American heavy metal band that were honestly still almost kind of underground. You had to be kind of one of the weird brush nerds to like Queensryche. Yeah. In some sense. Also, I freaking like loved Minecraft. I yeah, totally 180 on that. It's like, I was like rage for order. Ooh, this sucks. And then mind crime came out and I was like, Whoa, no, this, that was like, you know, if we'd done like a list that year, that would be my album of the year, <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Me too. I think, um, though it did come out the same year as master of puppets, if I'm not mistaken. So that's okay. Well, rough. maybe not, but I, but, um, I will say this, um, but, but, but they opened uh, that, they did that here. tour on, on justice. So and justice. That's right. Yeah. Both of those facts are true. Um, Confession: First time I had sex in high school was wearing an Operation Mind Crime shirt, <laughs> <laughs> and it did not fare well. Let's just say that it took the uh, you know, yeah, it, 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 womp, yeah, womp. it had a rough night. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I appreciate the thoughtfulness. I mean, I and and I would say, let me just say to our audience: if you've never listened to Rage for Order, I highly suggest you do as much. Mm -hmm. There's a it's a little bit of a lost metal classic yeah. that you might be glad to introduce into your life, you know? I, I, and I would say that too, like, cause people are going to listen to this. We're going to put up the poll. Chances are you're going to try to vote for maiden right away because that's what you know, but sure. give, give rage for order a lesson. Cause I did, I'm a huge maiden fan. I never listened to rage for order and it's my pick and we're tied three, three. And it's really interesting because Hannes gets to do the tiebreaker and uh, Matt, John and I know, but we're not telling you. The what Hannes picked. All right, here we are, end of the episode. Gentlemen, pick your albums of the episode. 
Indeed. Mark us on. Me first. Yeah, I have to go. I mean, a lot of good records. I feel like we've talked a lot about a lot of records on this episode, but uh, I'm going to go, as I usually do, with a new record, and it's Unrequited, Beautiful Ghosts. Um, I think Unrequited is one of my favorite bands now. I think the last record um, was amazing, and it was very high on my year-end list. So Beautiful Ghosts uh, was one of my most anticipated releases of 2021. Um, we usually do an episode where we talk about uh, most anticipated. We didn't this year. Uh, it would have been on there. It exceeded all my expectations. I think it delivers another phenomenal collection of songs without sounding like the last record. And it, it scales back that uh, the more windswept epic qualities of Empathica um, in favor of a more personal, uh, emotional soundscape. And to me, the best metal is the metal that makes me feel something. And I feel all the things listening to Beautiful Ghosts. So um, it's my album of the episode and it's going to be my album of August. So John, mark it down. I, that's an exclusive. It's uh, <laughs> there's no way anything's going to top a scoop this one. We didn't see that coming. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Locked. Roy. Matt. I'm in a dead tie. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> Rainbow rising. Oh, nice. And Mastodon's Leviathan. Whoa. It may not have been mentioned, but I. Just throwing it out there there anyway. I feel like (laughs) you mentioned it at some point. (laughs) Or somebody did. Possibly. You mentioned it just so it would be in there. Pick or bad, or are you just telling us about your tie? It's just my tie. You gotta make a pick, dude. I see a I see a rainbow rising, so I'll fine, I'll go with that. But pass it on to Lyoth. Yeah, you gotta go with Dio because we talk so much about Dio, I think. All right. Yeah, and a fine record, by the way. Oof, that's a good record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Run with the wolves. Yeah. Terrible woman. Terrible woman. So good. So John. So I actually picked three albums from my album of the month, but there's a reason. <laughs> Just hear me out. Uh, okay. but I only take a second. I uh, picked four. Not, I took 27. Uh, <laughs> I picked these three, and I didn't mean to single this person out, but uh, he stood out the most for me, unfortunately, in our memoriam, and that was Eric Wagner. And I was going to suggest, if you don't know much about Trouble, to check out their first three albums. But I decided just now to go with one, and that is the second album, not the first, because everyone knows the first album. Mm. But I don't think enough people have listened to the second album, which is just called The Skull. And it's an outstanding Doom album. It's even, I think, doomier than the first album. So if you don't know much about them, and you heard us talking about him and his impact on early Doom, when it became a real genre, not just sabbath and pentagram um i would check out the album the skull from trouble okay that's my album of the month right or episode which is also for the month i guess because we only do this once a month i feel like i feel like i've been listening to so much dio constantly because it's one of those things that my kids love listening to i i just feel like i can just say dio every episode but um i i um my album in the episode is uh, there's a I, I mentioned it earlier the band from um, Perth Australia Ashen huh? and they they have an EP out called Godless Oath it's on an album but it's pretty short but man it's it's just great straightforward death metal um, a little mel- melodic in some places but Ashen Godless Oath check it out it's it's really great right on cool. all right well I'm gonna do one with an honorable mention. Um, my uh, my album in the episode is gonna be Carcass. This I'm super excited about this record, and um, I'm surprised and Matt just, didn't go with that. It's the rainbow. I, I yeah, I know. It. You feel the. It has a lot, it has taste a lot the rainbow, man. He'll yeah, have been more, a lot of skittles. More <laughs> options to honor. <laughs> He'll have more more chances to honor that record as the year gets older. Uh, I, the, I, um, I'll pick Dio over Carcass any day. You week. should be playing my cut, where as I said, another. <laughs> Yeah, what are you it. doing? That's right. You're not on it, dude. I don't have it up. Oh, I can't get it up. And then uh, my uh, my honorable mention was um, 
even though you guys all spent like the last week with it, I actually spent like the last three weeks with it, I think, because it was the thing that prompted me to even remember it. I kind of put it on recently. And what I mean to say is it was awfully fun to walk in the shadows again with Rage for Order. So that's my runner up mm-hmm. or honorable nice. mention. Um, really a, a kind of a, you know, important record from my young high school, junior mm-hmm. high days. So. Uh, it would have been yeah. my honorable mention as well, Jay, because uh, you know, it's definitely a record that I never would have spun if not for Thunderdome. So Thunderdome. really appreciate that. Awesome. And Jorge. All right. Um, not no surprises here. I am going to go with Carcass. Right now. Mm. Cool. Yeah. I didn't uh, think you were as high on it, George, but uh, it's well, compared to, to everything else, I mean. It's not my um, album of the month because it doesn't come right. out this month. Right, right, right. And so maybe I'm tipping a nod to this because I'm tipping another nod the other way for, oh, uh, for uh, August. So. But also, let's just see if this one worms its way into your little vegetable heart there as time goes on. Not that you have, <laughs> not that you don't like it already, but let's just see where it ends. Well, I'm up sure it'll be a lister you know? for sure. Yeah, yeah. It also yeah. might just sneak up on you, you know. Yep. And make it a, oh, there's, make there's a beast. Hard. Matt's got a beast. Beast. I can hear him around some. upstairs because he needs to go outside. So, oh, well, we're getting ready to. Yeah, I know, I know that he's feeling. About done. Mm-hmm. Hey, before we sign off, George, do you want me to give Honest's information since we did not ask him for that? Certainly. Yeah. Do it. Just so when you, after the interview, if you want to find Honest, he's on Facebook as Honest Grossman or Mordor Sounds. That's Mordor from. You know, that little Lord of the Rings thing. And you can I've find him on that. Bandcamp at Honda's. Yeah. Honest Grossman at Bandcamp.com. All right. So, which I didn't think would be that hard to figure out. But in case somebody doesn't know. Honest. Yeah, it was awesome. All right. Well, we are done here, but you've got more listening to do. So here is Honest. So today we are joined by someone who needs no introduction. The chances are that you're pretty familiar with our guest or any of the projects or bands he's been associated with over the years. But just give you a short list. This is not complete. I'll just name a few bands. Alkaloid, Blotted Science, Counter World Experience, Dark Fortress. I said it right this time. Eternity's End exists. The Fractured Dimension, Gamora, Howling Sycamore, Moral Collapse. All right, give me a second here. Christian Munzner, I hope I said that correctly, Necrophagist, Obscura, Panzer Ballet, and Triptychon. And I should also mention he's released four solo albums. We are, of course, talking about Hannes Grossman. Hannes, thank you for joining us today on the Metalheads Podcast. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. That's awesome. Uh, So I have two important questions to ask you right away. Uh, and this is kind of funny because we just talked about having humor. Um, my first question is, can you tell us which albums or projects you're not associated with in 2021? And do you ever rest because you are one busy person? Um, well, um, I don't <laughs> pay to attention to other people's releases because, you know, it's uh, just a waste of time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, yeah, I, I rest. Well, actually, I am i don't feel like I'm working that much. I mean, I know I do a lot of, especially session recordings, and um, the past couple of years, a lot of production work and mixing. But, um, and, and sometimes both, um, where I play drums and then I mix the album or something like that. And, yeah. Um, yeah. The work is the, good, the, right? Keep it busy is good. good. Yeah. Work is good, and if if I'm, I'm working on, sometimes it's it's exhausting, but um, I don't know. It's it's doesn't feel like like really hard work sometimes. It, it's fun. I'm, I like I enjoy yeah. doing what it. Well, you, you enjoy, know, enjoy doing things. it. So it's, well, setting that joke aside, uh, seeing as you are busy, you have a new solo album that came out this year, actually on June first, called "To Where the Light Retreats." Do you, uh, for any of our listeners who may not be familiar, can you tell us about the album, uh, how you went about just going and doing this? This is your fourth solo album. Yeah, well, um, the reason I do, you know, albums under my own name is just I couldn't come up with, uh, you know, some band name. <laughs> because I can tell you many bands out there are just 
you know, one or two people with hired guns. Um, and you would not even, you know, you would be surprised how many of them it is, like legally I'm talking about. And um, yes, for so, you know, and I thought like, okay, I got all these songs and I got to release it. And then what I'm going to promote, because with a band, you know, from a business perspective, and this is this perspective I really don't like that much. Uh, but I mean, there's no way around it. You have to you do some marketing at least to some extent and uh, try to sell your music or um, get people interested. Um, and then I thought, like, why promote um, some band name that does where the band doesn't exist anyway? So um, it's no point. I can't just put my name on on it like i don't know devon townsend or something mm -hmm. like that i mean no comparison to him but uh still um but yeah it's unusual for a, a drummer to do that but i thought well then i have to be the first metal drummer with a steady solo project and and the solo project came across because back then i was in obscura and i wrote a lot of songs for obscura and there was talk within the band that maybe we should do it more together as a band. And, um, and then I thought, okay, I wrote so many songs, let's just get them out of the way. And I'm going to release those independently on my own. And then we can start from scratch. Never happened, but, you know, still. Um, <laughs> right. Still, that was the main idea. And I basically, the story is whenever I got like some kind of um, techie death metal ideas um, that are somehow well not similar but from related to that kind of thing we did back then in obscura um or like the technical death metal side of things then i'm releasing that under my name and it is really more like a, a fun project to just write songs and um don't not not compromising them too much or you know go with the right. first idea or the first thing um, right. and let that be it. Um, in Alkaloid, where I also write music, we collaborate a lot more and um, also don't really write lyrics there. And um, it's more experimental. That's actually um, ironic, but um, in my solo project, I'm less experimental than in my one of my main bands. So um, usually it's the other way around, but... Um, this is just um, a fun outlet for me to to write songs and um, produce them um, and keep that um, that thing going. I, you know, in the future there might be some different directions here and there, but I I don't know yet. It, everything could be possible, but in in general, it's like me releasing music that could have been released by a band under right. a band name and as a band project but with people i regularly um work together and um i just release it on my own and right. um, thus i have 100 percent um uh, control over the project right so yeah. you can kind of answer this question that i was going to ask you know how do you know what something's going to be an alkaloid album what's going to be a solo mm -hmm. album but it seems like you just wrote everything and it wasn't collaborative and that's why it went to a solo record is that right yeah uh, it's one one aspect. The other one is it's it's really hard to explain. Sometimes it's it's more like in my head. I can um, I write something and then maybe I finish a song even, and I think like ah, oh, this is an alkaloid song. Right. Um, and to me, that's most of the time pretty clear. It might not be so obvious to other to other people. So um, as there oh. are some similarities, but. Um, to me, it's quite obvious, but it's right. really hard. Nothing right. I can really explain. So do you, um, you like you write a song and then when you finish it or you've got it some kind of a stage where you know where it's going to be then you choose which album it's going to go to or where? What yeah, but I know that pretty much early on. You do? That's okay. true. <clears throat> yeah, I would that's say it, so. That's interesting because I made that com I'm sorry. I made that comment uh, earlier this year uh, when your album came out. I said, I got to tell you, it sounds distinctly like your solo stuff, but there's a couple songs. I was like, man, had I heard that without knowing it was under your name, I would have thought it might have been Alkaloid just because there's some similar things that I noticed on yeah. the new album that you might have noticed on the last album released by Alkaloid. Just, I thought this new album 
was a little, not a departure, but it wasn't as straightforward as the previous one. I thought you did a few things on this new one that were, I don't know, maybe experimental, but maybe you gave yourself a little more room to expand, to do things. Um, yeah. Did, yeah, maybe, that... yeah. And yeah. I think um, I think this will happen in the future even more um, with stuff. Actually, to be honest, I wrote some material for the next record already, and right. um, it's going to take a little different turn, um, maybe. Oh, that's, no, that's, that's This that's one, great. I would say, is less... Um, it's it's not as fast as the previous albums. Previous albums had a lot of blast speed and very technical riffs, and this is a little more melodic and riff heavy riff oriented, I would say. Oh. Um, it really depend also depends in which well with whom I play, for instance. On the last album, I when I recorded I recorded the album the previous album Epiphania. I recorded that in 2017, and it took some time to finish it. And then it became 2019 when I released it, actually. But um, I recorded the drums in 2017, and I finished the songwriting back then. And uh, that was when I played drums for Hate Eternal. And, um, of course, that had a, some impact on some of the songs being much faster than what I did before that. And, um, um, and I would say, like... Um, what I'm working on in general and, you know, um, with whom I play, this um, has a larger influence on me as a musician and a writer than the albums I listen to. Of course, um, you know, the albums, especially the albums you listen to when you were younger, kind of shape your mm, general direction. Right. But I really think the biggest influence is the people you play with. Huh. Because you play with them every day or, you know, mm -hmm. every week or there's a different connection there and you in influence yourself on another level. And that cuts way deeper than just listening right. to records, even if it's records you listen to in your formative years when you were younger. Those might have a really big effect, but I think um, as, maybe that's a drummer thing as well. But as a drummer, you have to interact and you have to relate. And it's a very different instrument. On mm -hmm. guitars, most of the time you write riffs or you write parts and you play them exactly like that. As a drummer, sometimes not. Sometimes you just flow flow with the, with the song, with the beat. You can improvise or do something as long as the key elements are there. And um, a much more, like, coming from jazz music, a much more open approach to that instrument in general, I think. And that's also the way of thinking as you know as a writer you you take more in your the input of that other people bring in you take more of that in um if you want it or not like subconsciously or consciously right but right. it's there yeah that listening to you it makes me think of another drummer that actually writes a lot of music himself uh and he's in more the fusion world that's virgil donati a lot yeah. of his projects, you know, he, he like he wrote a lot of the music for Planet X. You yeah, know, with, I think uh, most of it. Yeah. And so people say, oh, he's just a drummer. No, he's actually really involved. And you can hear it in the way that the songs are constructed because it's it's built kind of around the way he plays. Yeah. Um, so because yeah. uh, as, as I'm listening, you say this, I'm thinking I can only think of one other drummer. I know that that's that involved in the whole process. And that would be him. Yeah. So. Uh, so. Well, Go ahead, Marcus. Well, uh, well, I'm a big fan of the sound, the engineering on your new album, Hannes. Can you can you talk Thank a little you. bit about that? Like, was there anything new or important uh, in the production that that helped really shape the the new record? Mm, good question. Um, actually, with my own material, I'm always having troubles somehow because you have this very distinct picture in your head how it's going to sound. Right. And then I also have references that I really, really like, different ones, different albums. And it might not even be albums that I, where I'm a big fan of the band or the music, but the sound is great, the production is great. Um, and that's something that in my head, and if I can't get it exactly right, then I'm like, ah, I don't know. But at a certain point, I'm... It, I can see that um, 
this distinct version I had in my head, um, it's maybe not in the cards this time. And then I accept what's been recorded because that's the only thing what, that you can do because your recordings shape your your mixing or your sound. Right. That's the source. And um, good question, actually. I don't I don't really know. It's a pretty like the the process is always the same kind. And mm-hmm. I know my gear, but. Um, also, the composition and the arrangement and uh, how it's been played it really shapes the sound of the album on any album. And it really brings it in a different direction because um, not only the equipment, also like how the guitarist moves his pick or something like that affects the way I tune the guitar amp or something like that. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um well, it sounds great. <laughs> it's like, it's not, that's great. That's yeah. great. Uh, I'm happy about that. Um, it's nothing out of the ordinary. I chose, uh, like, also like on Epiphenia, I chose um, not to master it myself um, because that's uh, like another step, like finalizing the thing. I, right. I'd rather give it to an engineer um, who's more objective because I'm not objective at all. I wrote the music and then... In the mixing process, you're um, you've lost um, at a certain point more or less any objectivity, and then I start comparing it. Um, like, what's my first impression with fresh ears um, in comparison to that other record that I like, and so on. And then, and when I come to a point where I'm like, yeah, sounds different, but not worse, mm-hmm. then I know I'm <laughs> on the right track, you know? Right. Yeah. Is do you uh do you ever have fights with yourself, Hannes, the engineer, producer versus Hannes, the musician? I mean, do you ever get to the point where you're like, well, I just played this, but I want it to sound like this, and you start to kind of battle with that, and then you need to have that second set of ears in there? Mm, no, I don't think so. Um, I'd say once I sit into that uh, in the in the monitor room, like what what do you call it, control room? Control room, yeah. Um, once I sit in there, like I have the producer hat on, and that's like a completely different person. Um, yeah, because I know it's not easy for some musicians to do that. It's it, you really have to to be disciplined in how you approach it. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Then I don't matter. Uh, then I treat the drum lines like it's drum lines by somebody else. Huh. Hmm. Like hey, you sit here. Who played this? Shit? This is terrible. <laughs> for instance, it might happen that I'm really proud on a drum fill or something, and then when I'm Mixing, I'm saying hmm, it's not 100 yeah. percent working. Now I might back in there and play it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, if I can play it again, well then yes. But um, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't uh, make start mixing an album if I wasn't happy with the performance right. in the first place. Of course. So, but then I think like uh, I think I have to cut it out. That's too much. And then I'm thinking like a producer, not like a songwriter. I, you know, this uh, this phrase, "kill your darlings." I'm really good at that. <laughs> um, I do that relentlessly. Um, I throw out riffs all the time if if I think it's too much, and my music is busy anyways. So you really have to balance it out and n- not overload it with a lot of riffs and notes that are not necessary to get the message across. And um, yeah, if you really like a riff and it has to leave the song, then out of out, oh, yeah, get out. And, um, right it's not like i have to to waste the uh the idea i have um a folder on my computer called basement that's where all these ideas that have to go they go there right the cutting floor basically yeah yeah sometimes i go through my basement and say hmm right yeah you can recycle that stuff right well why not i mean there's no reason to get rid of it if you can still use it right exactly yeah. But you don't have to use it. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of, especially young songwriters, they think they have to use everything they come up with, but you don't. That might be a big revelation to some people. That uh, is sometimes if you take something out, the song works better as a oh, whole. Yeah. And when you take the idea for something else, then boom, another song. So yeah. that's why I'm also quick with recording that's... and writing. It's really and, interesting because I'm a writer. I write comic books, and it's yeah. very much like that too. Because you have an idea of what it's going to be like in your head, how the story is going to go, but you might have too much in it. You got to cut it back sometimes, and then it's just a lot more effective. Yeah, it is. It is. I think that's um, universal for any kind of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I read that once in a uh, 
Stephen King wrote a book on how he writes, and mm-hmm. that's exactly what he says. Like he finishes it and then he cuts twenty percent. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's what's gets brilliant. it down to eight hundred pages. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's still eight hundred pages, but you know. Yeah. My wife always um, says that he needs an editor. I'm like, he's Stephen King. He can do whatever yeah. whatever he wants. I'm like, people's gonna buy his book. He doesn't need an editor. Uh, oh, but he admits yeah. that he he uses one because he 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 sometimes can go off the rails himself. He said, so. "Yeah." <laughs> no, I've, I've experienced as a designer, um, you know, like say I'm going to make a logo, like I have to do so many versions of it. I have to this get stuff out of my system before I start to get to the stuff that I really like. And I, I feel I would imagine that sometimes as a songwriter, you just have to get those riffs out of your system until yeah. you know the ones that. And it's probably not everyone you have to get out of your system, but it gets you to a point where you know, you're, you're enjoying more what's coming out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes idea will stick a couple of years until mm-hmm. I f- find a, f- a match. Right. So, yeah, but, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you yeah. don't have to release everything. Um, um, I have a lot of spare material that I'm probably never going to use because it's not really that great. <laughs> <laughs> Unless... Unless I find like uh, a, a switch, I don't know how to call it, like a game changer, where I'm like, oh, this idea now I now I see where it's going. Um, sometimes you just don't see it. Um, right. Sometimes other people might see it. You can. That's ex- actually with uh, with Alkaloid, we got a song Cthulhu, and I had this opening riff, and um, I didn't know what to do with it. I thought like it's a cool riff, but no idea. It's just sounds like a morbid angel ripoff. So I don't want to do a just a morbid angel ripoff, but I couldn't come up with anything. I gave it to our singer Flo, Flo and he came up with the rest of the song. So it worked out great. Sometimes wow. other people have access to to that. Right, so the, that's, that's the benefit of the collaborations. Yeah. All it takes is a riff, and so, that's sometimes all it takes. It's you know, it's not rocket science. It's really even though the music is, is complicated, but in general, I would say it's it's rather easy. Right. It could That's be a funny. good, good um, uh, biography title. All it takes is a riff. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, just a quick sidebar. That's funny because uh, anyone who's a fan of Van Halen knows those first five, six albums, you know, when it was when the David Lee Roth era, there's riffs used from all throughout the early 70s on all six albums. Yep. He never yeah. threw anything away. He used everything. He it eventually just got back to it at some point. So uh, it pays to save. And then you hear about these bands that, oh, we lost a whole drive full of music. We don't know what we're going to do. It's like, man, who knows what, what gems could have been in there, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so yeah, getting back to... We don't remember a single thing. Like, <laughs> we lost the hard drive and now we're lost. <laughs> we have Didn't to dissolve that... the band. We Didn't lost that the hard drive. I that mean, happened yeah. to Kurt Hammett, didn't he? Didn't he lose his phone with like a thousand riffs or something? He claimed. I think so yeah. Yeah. Probably, um, probably for the good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would agree one hundred percent. We're we're on the same page with you. I heard Saint Anger. I have one thing to say: my lifestyle determines my death style. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Worst lyrics ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. But I have to say, I really like, I mean, of course, you know, we're joking, we're just joking around. I, I, right. You know, when I was 15, I love, just, I love Metallica and uh, especially Kirk Hammett's uh, solo. Still, I, I still think he gets way too much um, criticism by people. I mean, mm-hmm. solos are well composed. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I have no problems just trashing Lars's snare sound. It, it bothers me. It's bothered me since day one, and I'm okay with that. So, um, yeah, but Lars is a fair target. I think uh, you can trash him anytime. It doesn't matter. Yeah, he, well, he <laughs> invites it himself <laughs> too half the time. Kirk, maybe he doesn't get get the credit. He, yeah. Well, Lars it, invites but, it. He brings it on yeah. himself most of the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I still believe if Cliff Burton was still in a band that half of the shit that went on would have never happened, but maybe it's neither here nor there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Hey, real quick. I wanted to ask this. I think you sort of answered it. The new album, I was going to ask you this based on Aprofenia when it came out, but you sort of answered that that was already written 
and recorded your drum parts back in 2017. I was going to ask if the new album was a, a COVID album, meaning you had to do something you were busy, or is this was that just a natural flow? You were just moving on to the next album. No, no, it's regular yeah. album. Moving on, yeah. okay? Because next you, album. That that's interesting because a lot of bands, you know, they they all of a sudden found the time to record. You were just moving along and keeping going. That's that's a good thing, I guess, because you got constant. You, it's it does make me think of Devin Towns, like you said earlier, because he's constantly working and always doing different things. You know, yeah, so. well, I don't know. I think it's it depends um, how you work in general, but. Um, that's the key you work we have you have to work on it if there's also this phrase where you wait around for inspiration i mean that's amateur amateurs do that in my yeah. opinion like you're waiting around you're waiting around like if you have ideas and I, I, I know it depends on on the music too and and the way you write some might be consensually uh, con, conceptually very different from what i do um if you have ideas you have to work on them and work them out and something will come out of it if it's uh, when it's music that's mainly based on a certain feel that might be different then you have to be in the right mindset for doing that but i mean my music is pretty much um how do you say um i wouldn't say intellectual but um it's pretty you know, complicated yeah, complicated, but also I write down everything I, I I do in in notes and stuff like that. And it's it's um, so yeah, I wrote one one song from the last album on the plane to India um, because I got bored and I had an idea and I worked on it on the computer. <laughs> Works for me, you know. Yeah. And um, you have to find a method. Um, and then then it doesn't really bother me if I'm in the right mood. Or I can just block out the rest of the world, in this case, an airplane, and just write on a computer because that's what, what you know, novelists do as well. They sit down in a room and write. Yeah. Some of them, they have to get in a certain field. I get, I get that, but I don't. So I'm get, I guess I'm lucky. So. Right. You're just inspired to do stuff all the time. That's true. Like some people have to be in the right moment or right headspace to do things. And then other people just, it just flows constantly. I'm kind of like that too. I'm always getting ideas and writing stuff down. Uh, well, one of the things I want to ask about your uh, soul album is that your soul albums have really striking covers to me. So I was wondering how you go about selecting or commissioning art that reflects your musical vision, because it's something you're creating. So you need something on the cover that really kind of reflects what you're doing on the album. Mm, well, I have to say for all of, of my music, there's a general thing. Um, I know pretty much what I do not like. <laughs> and Saint anger. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I think there's, yeah, uh, don't let's not get into this topic. <laughs> Maybe <Okay>. later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, yeah, I would say um, when I have a strong feel or need to write music, then it's something I like. I can see your records behind you, uh, John. Oh yeah, Look, looks great. Um, some I have not that many CDs, but. Um, I'm, I'm a probably a little older than you, so I might have collected a few more over the years. Uh, but then I uh, search through my collection and I find nothing that I want to listen to right now. I happens That's all the thing. time to me. Then all I the think I should write something myself that I want to listen to. Um, and yeah, and it's more an exclusive approach. Like, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. It's like when you, yeah, I don't know. You have a special recipe and that's what you have to cook. And with the cover artwork, I don't like animation stuff too much. I, depends on the animation stuff, but a lot of uh, very animated metal covers these days, cover artworks, they are, mm, I would say, uh, uh, what did Lars say? They kind of stark. Um, <laughs> no, what was the, yeah. <laughs> no, they all look the same to me. It's it's really boring. Um, no, and also the themes are really I don't know, not interesting to me. And I think like I like uh, either painting or drawing or photography, and then 
most of the time it's something like that. And mm -hmm. with this new album, um, uh, Kalen did the uh, Kalen Stockermans did the uh, artwork, and uh, he paints the stuff. And uh, maybe he enhances it some with uh, graphical visions, but that's fine. But it's it looks more handmade than this typical artwork out of the can um, that I don't like too much. But I mean, right. it's a matter of taste. So um, I I explained to him, hey, this album. Planets, mountains, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> he nailed it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. it it's not very intellectual, but I thought like when I'm listening to this music, I see blue mountains and a little bit of space. Yeah. Right, right. I, do something yeah. with that and mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I like Yeager, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. always is good. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because it's a very different kind of a cover than the last cover. Mm -hmm. for your solo album you know that's what i yes. like about it like you don't have like a set style you know each one kind of reflects what's going on in the music and you're using different media to showcase that i like that yeah the first two albums were done by the same artist milan from switzerland um yeah he's great he's uh also yeah this comic book style mm -hmm. i like that a lot and um those are kind of well similar i would say but they have a resemblance to it Mm -hmm. But then for the third, I said, like, I have to do something different because I don't know. I know for corporate branding things, um, it might be better to stick with the same artists on the same kind of thing. So, but I don't know. I, if I was Iron Maiden, I would have killed Eddie on, I don't know, peace of mind. <laughs> Yeah. So maybe it's a very good thing I'm not in Iron Maid. So. Well, technically he was dead on Power Slave, so oh, yeah, <laughs> they, they resurrected him. So yeah, <laughs> so uh, well, but um, yeah, and so I was with Apophenia. It was done by the same cover artist who did the Alkaloid stuff, and I love his work. He does great photography, and this picture he had like I don't know for years on his homepage, like in his in his, I don't know, how do you say, uh, like, his yeah. website? Well, portfolio? Yeah, on his website, you can, you can scroll through his, like, his portfolio, oh, right. yes, portfolio, yeah. <laughs> portfolio, yeah, yeah, exactly the word I was looking for. And um, it always, I don't know, when I looked through it, this uh, picture, I was like, like, yeah, this looks great. But the colors, and it's very reduced. I like, I also like reduced stuff that ha doesn't have a lot of um, things in it and the clear, um, how do you say, center and clear composition. And so, um, uh, and that's definitely the case. The lighting looks great. And yeah, I put it on the cover. That was, um, yeah, that apparently I didn't really, because um, somebody else is doing the promotion, of course. I was told there was like one guy completely appalled by that cover artwork really? he didn't want he didn't want to do to review the album and because of the cover art because oh. of the cover artwork like i don't know and i thought like great of course. <laughs> so, of course. <laughs> if you're offended it's mm -hmm. perfect i mean it's um <laughs> i mean what do you see it's like a skunk alien woman naked kind of ish um and I thought that's also what I liked about it. It looks very, fa it like it doesn't look very. Um, I don't know. It kind of look. It, it could be interpreted as feminist, so in some weird ass way. So, you know, and that might offend some people. I like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I, I loved it. I thought it was great, and it just looks so different mm -hmm. than well, what you normally yeah. see. I think that's the point, Marcus. I mean, you want album covers that stand out, so you always remember them. And that they yeah. don't kind of get lost when you're looking at the catalog of, a, of an artist that you're like, oh, I can like colors, I think, sometimes really set that apart a lot. Uh, yeah. Like if you ever go see Opeth, there's Mike always jokes when they play something off of Still Life. He says this is from the Red Album. Well, that's yeah. because it stands out from everything they've done, even though it's Travis Smith on all the album covers. And they mm -hmm. sort of kind of blend, like you were saying, a little bit because he follows a theme, but it stands out. You know immediately what he's talking about. So I think that's yeah. the same for your cover. It would it, those the last two would immediately stand out. Uh, yeah. Without really... I have to say, my favorite cover artworks are 
even though it's not my favorite band or something, but the cover art works are like phenomenal. It's like obviously Pink Floyd uh, with uh, like Wish You Were Here, for instance. I think that is a brilliant cover artwork. Oh, um, when I was the, uh, last, like that. the last time I was in London, uh, no, second time I was in London, we drove right by the, the, uh, the factory. And the first oh. thing I said was, where's the pig? I immediately What's thought the- of that, you know? So yes, it, it does yeah. stand out. You remember them. Yeah, I think that's that's really art. And I think that's brilliant. And it's photography or manipulated photography in some case. But yeah, that's really, for me, that's what, what catches my attention. And yeah. so I want that as well. And then there's like this, more typical um, heavy metal covers like, I don't know, the section Storm of the Light Spain, for instance. Um, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, that cover, but I still like it a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, we I all have our always, favorites, so no matter what they like are. That, you know? Yeah. Yeah, fantasy and death. I mean, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we dig that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. What, uh, like, Anything got... Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? I mean, yeah. Wait, uh, guys, help me out. What uh, what was um, uh, your friend that was on Marcus on? What was it? Uh, I'll just throw on a few stall heads on the cover. Luke, when he was oh there. yeah, oh Luke, Luke Orm. Orm, yeah, Luke yeah. Orm, the cover artist, right? Yeah. yeah, I figure I'll just throw like a thousand skull heads, and this will be a cool cover or something to that effect. And <laughs> skull it's man, he said skull, skull man. man. He's like, I just if I can't think of anything, I just put skull man on a cover. Yeah, I see a skull man, like, with skull man. Yeah, I'm like, well, I'll check it out. There's a skull on the cover. Why wouldn't I check that out? You know, so. That's good. Yeah. Hey, so uh, we've talked about uh, on the new album and, and for a lot of the stuff you've worked on, you have a similar group of musicians that you've been working with going back years. Uh, and they've all been in various forms or the bands that you've worked with. But I'm curious about some of the, and I'm not, I don't mean to say it, some of the names that kind of stand out from other bands that you've had that are not affiliated with Obscura or Alkaloid. You've had guys like Jeff Loomis, Ron Jarzombic, you know, Pierce Nielsen, Eric Batan, Marty Freeman. How did you go about getting some of them to, to guest on your albums? Because those are some, some names that carry some weight behind them for the projects and the bands that they've been involved with over the years. Yeah, and I'm sometimes still um, surprised they want to play on my stuff. Uh, but yeah, I've, well, um, most of the time um, when I have, let's say, a guest musician, most of the time it's um, guitar players because I love guitar solos. And um, then I write something and I have riff and I th- I'm, I'm thinking like, yeah, that's that's the guitar solo section. And then sometimes I have a guitarist in mind, oh, that could work. That would work perfectly. And then like with uh, Loomis uh, for the first time, he played on my first solo record. And I thought like that riff I came up with as a solo part kind of reminds me a little bit of Nevermore. Um, maybe not, but me, I, I thought like, well, I got a little Nevermore vibe in there because I like them a lot. Oh, we love and Nevermore. I love, love Nevermore. Yeah. I love uh, Jeff Loomis' writing and his playing. And I, I still think uh, he should write more in Arch Enemy. But let's not go there. <laughs> I'll take a solo well, album. Yeah, I'll be happy with yeah. that from him. Yeah, but I mean, it's such a waste of talent. You don't, I mean, they have their style, of course. Of course. But, um, don't you want those? heavy ass riffs in your music why not i mean you're a metal band Come yeah. on. And, and he rep- and he reproduces on stage too i mean i've seen him play so many times he's he's amazing yeah. he's great yeah and he has such a distinct way of playing i thought oh, i can if i can get that on that song that would nail it yeah uh, and well he played on it he nailed it so exactly predicted it um and uh, you know with, with some of these players then i also sometimes i you know, Rutan and, and Ron Charlesenbeck, I played with them in Blooded Science and Hate Eternal. So we worked before, uh, we worked together before and I know these guys and I I love these players. And um, of course, if I get the chance to have them on, on my album, I just put it out there and ask, hey, next album, 
got some solo parts. You want to play a solo. <laughs> and then um, with that in mind, I kind of construct the solo part into something that I think they could work with. Um, so I really write for, for, the, for the guy who plays solos. Um, I don't want just to put names on my album. I really think like uh, this song, yes, this requires... Hmm. It's, it's with, with that... Um, song Marty Friedman plays on it. It's it's a very repetitive song. It's the same riff over and over again in various forms. And for that solo section, I thought like, okay, I like the song, but if I want to get that song on the next level, I have to bring in like, uh, you know, another uh, guitar player from another level. You know, right. And of course, I have a variety of guitar players playing on my album who are next level. But then I thought, yeah, and somehow um, uh, uh, Danny and Chris, the guitar players of Alkaloid, who play on my stuff constantly, um, they're friends with Marty Friedman and we made a um, we made contact and he agreed to play on it. And I was like completely blown away because um He's one of my all-time favorite guitar players. Um, and yeah, uh, and I, also he nailed it. Like it's, it's yeah. It's, that's cool um, how you hear the, the sound and then you, you want to try to find the, the guitarist that's going to be able to bring that. Like you have somebody in mind for that solo specifically. Yeah. Most of the time I do, yes. It's, it's not, not name dropping. Sometimes right. I have... I have the feeling like a lot of guest appearances are, yeah. No, it's musically motivated is what you're saying. Yeah. Like you're, yeah. You want the, the perfect player for that song, not just because yeah. you want the name. That's cool. It right. Start, yeah. starts with the music, not, not the yeah. person. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but exactly. let's be honest. It's not like Ron Jarzombek is a name drop. It is if you're a big metalhead and you know what he's been involved with. But most people who listen on yeah, yeah. average metalheads like, who's that? And you'd be like, I'm just going to say one word. It's technically two, but they put it to one watchtower. How do you not know that? You know, how do you not know (laughs) blotted science or any, I mean, he's an insane player. And I, I, and just, I, when I saw that, I was like, Oh, I have to go back. Then I didn't realize that you did that terrestrial exiled single, like way back when. So how, how did you get hooked up with him? Because he's, he he works, but he doesn't put out a lot of stuff. He hasn't for a while. Um, through Necrophages, actually, he came out to a show because he likes Necrophages a lot. Actually, that's how I got involved with Loomis as well. Oh, that's great. We hmm. met at a, uh, at a festival and um, said, I, uh, I really admire your work. Uh, and he said, like, who are you? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, said, I'm here with uh, Obscura and uh, we're playing on the festival. I said, wait a minute, you're played in Necrophages. And, oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. I, I mean... So um, that, um, yeah, I mean, that's, of course, uh, I mean, that's uh, uh, kind of, well, I wouldn't say famous, but, yeah, well-known band. And that's, of course, opens a lot of doors yeah. to some people because, you know, well, with guest appearances, sometimes you don't know, are these guys, like, on it? Is it serious? It's, is my contribution the only good thing that will end up on the album? And then you consider like am i really doing this and um yeah and i think um when they hear like uh he drummer of necrophagist and obscura and stuff like that they know oh he's not a hack you know what he's doing and right we'll take it seriously listen to it and um yeah and that, you know I had, cool. I, I had a good laugh about that because here i'm thinking of his brother who is a fabulous drummer as well, Bobby Joe Zombek. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, that's really funny. I, I almost wanted to joke. So why did he take you instead of his brother? But obviously I know that his uh, Bobby's constantly busy. He's always working all the time. But I just found that really funny because they don't seem to play together that much, even though they're both incredible musicians. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, a lot of work too. Um, and they're going also in different directions. I think Bobby... Who does he play with? Uh, Fate's well, he's Warning? been with right. Fate's Warning for a long time, but he's also Sebastian Bach's like longtime Sebastian. drummer, <laughs> which is really funny because you think you see him in Fate's Warning, and he does Arch Matheos also. 
he yeah. does all yeah. his great stuff there. And then he, then he goes and plays Sebastian Bach. And I'm like, well, you know, got to make pays money. Yeah. Pays the best. I think pro, pro, most likely it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And then he also does a lot of uh, country stuff, I think, down in, in, in oh, yeah. Because he lives in Texas, so he's involved in a lot of that. So I, hey, you got to make money, and if that's going to pay your year out for you on one tour, why not, right? Right. So, well, it kind yeah. of leads into another question I had. So, obviously, you do a lot of drum session work on a regular basis. So, yeah. how do you decide which projects you're going to take on or not take on, honest? Mm, I don't know. First impression. Mm -hmm. Sent they sent me a demo, and I listened to it, and I think like yes or no. Right. Sometimes right. it's also schedule stuff. Then I'm booked for like way ahead. And then I said, like, sorry, I can't do it. But um, if it's got something interesting in it, I don't know. I, there's nothing that speaks against it. Even a lot of the times it's, it's, it's also people who don't have a big name. Right. And, or n any name at all. It doesn't matter because um, as long as um, they're sincere to, to their music and it's, they put time and effort and money in it. Mm -hmm. um, why not considering it? I mean, um, yeah. Do they have set drums for you or do they want you to just come in and play? I assume they want you to just come up with the parts, but. Yes, I think um, it's a little bit of both. They have a general idea mm -hmm. or have a program pattern. And most of the time they say, uh, I have a program pattern here, but you know, I'm not that good at it. So right, do right, right. So, and this is actually something that would be the second question. If I'm like, yes, the music is interesting. Second question is, how open are you for suggestions? And how open are you for taking my ideas? Because I'm done with playing music note by note, um, other people's music. That's what Necrophages was. It was hmm. completely the work of somebody else. And I mean, great stuff. Don't get me wrong. But it's um, just... A, it's not very f fulfilling to play note by note right. somebody else's ideas. That might be differently, maybe with guitar, because that's a different kind of instrument. Or if you play classical music or something like that, you interpret it on a piano or wherever, or right, violin. Right, right. But, uh, I don't know. For me, drumming, I always came from um, jazz and funk and these kind of styles, and they're way more open and uh, not really set in stone. And... And only when you approach it like that and also try to improvise at some point and try to come up with something spontaneously, then really interesting things can happen on the drums that you wouldn't have come come up with in the first place if you sit there and really do it note by note. Sometimes if it's really complicated and you have to really compose parts note by note and play them exactly like that because that's the only thing that really works. Right. Um, if it has a certain level of complex complexity. But um, in general, I'm beyond that point where I enjoy that too much. So I, I rather, you know, I listen to the, you, when, when I work on session work, I get like a, a track with, um, with drums or just the drums and then a track without drums. And I mute the track, the drum track. And I, just hear the guitars. What are they doing? And right, I right. orchestrate that. What I'm feeling is the right thing because that's exactly the thing you would do in a band if you yeah. take the drama seriously. Now there's this movement by guitarists that compose their drum lines and have either drum machines play them or you know uh, have hired drummers to play more or less exactly that thing and quantize it and put it on the album. If it works for these people, great, but that's right, not, yeah. I'm not interested in that. That's really boring. And, um, <laughs> well, one of the projects we really liked was, was Moral Collapse, which you did the session drum works on that. That album was great. Yeah. That was totally open. I mean, I had like riffs. Oh, really? I don't think, I, I can't remember actually. I don't think there was a fixed drum line. It was just ideas. Like, oh, well, that I had to be do. fun. Nice. So you got to, you you got to put your stamp right? all over the whole album then. Yeah, but I mean, that's how you interact in a band anyways. I, right, at exactly. Least when you do it in some musical way that is a little bit old school, you can meet and then work on parts and then you play something. But you have to work with the musician you're working with. 
if you um, program something on a drum machine and then you expect that person to 100% recreate that, then you take away the chance of creating something, you know, um, beyond your imagination. And when you have, well, sometimes sometimes it has to be exactly what you came up with. Sometimes um, sometimes I see that. And then I listen to the, to the um, drum arrangement and the programming. I think like, that really fits. Right. I know where this is going. I mean, that really fits. Let's just play this because it's really 100% the right thing to play. So I think just the, the best idea wins. Uh, but most of the time, yes, it's like people hire me and they're not drummers. And I play drums for, what, 28 years. And probably I have a better grip on writing a drum line. Maybe. You, know. you might <laughs> no, know a little maybe. bit about it, right? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> No, Marcus, I mentioned Moral Collapse, which uh, a lot of us on the podcast like that album. Another one that I completely forgotten about, even though I'm a huge fan of the band, and I realized uh, in preparing for this is that you're on the album So True, So Bound by Exist, which is a yes. local band for me. They're in Baltimore, and right. they have they have ties to Cynic. You know, Max mm-hmm. played with Cynic for a while, well, and he did the Death to All. And when I remembered, I was like, damn it, I can't, can't believe I forgot that, because I absolutely love them. I think they're great. Um is that another case where they sent you something, or did you know them beforehand? They no, I knew I knew them. Um, Max, we were friends before that. We toured okay. together. Uh, we supported Death to All. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, we have a very, I would say, like-minded sense of humor. So, um, yeah, we got along great. And then they approached me to, you know, they looking for a drummer uh, for the album. Um, and of course, I wanted to play on that. Um, they were a little bit more like, say, stricter than usual. They had a, a, a really good idea of what they wanted to hear in terms of drum lines because it's it's really written closely to the other instruments and so on. And but I accepted that in that case because it's it's obvious that um, the input matters because everything is really composed, and so the drum lines can't just be anything. Um, and here and there, I did my thing. But in general, I would say that's an album that was closer to, let's say, uh, a composed drum line. Yeah, I see those guys at shows all the time in Baltimore when I go up that way. Uh, I'll walk by and I'm like, well, I know who that is. But I don't bug anyone because they're with their friends, you know, I mean, some jackass walking up. Hey, you're that guy from that album. You know, but uh, <laughs> I don't do that. So. Uh, so real quick, one last thing about your solo stuff, all your stuff is DIY, right? You do everything yourself yeah. because I say that because you emailed me recently about uh, your latest album to say that there was a delay in shipping out the albums. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and you sent me the uh, the WAV files and that was right around the time I was thinking, maybe we should have him on. I mean, I, I now have his email and then Marcus on said, hey, I contacted Hannes about coming on the podcast. I was like, well, that worked out perfect then. That's awesome. <laughs> um but yeah, it, do you do you handle everything yourself, even down to that level of, of letting customers or people who buy your stuff, something came up, hey, just giving you a heads up, this is not coming out, or you do everything from start to finish, right? Yourself on your solo albums? Yes, I do. Um, I have a little bit of help with packing the albums, but um, in general, yeah, it's completely DIY. Um, well... Um, if you outsource everything, you lose a lot of money. And yeah, well, I mean, there's, of course. You know, there's, yeah. not, there's not that much money involved in the first place. So, But I guess it works for you with Bandcamp because that's the way it's sort of set yeah. up. You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, Bandcamp is perfect. And it's not, you know, a rip off like Spotify or something. I'm on Spotify as well because if you... And you, and you made Spotify, a whole $14 this year, right? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It's but, um, well... It's kind of a ripoff, and I know that, but most of the time, people that listen to Spotify, they would just not listen to you because yeah, it's, it's, it it's not my place to you know build a musician's union and fight for fair wages, but somebody has to do it. Well, I mean, with we, we've talked about this on the podcast before. I know, at least in the U.S., Peter Frampton's actually testified before Congress about it mm-hmm. and talked about how his song, Baby, I Love Your Ways, had something like some ridiculous number. I, I This is anecdotal. I don't know the exact number, but something like 45 million plays 
and he made like seventeen thousand dollars in royalties off of it right it's like the one of the most played songs on the whole platform i'm like there's something seriously wrong it doesn't matter if you like him or not no. the song is no. so well known yeah. i mean he should right. be cleaning up from that thing yeah yeah you know and that tells you there's something wrong with that system doesn't work as as yeah, great as. I mean, you don't even need to be a, like a socialist or something to to see that's fucked up because uh, the founder of of the platform is like a billionaire. Yeah, right. it, it, um, nobody's saying he shouldn't make a lot of money. He with should, it, but... but not at the expense of everybody who's putting the music out. Exactly, mm. it's like basically yeah. uh, slave labor. If if he it's can comparable. make a billion, if he can make several billion dollars, okay. How about a billion, which yeah. is cool just saying yeah. well yeah. you know what it set me off is his comment that well if you want to make money then you need to put out more output how many yeah, albums do you have sense. to put out seriously come on guy taylor swift it's, puts like, out um, it's like a record company that um owns your material sends you on shitty tours where you yeah. don't make a, a buck yeah, yeah. Say, you, tour? you have to tour more because we're not selling as much albums as we could. And I'm I like, haven't been home in two maybe. years. What do you want? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, musicians have been exploited like since the beginning of music, but still, uh, it, it sh it's just um, ridiculous that this uh, internet age, it could have, it could be made differently. Like the producers could have the power, but then again, they don't have it. Right. And um, it's really frustrating training. And Bandcamp, I think, is one of the exceptions because um, they give you 85% of the income. So. Yeah, it's great. Mm. E even without Bandcamp Friday, that's great. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, on Friday they give it away for free. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we usually buy a ton of stuff on Bandcamp oh, Friday <laughs> every time Ridiculous. it comes up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the best way to still to. Um, support artists to buy their stuff like physically or in if it's not physically then something else like a shirt or um directly from the artist um yeah. of course like uh, the bands that are on labels and when you buy on Bandcamp, still the label gets the money but also i have to say if a band is on a label and you buy their stuff and the label gets it but still you're supporting the band because they get a cut and right the label sees oh they're worth something, and right. yeah. um, you know that adds up. Yeah. But with uh, the stream, a lot of the streaming platforms, it's 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 just robbery. Yeah. Legal oh, robbery. Is. That's what it is. And you know, well, somebody I, has to stop. I don't know who, but yeah, they yeah. certainly ain't me. But uh, yeah. That's interesting because you know the labels that you bitch about the most are the ones that are not on Bandcamp, and there's plenty of metal labels on Bandcamp. But every time. There's a band on Century Media. I'm just like, damn it. Now I'm going to have to wait. I'd like to hear a song, but I don't want to have to fight through Century Media's web of bullshit to get to it. You know, whereas if it's Nuclear Blast, say what you want about them. At least they'll put their stuff up there. You can listen to it at least. You know, so okay. yeah, it, it tells you a lot about who's on and who's not on a platform mm -hmm. like that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, of course, yeah. I think Century Media is part of the Sony family, aren't they? Yeah, I, think. I think they are now. Yeah, because... Like or something like that. Yeah, because Inside Out is part of Century Media, which is, yeah, that's why you can't find Inside Out anywhere on there, which to me would be the perfect label for that style of music to be on that kind of yeah. a platform too. Well, Bandcamp's yeah. definitely our favorite because you know it gives more money to the artists. And we've been buying a lot of stuff, especially now with the COVID and everything and bands haven't been able to tour. Yeah, you definitely yeah. want to throw some money their way so they can keep going and make an well, income. It's that and the fact that you can get flack you know, you can get the best possible. If you're going to go digital, yeah, not going physical, you want the best possible media you can get, you know, so it sounds the best. You know, All of these other platforms are starting to offer a better quality yeah. files. You know, yeah, so. but I mean, with streaming, um, it's of course, it's like MP3s, but I have yeah. to say, or a different format, actually. Um, but I have to say, sound-wise, Spotify is, is pretty good. And, no, it's... Um, it's it's good yeah it's just like youtube i'm just like i'm not listening to this I, yeah, because, no, no. because who knows but, who loaded that up there and everything and yeah. if it's you know. like youtube music and it's official then yes that's the yes. same quality yeah. and spotify. but spotify they ended this uh, loudness war and again we're with metallica on what was their album after saint anger death um, magnetic De death magnetic yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm mastering an album and I, you know, send that to the band, they say we won't, will not pay you. <laughs> exactly. It's distorted. It's not usable. What are you doing? You're a hack. Don't. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Now, mind you, I, I say these things. I'm from San Francisco. I, I was born and raised there. And every time every anything past Injustice for All comes up, it's just like a piece of my heart from where I'm from starts to break a little more. It's just like, damn it. <laughs> you know, so. I know the Black Album is not the favorite album of most metalheads, but it's a groundbreaking production. Oh, and, there's no um, question about it. None. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, the albums after that, I mean, the music was a little eh, but uh, in my opinion. But also some stuff was really good, but the production was was still great. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They actually have a podcast coming out about the making of the Black Album that I, I kind of want to listen to, <laughs> just to, to hear the stories behind all that, but... Well, There's can... like a video on. I don't think I, I'm not sure. Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime, Amazon Video, something like that, um, about the Black Album. Um, yeah. I think it's an old one from the late '90s or something. You know, um, you could you could just watch some kind of monster, and that's all you need to know about the Black Album. Well, that's true. That was <laughs> a really so good documentary. Actually, that. it is it's, painful, but it's a good documentary. It actually is very good, but it's painful to watch. Yeah. It really is. You know? Hopefully, well, they're in a better place. It's amusing, but um, there you go. Well, you know, um, it's painful for me is just watching the behind the scenes and all the just nonsense and then to see the band go along with it. And then at the end, they're like, hey, wait a second. This is all nonsense. At the end, you're like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the first thing is they are human after all. But, of course. Um, I know. Then the thing is, um, there is a couple of scenes that I still think are so unintentionally funny. And it's it's the best uh, like. That scene when um, James Hetfield comes from rehabilitation, the first mm-hmm. thing Lars Ulrich does is opens a can of beer. I know. It's just like, what the fuck? Wow. Yeah, I l- really like you. <laughs> That's all you yeah. needed to know right there on that scene. That was great. Uh, what else? Um, Lars is dead. It's classic. Um, yeah. If I were you, I would just delete that. Delete it. Delete it. <laughs> I will give them this, though. I, I will give them props though when they deserve it. The way they um God his name is slipping my mind, the bass player, the way they treated him when they signed him. Uh, um Robert. Rob, yeah, yeah, Robert. They basically handed that him that check just to see his expression, if whether he knew that or not beforehand. And they gave him a lot of money on the spot. I was just like, All right, you know, you may may I may have issues how you treated the other bassist before him, but that was at least they didn't I think and Jason Gene Simmons said, and Paul well, Stanley him. Yeah, kind of. Jason News said um, the the thing uh, probably he was treated not in a really good way, but no. um, I think I don't think he has money troubles. No, he's done That's fine. Yes. Right, so right, I right. think he's doing well. But um, yeah. aside from that, it's like to me, I imp- interpreted this scene a little bit differently because I was like, uh, how can I put it? My first impression was like, wow, this is awesome. Um, my second one was like, oh, okay. So apparently they like to hang out with millionaires now. Because- <laughs> yeah, so it's bullshit. Then on top, yes, I like yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if they go to a fancy rest, I, I mean, probably they don't spend time with another anyways. But uh, if they go out as a band on tour to a fancy restaurant and they'll think like, hey, what if we take Rob? Do we have to take his bill or what? No, just give him a million. <laughs> give him fine. a million dollars. He'll pay for dinner. <laughs> for <himself. laughs> He can go like on Bay Area speedboat race with us, and you know, oh god, that's it. Yeah, it's... whatever they they um, <laughs> like better than actually making music, you know. But <laughs> you've changed my opinion. Fuck those guys. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I still I like him I, I, with all the ridiculousness, and I I have to say it takes a lot of balls to really put that. I mean, either they're completely deluded or they have like balls of steel to put that documentary. Yeah. You know, yeah, out there. Right. It's true. With all the, um, all the, the obvious human weaknesses that everybody has, but they're really showing it. And, uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I have to really respect that to some point. I, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. I think it, it kind of takes balls and, um, it's very entertaining to watch that movie still. I mean, after all these years, it's still a very entertaining movie. I do um, like watching the uh, the bass uh, player part when they all come in. 
to play. I actually found that interesting because mm-hmm. really you're hearing guys, guys, but musicians try to fit in with that band for that yeah. whatever amount of time. And that's not easy to do. Mm-hmm. And there were some good bass players that showed up that played great. And you're just like, eh, no, we're going to move on. You know, like, but that's, that's their prerogative. Obviously it's their yeah. band, you know, so. Yep. But I mean, uh, Rob Trujillo is a great bass player. Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's fabulous. I, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, they got themselves a really good bass player. So, yeah. Good, good decision, I would say. And, yeah. I think he, I think he probably fits their, their general direction as a band. So, yeah. 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 I think, I mean, this is the thing when you are in Metallica and you're in Metallica, then it's your job and you do nothing else. And that always comes first. That's, I think, something you have to accept. If you're a little like free spirit minded or something like that, doesn't work for you, maybe. Yeah. I could imagine because it's really like corporate almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not going to so be as bad as playing for us. Of, of that. Um, yeah, um, but again, I mean, um, playing those shows probably is fucking awesome. Oh, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. yeah. And they're really, sometimes, sometimes they fuck up a couple of things, but in general, they're really good life band. so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know the one person who probably fucks up the most, but I'm not going to beat on them continuously oh, this whole time, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Well, how does it work in Alkaloid then? Hopefully you don't have any of those problems that Metallica has in Alkaloid, but uh, that's yeah. a that band you play a variety of styles. You know, was that something that you set out to do with Alkaloid from the very beginning uh with with other players um, or how how did that evolve? How did that a project evolve? I contacted our singer about having a project in mind or a band or something. I didn't mm-hmm. know yet, but I wanted to make music with that guy. And then, yeah, there's obvious choices for who wants to join the band. And then on tour with Obscure, I had the idea, hey, I, okay, I have uh, no, Flo on vocal, and uh, Morian is his stage name, and uh, then uh, Linus on bass and Danny Tonker on guitar. You can literally play anything. I think, I think like uh, three guitarists, two, uh, you know, two awesome guitar solists, right and left and then Flo also play guitar that's the thing chris you want to join yeah you know, <laughs> because he was there and i thought like yes he said, yes yes that that's that's it that completes the picture um and um yeah and yeah uh, yeah it worked out great uh, from coming from these yeah having the vision of the band and then i had some ideas right um that wouldn't really fit with obscura because it's it's already like a fixed thing of course you can extend it but only to a certain extent and then i think like it's better to start that from scratch and um and get those ideas out and then yeah um i don't know a mix of having the right people and then having some ideas and want and then i just said like hey we shouldn't have any limits whatsoever if you know if that had to be pretty yeah. freeing for you. Yeah, it did. It, it was, really. Um, because I, musically, I have to say, it's still uh, my favorite people to play with. Um, it's it's really fulfilling. And everybody is, like, on top of the game. And I have to, you know, um, yeah, I can't just let it slide. Um, right, right. Because um, those songs are demanding and everybody's, you know... Um, well, every, everyone puts out. It's in, it, it's almost like a current day all star band. I mean, there's a lot of great musicianship in the band to go yeah. along with those songs. Yeah, and I think like all these musicians, they they played in a lot of bands, but still, I think even though we play a lot of different things, still when we come together as Alkaloid, Alkaloid come become something. Even though the band might not be super famous or something like that, doesn't matter. Um, it's out there and it stands for something and then it's more than just the musicians playing it's when these musicians play together something beyond what these musicians can do individually will come out of it and that's exactly what happened so um yeah i'm really happy and i have to say that from all the albums i did including necrophages and everything uh, that the last alkaloid liquid anatomy is still my favorite album i ever did so um so I have to yeah. say, yeah, it worked out like perfectly for me. I love that song, uh, "Rise of the Cephalopods," 
from uh, okay. Liquid Alchemy, the 20 minute track, but also because my wife and I, we actually use cephalopod as a code word whenever we get cranky with one another to just stop doing that. So my question, this is a weird question, but what is your favorite yeah. cephalopod? <laughs> you mean like uh, yeah, uh, Kraken? Yeah, yeah, thing? yeah. <laughs> well, there's so many, I'll tell you mine. Mine is the vampire squid. So mm -hmm. a vampire squid is like a six inch squid. It has webbing that yep. connects its eight arms. It's got a bioluminescence because it lives in the yep. deep parts of the ocean. Yes. Those things are spectacular. Yeah. I think they really are. I'm, I mean, I didn't read the lyrics and I'm not the expert on cephalopods, but yeah. um, I have to say I'm fascinated with those really big ones that fight with the pot whales. Oh yeah. What's up with that? That's like really <laughs> horror movie stuff. <laughs> like, like the giant it's, squids. It's like eight meter squids or something. Yeah, yeah. Eight meter, which in, uh, I don't know. I cannot translate that to your shitty system. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. all you need to say. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's big. <laughs> big enough for you to say, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So are you working on some new alkaloid stuff too? You said you had some more material yeah. for a solo album, but I assume there's more yeah. alkaloid coming. Um, actually, we're almost done writing it. Oh, wow. I would say. Like there's a lot of songs could um, written and collected. And the thing is, um, it only exists in theory because we programmed some of the parts, but we didn't record anything. So that's the songs now. And yeah, now we record it as it's written out. That's great. So I don't really know what it's going to be because it's very abstract when it starts. I have an idea in my head where, mm. where it could go and everyone has, but like with flow songs, I don't really know where they're going yet. I have a demo, at least with guitars, uh, but still I don't have the full picture, but I'm we're taking one step at a time. Then, you know, first recording drums, getting the drum lines right and recording all the instruments and then um, Sometimes we have to finalize the structure afterwards oh. because when everything is there. And then vocals is the final step um, where we don't know where it's going oh. exactly. With the last one, we kind of went, went a little bit over the top with clean vocals. It's so many and Flo is the only guy singing. And right. it's almost impossible to recreate it live. So we have to figure out a way of doing that this time. Maybe have some more other guys singing. We don't know that yet, but... We'll see. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I'm really excited about the material so far, but I cannot really know yet where it's going. Um, it's what I know, it's going to be a long album and it's going to be complex and it's got to be way of wacky shit on it. That's <laughs> what I know for sure. Nice. Wow. But, awesome. um, let's see i mean it's not completely opposite opposed to the last two albums like we're not doing these cuts i don't know there's um maybe you know this band from germany called disillusion oh, oh yeah. yeah they had yeah. um in the early 2000s they had a, like a really epic album like opeth the emperor influenced yeah. album it's great um and then the album afterwards was like almost industrial and the thing is, it was a good album, but they co completely lost their fan base because that's not what they wanted to hear. Right. So we're probably not doing that, you know, those cuts. Like, right. okay. Because we want to do a certain type of music, but in general, we cannot outrule strange ideas. But let's see. I, I think I, I like the material so far, so... That's all I can say now. Okay. Uh, but um, it's almost done, and I think uh, we can start recording soon. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's exciting. Goodness. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah I, I need to be able to, when we do our, we do a top 25 every year. We ventured one year and did 40, and that, that exhausted me for three years. Um, but we do a top 25 for the mid-year and end of year, and I think that my comment was, I don't know, Marcus, were you on that one in 2018 when we did that? I can't remember. Uh, I don't my comment was so. for it, one album to rule all, which was a reference to Lord of the Rings. And <laughs> Liquid Anatomy was my number one album for 2018. <laughs> and I was just not having any of the other albums for the rest of the year. <laughs> you know, so uh, I need to do that again. 
So I think uh, the music we want to do in general is um, something for people who really like music, who really like metal, and who really like progressive stuff, and to really like. That's John for sure. I mean, I love progressive. Well, every, all of us really we are, take yeah. progressive yeah. metal. Yeah. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of, of interesting progressive metal stuff. There's a lot of interesting modern death metal stuff that has a lot of things in there. But it's really different from what we're doing because, I don't know, from my perspective, we're still rooted in the old school metal world. A lot of the newer, um, especially tech metal bands, they're rooted in, I don't know, more modern bands. Let's say, uh, I don't know, take any band. I don't know, progressive more yeah, modern bands, but let's say periphery they have their style but they don't really yeah. relate to um more old school metal it's not really in their music it's really something else and they bring other influences to the table i don't know these influence maybe i'm i'm talking bullshit here but um i don't know i could see that some of the people in the band take ideas from really different kind of genres like i don't know hmm. Radiohead or something like that or whatever or trip hop or something like that and put it put those ideas into their music it's coming from really somewhere else and then the Meshuggah influence and all of that and it's really something else but um, we still like Rush Metallica Iron Maiden Slayer and Morbid Angel and that will always be um, I don't know the common denominator and then on top of that it's modern classical music and all the other stuff and all the stuff we've been involved in and it's all that so uh, i think that's really different from from a lot of the the other more modern prog or um death metal prog bands that it's it's really more rooted in traditional metal yeah uh, it, that will always be the case in some way because you cannot just um take that away yeah i think that's what we really like about it to be honest yeah yeah Oh yeah. yeah, I mean, you can hear some of the influences on on the last album, Liquid Anatomy. There's mm -hmm. a few parts where yeah. you mentioned Morbid Angel earlier, and yeah, there's yeah, a few yeah. moments where I'm like, "Oh man, that that kind of reminds me a little bit of that." You know, although I have yeah. to admit, the op opening track, uh, George, the Pod Father, who's not here with us today, um, he sent me a message when he got the promo, and he said, "Hey, you got to check out the opening track to the new Alkaloid." I swear to God, I'm hearing yes on here. Yes. No, I don't want to five. <laughs> and and, and I, I heard it. I was like, whoa, this has come not coming out of left field, but for someone who was on that tour, I mean, I saw them three <laughs> times on the 90125 tour. I was like, whoa. And I was always a big Trevor Raven fan. I always liked his his approach, yeah. even though it wasn't yeah. traditional. Yes, it's not. But no. it was always it was a cool sound that he came up with. And yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I I think uh, it wasn't supposed to be uh, released at, under the name Yes. But yeah, it's supposed I to be think, cinema, right? Yeah, as far as I know, the record company insisted on that. So, but it worked. I mean, yeah, I can say that um, the reason I, um, you know, I wrote the music for that song, and um, the um, it came. Uh, yeah, the reason was that our singer told me that uh, one of his first and biggest uh, influences in rock music when he was little was that album and it's still like a reference to him that's and awesome of course, I, I love that album and i thought like ah this could be a resemblance but then i'm thinking like but and then again um i would not want to copy somebody else's style that much there has to be something in there that the original does not provide and also it's um a very melodic song I think that's where it is. It's, no. it's the melody of the guitar parts early on that it's like, oh, yeah. I remember this is nice. And it was, yeah, it's not them. It doesn't sound like them, but it reminds you a little bit of that, you know, which it's is a good thing. I think. Is similar and and yeah. the, um, but then I thought like, okay, what can we do um, about that? Because you know, the thing that I don't really like is retro bands in whatever regard. I think that's um, completely. Uh, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's fun, I have to admit. But uh, it's not my approach. Let's put it this way. I would say if people, it's the same with TV shows, and that's still why I like the new series, uh, the new, uh, yeah, the new series of uh, Twin Peaks, 
and everybody hates it but i think it's brilliant because um i mean i don't know if you watched that or not a little but bit i saw a little bit of it let's put it this way it's yeah i mean it's david lynch it's weird as fuck and uh, yeah. of course but then he he kind of uh but well, there's no other word for it yeah, he kind of raped he kind of <laughs> raped the um original characters and one part of me is like why did he do that like um i don't know the main character he's like just some kind of vegetable and like like at least 15 episodes out of 18 episodes so it's like what what the fuck is going on here then i think like okay who is the core audience um people who want to have a good time with the old stuff <laughs> and he's denying that completely he says yeah, no. right that's not <laughs> Now Audrey Horn is not the cool, clever, sexy Audrey Horn. She's like uh, some crazy on drugs housewife that you hate. Yeah. <laughs> you really deb- butchered true. her character, and I think this is kind of of the point here. And I I think like okay, that's maybe a little far, but um, with uh, that opening track on the alkaloid, I thought like let's lure them on a way like into like oh this is a prog record, nice, nice, oh nice melody, and then it's kicking yeah, the balls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely that's not coming out of nowhere, and it's on top of each other more and more and more. And that then you're listening to a death metal song, and you don't even realize it because you thought you're listening to like an '80s prog song, and that was the idea to kind of um, demask this, um, I would say, retro ideology, where you know, even with shows that I like, let's say Stranger Things or something, I really enjoyed that show, but of course it plays in the '80s because everything is in the '80s now. Because oh, now okay. the 80s is cool. The 80s were not so cool in the 80s. You know? <laughs> People want that back. They want to have a good time. Now they have kids. They want to watch Ghostbusters with their kids. And I, yeah. I get it. It's nice, yeah. but it's not art <laughs> to approach. <laughs> I, well, they I like they got a new He-Man show that's out yeah. now. Dark, Dark um, I have not watched it because I canceled my Netflix account. I'm waiting mm. for Cobra Kai. That's, oh, I have to say, that's we one love of Cobra the things Kai. where I'm like, yeah. okay, you did you did that justice because I think that's really fun and they're not taking themselves really seriously, but they do, they're not, you know, I think it's nice. The beauty well, of yeah. the beauty of that. I totally disagree on that, but it's a super fun. No, oh no, we love yeah, Cobra we love it. The beauty like, is, like, go ahead, I'm waiting sorry. for Cobra Kai to come back and then I'm reactivating my, my Netflix account <laughs> and I'm coming out again. And maybe then I have, uh, you know, um, watch He-Man. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, a friend of mine told me it's absolutely terrible because apparently they made like some kind of, I don't know, um, identitarian bullshit thing about um Well, you might it. like I it because I heard that they, they definitely subverted the original He-Man. Uh, I haven't watched it. I've just heard some things. I don't want to know too much, but mm-hmm. they it, changed a lot in it. Isn't Kevin Smith a big producer? Um, yeah, Kevin Smith. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, the guy from, uh, what was it? Some, or, uh Bob's. Yes. Yep. Clerks, yeah. Bob. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't know anything about it. Um, but the thing is, you have to keep in mind the original He-Man, the core audience, you know, the 80s He-Man, the core audience was five-year-olds. Yeah, it was. was so mm-hmm. If you want to do that show justice, what are you talking about? I mean, well... If you were like me and you were 15 or 16 and you were getting drinking beers with your buddies and watching it, you know, because we did stupid shit back then. Yeah. They, I mean, they, the original he I was, when it aired, I mean, I was born, basically. Yeah. And then it was on German TV. Yeah. And it, it really was like, um, I don't know, Skeletor coming up, I have a new weapon. This <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very kid-based. Um, yes. yes. A complete kid show. And then stone of destruction and then merman comes and said oh what about he man and then it's going ah, 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 i will crush him and <laughs> of course he it's lost bad. and he lost in a way we're like but i'm coming back stronger than ever well and, and then they the would... show ended with kids don't take drugs yeah. and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> that's the show i mean if you want a resemblance of that I, i'm not sure well, you, know? and, you might be disappointed and half the show is just a loop like they would have the exact yeah. same yeah. cut scenes and just yeah. in them, throw them into the show yeah, yeah. My season favorite. one they have 65 episodes oh, that's yeah. right. wow I, you know what the other thing about that show so yeah. i mean 
I, I can see they butchered the show, but I mean, you can butcher a show like this. Or, I mean, I love, I love it, of course, but uh, you can butcher it by having like real characters there, and then it's nothing yeah. like the original anymore. So I don't know. Um, but then also you're, you're toying with childhood experiences and that's fragile. Mm -hmm. I try not to watch that stuff that I loved as a kid because it, a lot of it just does not hold up, you know, like Transformers or like Thundercats or something like yeah, that. Sure. None of that um, stuff is good. Does anybody of you remember Saber Rider? Uh, no. Was that a thing? No? Maybe it was Japanese or European. I don't know. It was a big show on German TV. Hmm. Huh. No, Robotech was a big one for me. Robotech. Okay. But uh, Saber Rider, I don't know. Yeah, see, for me, that would be, I'd be a little too old for some of that stuff at that point. So <laughs> uh, it's the truth. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I was just going to say real quick about the Cobra Kai. I can't even begin to tell you how happy I was that it reminded me of the films mm -hmm. when they first dropped. When I first saw them when they were released, I was like, it's the same exact cheesy shit. And this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah. I don't yeah, want it's, new. It's I don't want perfect. a new interpretation. Right. And that's kind of why I like. But it does that? add new. It no. adds new depth to the character. A little bit, yes. Yeah. But I mean, it's the same, same storyline. And yeah, yeah. But it's such a believable evolution. You know? Yes, like yes. it's yeah. totally make. I mean, and it, what I love now is as a kid as to how much I hated Johnny, how much I love Johnny. Oh, like he's still driving a Trans Am, character. you know, and everything. And, yeah, and Daniel's kind of a douchebag at times, you know. But yeah. then, you know, just yeah. all the complexities of their characters, yes. then kind of all the kind of the. The nods back to the series yeah yeah you know, even yeah. the it's really fun and a lot of yeah. that is really just about communication because some of the times when you see like the dialogues they have history and then they misinterpret each other they're, they're mad at each other mm -hmm. i'm like guys come on just yeah. listen to each other yeah, yeah. What are you, doing? you should be best friends come on well, yeah well, they should. They well should. they keep doing that they keep bringing them together like they have an understanding and then something happens they're like no fuck that yeah. we're, we're enemies yeah yeah, yeah. I think that's really fun. I mean, it's, it's a really fun show, again. It's yeah. so good. Well, this is great, Hans. This is really a, a great it's conversation. Really fun. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to talk about Cobra Kai. I really like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> some, you know, a lot of the time, uh, interviewers, uh, also because of time restrictions, of course, it's about what I do, about um, the album. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, um, I want to people to know I have, a new album and i'm doing this and this is what happened and this is a song and i'm excited about it but of course it's not new to me you know right right I, exactly so i'm telling the same things over and over and uh, if i have the chance to like just talk anything i mean and and it's fun then oh, why yeah. not oh yeah no i totally understand because i do a lot of interviews for my comic books yeah so so we try to ask like different questions as well of course we're going to ask you about stuff about the album and everything like that but yeah. Uh, we try to ask different questions whenever we have guests on. Yeah, also, sometimes when I listen to podcasts um, in general, I those podcasts that yeah go out of the uh, how do you say book or off script. Off script, yeah, that go off script are actually the most entertaining. Yeah, like especially stuff like um, thrashing Lars's Ulrich's. Uh, <laughs> stuff like that. That's what that's entertaining, right? Also, it's entertaining for us because, like, oh my God, what did they do? And you know, so um, I actually like that kind of stuff. Oh, cool. Um, well, yeah, so we'll, we'll I, talk about whatever you want to talk about. You know, okay. <laughs> you got more up. shows. You got more shows you want to talk about? We'd love that. Yeah, shows. Uh, <laughs> I watch a lot of shows. Actually, I watch a lot of shitty shows. Like um, what? Yeah. So do we oh, all? Um, <laughs> wait, wait, okay. wait. First of all, um, I watched all of Downton Abbey. Uh, so did I. I oh. didn't even Not all watch the, even the movie. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my better half said, hey, the movie, do you want to watch it? I was like, if I get to watch all the stupid shit I want, I can put up with watching this for a couple hours. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Make a bargain. That makes sense. Yeah, and then, and then halfway through, you know, I can't believe... wonder where they put the spoon. Yeah, uh, that, that's, yeah, yeah. Halfway, halfway through, you're like, I can't believe he did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The whole thing, uh, what I like about it, it's so ridiculous. It's like, how can I put it? It's, um, I mean, the whole thing um, just cements a class structure, like mm -hmm. from a, you know, from that point of perspective. It's always like, 
oh yeah all the the servants they are happy to be servants and like i mean complete bullshit but um <laughs> yeah. i know that so i can enjoy that yeah it's a soap opera what else did i watch um um and i sometimes i find these shows more interesting not more interesting than the good shows but from some perspective i find that very interesting because it resembles the way some people think you know what i'm saying um yeah, yeah. Also- i can't i have a hard time getting into any shows with like British royalty, the aristocracy, but my wife loves those. Those kind I kinda of like it too. But um <laughs> yeah, it depends. Um they're better ones than down Abbey, I would say. But still. Oh, yeah. Um, you know I, yes. I don't know, just real quick, I don't know about you guys, but when I watch that half the time I'm like, Hey, I think that dude was in Game of Thrones. I yeah. do that all oh, the yeah. time. Like <laughs> Yes. He was, I, I do that with that. every show. Everything. Yeah. Every show. Everyone from yep. Game of Thrones is in every show I watch. I'm like, yes. oh, that dude was yeah. a dick, man. He got what he deserved. <laughs> yeah. He's such yeah. a nice guy in this show. <laughs> so, so what other crappy shows do you watch, Hannes? Um, Actually, I watched, what was it? Uh, to get, How to Get Away with Murder. Uh, I, think yeah, I put my foot down on that That one. show mm-hmm. is absolutely terrible, and terrible. I watched five seasons of it. Terrible. And, and the most quoted um, sentence in that show is, I did that to protect you. Yeah. And yeah. what I like about that, and it's like the stupid bullshit uh, they telling themselves to justify their actions. It's yeah. That's really interesting how they do it. Yeah. And and sometimes, yeah, it's it's just mindless um, bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sometimes I like that. Another show I watched recently, which is completely, mind the word, retarded, but it's the right word for this. Um, it's a show called Manifesto. I don't know if you watched that. It's I about heard of that. saw a few episodes. The the flight. <laughs> oh yeah, Manifesto. Oh, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you get invested, and you're like, well, I didn't watch this whole first season not to find out what fucking happened to these people. And damn it, get to the point. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. The th- yeah. It, that's true. That's how every show works. Yeah. That's how that. they reel you in. Your bodies again. Uh, what happens to your bodies? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, and uh, <laughs> one part, and the other thing is what what I really enjoyed about it. Like, it's more complex than that. It's um, and I and had some satisfaction watching it. Is I don't know. It's it's done by um, or produced by Robert Zemeckis, the guy who did uh, Forrest Gump. And mm-hmm. I mean, hands down, Forrest Gump is the most terrible movie ever, in my opinion. <laughs> and like the stupid bullshit. I mean, it's it's well done. Don't get me wrong, and it's funny at times and it's entertaining. But what are they telling you? It like, um, like Forrest, who's uh, who had just good luck, makes yeah, makes a complete fortune, and everything he does turns into gold. Where his friend, like Jenny, she gets raped as a kid. She then um, got uh, probably raped by her boyfriends. Then. Um, she starts to take heroin. She has to prostitute herself, and then at the end, she dies of AIDS. That's her story. And we get told by, well, the director or in the movie, life is like this uh, piece of chocolate. You never know what you're gonna get, and the, <laughs> like every life is a flow, and you know, you never know. I mean, that might be true to some extent, but this is the story you want to tell us that. It is if it yeah. makes a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay. it's okay that Daniel Egg of Spotify gets the billion dollars. And yeah, exactly. All the music. It's fine. It's fine. It's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Spotify has all the chocolate. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah they have all the chocolate. They it's only one style of chocolate. Gone. Yeah, clearly they're a, they're a backer and, of that film. And this guy uh, did. Um, um, <laughs> he produced Manifesto. Manifesto is a show about an airplane starting in what bahamas or something somewhere in the islands yeah yeah and they land five years five and a half years have passed nobody knows why what happened wait isn't this the plot of lost and that's an interesting setup i mean as stupid as it is it's kind of interesting it's but you get hooked on that yeah and i like that it's playful sure yes but the characters on the show of course like the woman is a cop because then she can solve everything and everything's cliche. Like, yes. Car plays yes. and yes. very handy. 
one is a doctor and she can find out all the yes things in his blood it resembles to what happens on the plane oh my god yeah no one's like a douchebag or like a dirt no, bag all, no one's like a there's, there's never yeah. a shitty drummer on the plane you know what i mean right. yeah why am i not in this show come on mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right. and, I mean, it, and the it is... thing what they tell it, the, the catchphrase is not like the one with the with the chocolate. It's um, all will turn out good eventually. That's yeah. what you know. This is the thing. Uh, the the guy's mother died while he was away on the plane, and she used to say that, and it's a phrase from the Bible. And oh, so, oh my God, it's so emotional. Wait, why are you watching this? <laughs> Because we have to be entertained in our our most dullest moments of life. Say, if you watch the Avengers, that's the shorter version because everybody disappears yeah. for five years and then comes back. Oh right, right. So honest, yeah. I will. I'm going to say yeah. something. So uh, we've been watching a lot of non-U.S. shows on Netflix because they've really yeah. upped their foreign. For us, it would be foreign market shows. So we get a lot of shows from England, Wales. I mean, Canada is mm. not a. It's just, it's a neighboring country, but we get a lot of shows now, New Zealand, Australia. And I have to say, everything that's bad about Hollywood, which is like yeah. the Mecca place, has seeped all around the world. So no one can complain about us anymore because the same bullshit that are on our shows are showing <laughs> yeah. up in those shows. And I'm like, Ugh, damn yeah, it, I like thought you were better than us. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like movies uh, made for German TV. Um, they don't have a big budget, of course. And they use theater actor, actors who were in, um, I don't know, plays before that were either about Soviet Union or Nazis. And that's how they play. And the story is uh, then a ripoff from a famous Hollywood movie. Like there's a movie they produced for TV. It's called like something like Berlin Freezes or something like that. And <laughs> it's basically um, the day after tomorrow. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To begin Dennis with. Quaid. Yeah. But then they do it with German actors and, um, and you know, uh, no production value and it's terrible. And they have public money spend, you know, they're spending on these films. And I'm like, oh, my God. So um, I don't know. And of course, they're influenced by Hollywood, but most of the time, not by the really good stuff. There are good movies and there's yeah. good stuff in Germany. But really, uh, I have to say this also goes for our um market yeah. that that the cheesy the corny hollywood stuff that gets adopted really quickly and what i think if you really think what shows are really successful like breaking bad and game of thrones big budget out of the box um that kind of stuff twin peaks back then to begin with people mm -hmm. want that i think a really big audience wants to get surprised but they that's not the way how producers think because producers are businessmen. I think like this sold in the past is going to sell in the oh, future. Yeah. Most of well, the time it does. So yeah. like yeah. Star Wars, when it came back, it was just a rehash oh, yeah. of all the movies before. And I hated that because I like the stuff that's yeah. newer. You know, I want to yeah. see new adventures. I want to see them. It's such a huge world. I want to see them try to just take chances, take more chances exactly. with it and give us something new. But it doesn't always happen. I get it. I get why they do it. But it is very frustrating to me sometimes. From what I read online and stuff, um, the Star Wars fans kind of hate the last one. I mean, yeah, I actually like the last the... one better than the first two. I agree with that too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay. funny. I actually like the side stories better for all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. I actually like the Han Solo story, which me too seem to hate. I, loved I loved it. it too, and I love the. I didn't like the... it that much. I liked that uh, war movie. What was the name? Um, Rogue One. Rogue One. Rogue Rogue One. One. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I loved that. It was very good. Because they were different. Yeah. They didn't rely on rehashing the same story over. And I think that's why I liked it more. Oh, so. well, my favorite actually is the Clone Wars cartoon. That's by far my favorite. Yeah, Star Wars. yeah. yeah. Uh, see, uh, Empire is always going to be my favorite because I, when I was a kid, real quick, uh, I spent a lot, all my summers in Lake Tahoe and some of my winters. And my next door neighbor, went to school at a place called UC Davis, University of California, Davis. And he met with George Lucas. I don't know how he met, but he told me in the summer before Empire came out that there's going to be this great revelation that people are going to be shocked and that Darth Vader might be Luke's father. I was like, this is absolutely insane. It will never happen. Then I saw yeah. the movie 
And now, <laughs> this is what, 1980, so I'm 12. My mouth could not hit the floor any faster and bounce back up. I was like, he really is his father. <laughs> oh, my God, Scotty's brother was right when he told me this yeah. story two years ago. I mean, you it, know just what? it blew you my know mind. What? Back then, what, when did the movie came out? 79 or something? 80 for 80. Empire. Yeah, 80. 80. Yeah. Okay, 80. 1980. That was a big revelation. Now there's not mind. a single show with these kind of twists. Nothing. Yeah. Back then you're like, like, what the fuck? You're waiting, you're waiting for, oh, this is like they're somehow related through some or he yeah. moved back in time and now they're related. Uh, He's his grandfather or something like that. That's uh, storytelling now. They totally milking that thing, but back then it was completely unthinkable. Like it was what? I can't even tell you guys how huge that was when that dropped. Oh, yeah. People were like shocked. Like it's kind of like can... the whole "Who Shot Jr." I know that's right. very old for right. most people. Right. People were just blown away when they heard that ending. And I was like, "Yeah, I don't really like this mm -hmm. show, so I don't really care." But <laughs> I mean, no, it happens I, every once in a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, and, Matt. No, I was gonna say I totally agree, John. And I can literally say I shit myself, but I was wearing diapers at the time when yeah, you, found, so out that, about, when found out about yeah. his dad. And like you know, like we we're talking, like. I think I was just really excited that Star Wars was going to continue, you know, with these new movies and stuff when they were announced. But yeah, I, I, I'm with you guys on some of the side stories. But it's been fun to see my kids adapt to it and you know pick it up in right. their lives and pick you know, they're they're not going to like those old movies like their mom and I do. But but seeing them get excited about some of the newer stuff. But but yeah, we are like Rogue One is probably our favorite thing out of the newer stuff. Um, but I'm with you on that third movie. And it'll be interesting to see. Has anybody watched The Bad Batch yet? I haven't watched it yet. Okay. No. Too much television. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, Hannes, we, we know that Forrest Gump is your least favorite movie of all time, the worst <laughs> Maybe movie. Maybe not my least favorite movie, but I think it's a, it's actually a bad movie. Right. It's, well but, done. But it's a well probably, done movie, professionally done, but it, the whole story and message is completely right, But what is your favorite movie, though? But I, I will just say I your commentary know. on it is the most interesting I've heard on Forrest Gump. commentary. Okay. <laughs> oh, my. Like, you, like, your perspective on it was the most interesting thing I've heard about that movie so yeah. Yeah. what is your favorite um i don't have one favorite movie i can just give you a couple okay mm -hmm. that's fine that yeah, like. yeah because i got this um question of uh, a friend of mine and i don't know what what it is uh, yeah i know this is a typical question because we always want to have that one thing that favorite thing but sometimes i don't know um i have to say um also with being the age I am, um, that the Lord of the Rings movies are still my favorite movies. Because I, yeah, I, I, I read the books. I was a big fan. My studio is called Mortar Sound. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it comes from something. And, um, of course, I love these m movies. And I think, like, when I watched those movies, every character was exactly like imagined. It. Right. Like, Gandalf, mm -hmm. yes, that's gone. Yes. Uh, 100, 100. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And, yeah, and they did that justice, and uh, um, I still can, I still watch these movies, even though I've seen them like I don't know six, seven, eight times. Yeah. I, th like, I think oh. it's the best trilogy ever. I just watch the extended versions like all day. Yeah, event. they're good. Yeah, so good. You have to watch. You, you have to yes. watch everything. Yes. Because hey, just real quick, the greatest mm. movie experience in my whole life. I mean, I've had a few, but I went with a buddy of mine to see the first film of the three. And I knew that it obviously was going to be three films. He didn't yeah. know that. And at the end of the film, you know, it just ends with them like continuing the journey and the lights come up and he's bigger than me. He's like six foot five, six four, former wrestler, huge guy. Just the answer goes, this is fucking bullshit. And the theater just screams it out. And I literally, <laughs> tears are coming out of my face. I said, Dude, it's a continuation. No, that's bullshit. Dude, it's so no. He just got flipped out and just left the theater screaming. And I just like... <laughs> Literally, this last three hours was worth it just for that two seconds. That is yeah. like the greatest moment I've ever had in my life. And you mentioned Lord <laughs> of the Rings. I was like, I could never watch this ever again without thinking of Kurt just losing his shit at the end of the first movie. <laughs> a, a friend of mine told me he was in uh, Revenge of the Sith, uh, Star Wars, and he didn't know the movies are related to Star Wars. <laughs> really? And he's not what? a fan. Of it. And at the end, it was like, why does he turn into that figure from... Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> it makes no sense. That's, that's crazy, right? 
Wow. <laughs> those, wow. those are what make the Star Wars movie and you don't even realize it. It just <laughs> does make the moments even better. It really yeah. do because you can attach something in addition to what you you just did. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. But fav- favorite movies, let's see. Um um The Godfather yeah. still. Yeah. yeah. Um like the first two. Actually I kinda like the third part. Nobody likes it, but I still like it. Um it's not as good as the other two, but still worth watching. Yeah. Um then what else? Um let's let's um let's uh I'm gonna list the, the 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 classics first. So okay, and then the, my favorite bullshit movies as well. Uh, so oh, you get yeah. all right. At least I, yes. I get some some street credibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you could have just redeemed yourself with the cool ones at the end. Yeah, we thought yeah, you were progressive yeah. and avant garde. We want to hear that. I, I go for the other way. I I, I want to think. Oh, I like Dalton Abbey. What he's talking about, and I'm shattering people's illusions. <laughs> um. I would say, uh, what else? Taxi Driver, I think it's still yeah. one of the best movies. Um, uh, I'm a Hitchcock fan. I, my favorite Whoa. films are uh, Rope, uh, Vertigo, um, The Birds, and what was the uh, Rear Window, of course. Rear um, Window, great. Choices. Yeah. Good choices. And one movie I think is very underrated, Marnie. I think it's a fantastic yes. movie. Mm-hmm. Yes. I work and, with someone um, named Marnie. She was named after the film. Oh, oh wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I, yeah, these uh, movies can watch all the time. I think yeah, they never get old, and you still mm-hmm. see new things and very inspiring movies. What else? Um, I probably have to say the original Star Wars because yeah, just because. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Um, mm, yeah, let's see. Um, hmm, I'm missing something. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I think John and I have the our favorite movie is the same. Yeah. Which is definitely. weird, but it's Blade Runner. Absolutely. Blade Runner, yeah. It's a great movie, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even with I all the controversy see. over the uh, intro and the uh, yeah. the voiceovers, and the same friend who lost it during Lord of the Rings just is still fighting about whether or not Deckard's a replicant or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> that even makes it more enjoyable for me is knowing that it bothers him still to this day. Um yeah. Yeah, then I would say um, maybe favorite movie does not cut it because it's you have to be in the mood for it. But I would still say Mulholland Drive by David Lynch mm. is a very oh, nice. Movie. Nice. Yes. Nice. That's um, a good film. Because, yeah, I mean, it's it's so weird and there's so strong scenes in it, but you don't know what to make out of it. It's it's really, really a mind fuck, I think. Mm-hmm. Most, um, most of this stuff is a mind fuck. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. What is uh, what is the one he did with Dennis Hopper? Is it Blue Suede? Uh, uh, Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. Yeah, yeah that yeah, scene. That's a great movie. When he takes the oxygen, I was just like, "This is so fucked up," yeah. and I just couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like like um, David Lynch's stuff. It's it's different mm-hmm. than anybody else. You really. like Dune? Oh, uh, of course, <laughs> um, The Shining. Oh, nice. The Shining, of course, one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Stephen King hates it, but uh, he's a good writer, but movie's not a thing, I guess. No, uh, most most of his movie, uh, books don't translate well because they're never interpreted well. I know George might have some disagreements about it because he's I mean, a big, big fan of Stephen King. Ones. But I like, I actually like The Shining. The Shining's good. Green Mile's good. Oh, Dude, yeah. yeah. Speaking of, did anybody watch Lisey's story? Yeah. Uh, I, no? okay. Yeah, I, we stopped halfway through. I just was done. No. Okay. <laughs> it's bizarre. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, to continue, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Shawshank, I thought, was good. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That's yeah. Stephen King. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's an Stand entertaining movie. Dark Tower, Stand not so much. Yeah, it's a great movie. I like it. Yeah, so what's funny, John, is you say that we're talking about these trilogies. We're talking about Lord of the Rings, the extended yeah. cut. And then the first thing that popped into my mind was basically when your friend said, Oh my God, this is already done. The first thing I thought of is like dark tower, seven books, 90 minute movie. Like, yeah. What is that about? That movie was, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what, what it was. Yeah. I mean, I, I had read all seven books. It took me three times 
I read the first three books three different times, you know, to finally get my momentum to get through all seven. And then knowing that, oh, it's going to be a movie and then a mini series and all these other, you know, pre-production conversations they had yep. that I was reading about. And then it's like, you got 90 minutes? Like, what? So yeah. you, know what, you know what that movie was, Matt? That was hmm. the uh, end of year budget. You got to spend it or lose it. <laughs> Well, we're going to lose the budget at the end of the fiscal year, so let's just yeah. make this shitty ass movie. Yeah, what they should have done is that they should have just done the gunslingers as a movie and then launched right into a television show. Yes, yeah. and then end it with a movie. Leftover, yeah. If you have leftover money, isn't Adam Sandler doing something? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Honest, in this case, I'd rather watch an Adam Sandler film than, than The Dark Tower. Yes. Oh, God. Yes. Uh, I have to say, <clears throat> this is this comes back to telling you about these horrible shows I watched. Um, I kind of enjoyed Jack and Jill. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's I don't mind that so one. straight up terrible, you cannot believe it. Yes. <laughs> when he plays his own sister, it's annoying from minute one to the end. And so, I kind of get, it's not funny, the jokes are not funny, but... It's funny imagining a person watching this and get mad over it. Like in the cinema, <laughs> I paid 15 bucks for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> they completely lose it. And I think, like, this is fun. The guy yeah. has a sense of humor. Yeah. Got it. Oh, man. Um, you should, you should watch that one with your giant that. wrestler friend, John. Oh, yeah. he, he's a huge movie fan, too. And a lot of times I agree with him on stuff, but he just lost it during that. It's, yeah. So. I have to say, um, uh, one one thing also, um, one movie I really like is Gran, Tur Gran Torino. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah it's a great movie. That's the movie from the yeah. newer movies. Because um, yep. I'm mostly named like older movies. Um, then I have to say, some movies I really like, and I know they're not, maybe not classics. Also for maybe the wrong reasons. Um, there's one, you know, you know the movie Everest? It's about climbing Mount Everest. Oh, yeah, right, like right. Yeah, they yeah. die and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty predictable. But the reason I like it is simply I like mountains. And I've been there. And, like, not on – of course, I didn't climb it because I want to live. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, I was in the area, and it's absolutely beautiful. And, and the way they covered um, – the way they pictured it, it really looks like it's supposed to look. It's not mm -hmm. some – I don't know if you know vertical limit and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's would, supposed to be mm. K2 and it looks, I don't yeah. know. If I'm going to watch a mountain movie, I'm watching Stallone and Cliffhanger. Oh, I, so good. <laughs> so but, good. You know, I, 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 you know, I've, been, I've been to the Him Himalaya and I'm, I'm totally fascinated with that stuff. And the only thing I have to say about Everest is my only thing is like the first 20 minutes they could have just gone hiking a little bit it takes too long. <laughs> they're, they're in the in the base camp already after like 15 minutes what the fuck i mean it takes like five days to get there and like, just yeah. take your time for hey, a couple yeah. pictures and show you things yeah, like, uh, get some pictures it's the only thing i have to say about that movie that i didn't like so much more hiking but yeah. other than that it's it also a pretty intense movie um and <laughs> What else? Um, I kind of have a thing for The Conjuring, especially the second part. And oh, wow. oh, I just watched all three. The only reason I like those films, um, because they're more classical horror movies. I know yep. also it has a bit the retro aspect, but I don't, yep. don't care. But I think they work really well. And I have to say the second movie, I know it's only because when you make a horror movie and you have a great monster, yeah, that's half half the price right yeah. um and, and that nun is is creepy and i like it it's it's uh, it's this typical antagonist yeah. yeah it's it's so well well pictured for me um i know it's kind of a cliche but yeah nothing yeah. Wrong, nothing to argue with yeah. here what, i like that movie what's funny about I, all of those films is that annabelle the doll is actually the creepiest thing yes. in that whole series but yes. people don't think of that uh even though and the funny thing is, is that the doll they use in the movies doesn't look anything like the real Annabelle doll, which I find even funnier. So, yeah. I like the psychological ones. I really like that movie Midsummer. That's one of my favorite yeah. ones. Of the last one. Oh, you should watch That's that. Good. That's good. That's good. Okay. I think you'll, you'll dig it. Okay. It's really it's good. Intense. They have it. They actually. It's really intense. They actually have. Um, they did an extended version of it that you could buy on Blu-ray, and I bought it because I like that movie so much. And I don't usually buy movies. 
but there's something about that film that just is so creepy it's so foreboding and you're watching it it's never um you know jump out scared or anything like that it just works on your head yeah yeah, yeah. sixth sense is a little bit like like those classical horror movies and mm-hmm. i kind of like it i know it's not a spectacular film and the twist i have to say though i was in the movies back then i saw it and sometimes you hear people about saying about the movie uh, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? Maybe from today's perspective, but I was in that cinema, and it's exactly what what I cannot pronounce his name. Um, what the director said. Yes, mm-hmm. what happened um, when he um, test screened it? They all, everybody thought the film is over, and then oh, he's dead, and silence, complete silence. Mm-hmm. Everybody was caught off guard, and it's like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah, no, I think um, a lot of people were surprised by that one. It, it, it worked out. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, and, and that, but aside from that, it's it's some it's a good ghost story. I, I, I kind of enjoy that. I enjoy that more than, let's say, Hostel or some brutal uh, horror movie. Like <laughs> right, 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 right. Saw. Mm-hmm. Saw, yeah. It's entertaining, <laughs> but it's, it's yes. just about brutality. And yeah. the thing with... Um, with actually, on a real here's the thing: why I'm I, the the thing is I'm not afraid of horror movies, and I'm still looking for a movie that really really scares me to the core. Um, I don't know, it doesn't really happen. I kind of enjoy it because yeah. I know it's not real, and mm-hmm. especially the supernatural stuff. I mean, maybe I'm 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 too much of an atheist for you know. I don't know, I, but so, I, I don't believe in anything supernatural, and that's uh, kind of the burden as a horror movie lover. Yeah, because yeah, if yeah, I, you were more open to that stuff, then oh my god, it could happen in my house. And well, that, but I know that nah, it's not going to happen, and that's why I can really enjoy that. But um, with Hostel, I don't know that stuff might actually go down in some weird ass uh, Ukrainian. Mm-hmm. Down down dungeon, yeah. <laughs> hostel, mm-hmm. hostel. Yeah, Rich I will say, paying paying to torture people. I right. totally, totally believable. Right. Totally believable. I think that's really creepy. That's dark and web I, stuff, it, man. So she Americans. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's yeah. not my favorite. It's not in the list of my favorite movies. But just thinking about that. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's actually I find that movie creepier than any of the ghost shit. But I really enjoy the ghost stuff more. So, um, uh, Hannes, have you seen any of the Paranormal Activity movies? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, like you, I love horror, and it's a constant conversation in my home because my wife hates horror. Yeah. And I'm always like, yes, bring it on. I'm not scared. I love it. But Paranormal Activity, the first one, and a little bit of the second one, that was two movies I've actually jumped at. Like, I was startled by. Um, you want to know why? It's because you, if you have your own security system at home, you could – imagine that happening that you're watching your video the next morning you wake up and you're like what the fuck just happened in my house yeah. last night right. that's, that's exactly why that film works <clears throat> which, I agree. which yeah. is also why i have none of that stuff in my home because i'm like <laughs> man i don't want to know what's going on when i can't see it you know not necessarily ghosts but who knows what else is going on in the neighborhood but oh, i want to know because i want to know if those <clears throat> fucking raccoons are jumping on my garbage can and i got to go out there <laughs> and clean up after them at night <laughs> So I do want to know. Yeah, was it high school kids or was it raccoons? Yeah. Oh, it's raccoons. Trust me, I know. I caught them on video. <laughs> I really like Blair Witch Project. That creeped me the hell out because it yeah. just felt real to me. Yes. Yeah. You know. And, and paranormal, paranormal activity has a little bit the same mm-hmm. kind of yeah. how it's yeah. done. Mm-hmm. You know, actually real like home cameras. And found like footage. That. Yeah, the found footage. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think- that has a little bit yeah it's closer though it yeah. doesn't look as nice but you think you're in this thing yep. so yeah actually i have to say yeah sometimes movies that are not meant as horror movies can be a little more unsettling i thought like uh, the village had some really yeah. i love i love the yeah. village actually Same. people hated it because they were trying to figure out the ending and sure. said that they figured it out but i thought it was just really really well done movie i think when you watch his films you just after the sixth sense, after you got tricked the first time, you should probably just not try to figure it out right. going forward. Right. You, always, you end up not enjoying the film, yeah. to be honest with you. Because mm. while the films may not be great, sometimes the stories are kind of interesting. 
you yeah. know, and I, I think I think that's why I like signs maybe the most of his stuff. Mm. Because I wasn't trying to figure out what was going. It was pretty obvious what was going to happen at some point. You just didn't know how it was going to end. But you weren't like the village. You didn't know, well, is this really set back in that time period? Oh, no, it's just a bunch of people who got pissed when they were in their 30s. And they moved out and just started their own thing. You know, oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Damn it. That, that's rich that's people what got I out find of there. really, really great about it. Because um, yeah. they're in this like weird settlement that can only survive because it's guarded by the real world and they yeah. play in their own world being like i don't want to have anything to do with the outside world and it's bad and and stuff like that but it only works because there's the outside world yeah and, and the they created their own evil world shows itself that, shows yeah. that, like oh you can only um live in the forest with no supplies because there are supplies right you wouldn't want to do that when everybody was living like that, you know? Yeah. It's especially, yeah, that's exact the thing that the movie yeah. is, is stating at the end. And, and going back to Forrest Gump, I think the village, that's a clever message. I don't want to overanalyze it or anything, but mm -hmm. you watch the movie, but there's like, it makes sense on a, on a level that is not just entertainment. Mm -hmm. but, uh, with Forrest Gump, it, it's the complete opposite, I think. <laughs> Run, forest, they lure run. you in with this heartwarming story. They lure you in, and you're yes, yes, I yes. Yeah, I really like most of M Night Shyamalan's movies a lot. I don't. So. I don't. I like the first couple of movies, and then I thought Glass was interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I like some... that trilogy. I really like actually. Yes. I think it works yeah. really well, especially if you watch all of them together. Yeah. I want to see that movie old that just came out because yeah. his latest movies yes. have been pretty good. Yeah, I didn't even know he has a new one. But... Yeah, it's called Old, where these uh, these people go to this island and they're like um, aging fast. But he um, he also, I believe, he produces that show, The Servant. Has anybody watched that? No, sounds no. familiar. It's good. I like it. Um, it sounds like another British aristocracy. It's, uh, type it's show. on. <laughs> no, it's, it uh, it takes place, I think, in Philadelphia. Well, yeah, because all his stuff is in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. Um, it it's, on, yeah. it's on Apple TV. It's okay. it's worth a watch. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's only half hour episodes, so it's not a big commitment, you know. Um, okay. That is one thing I struggle with too with some shows. Like man, when, like when each season's twenty four episodes, like holy no. yeah. that's a commitment. Like <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, <that's all. laughs> no, there's there's only one show, and I know Marcus on likes this show too. I know uh, you're gonna there's say there's only one show that I had. I needed like fifty episodes a season for I, I only you. one. Tell me that's supernatural. Yep, uh, I had to have I'm Sam and Dean that. every week. It's just something about I'm those two it. characters. I know it's with the guy from Gilmore Girls. <laughs> yes, that's what's funny about it. Yeah, yes. you probably well, you have 15 seasons to go back and uh, watch. It's just honest. Okay, one it's day. Great. I'm gonna do it. The beginning's oh, not great. I it's... forgot. I forgot a stupid show that I watched. Okay. Um, you might know this designated survivor. With, oh uh, yes, and, yeah, I've seen it. Name, Kiefer um, Sutherland. Kiefer. I was, I was hoping for another twenty-four. Gonna... It's so the first half of the first season, you're like, okay, I can run with this, and then you're like, wait a minute, this is this changing is really is, fast. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Hannes, have you watched the show Twenty Four? Um, no, I have not. I have not. It's kind of it, it, like for me, it's stupid good. Like it's very yeah. cheesy. Like Kiefer Sutherland, like this is his job that he takes it so seriously, like more serious than I take anything in my entire life. You know, like patch that through to my BlackBerry. We're out of time. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I've I've seen all ten seasons, and I was hoping Designated Survivor was going to be a continuation of that, and it just oh, it started out. It's flamed <laughs> like halfway through the first season. Uh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's an interesting. I don't know. It's kind of interesting, but again, here we like in this. Well, it's it, the story to get you know the listeners in the story. Uh, where, for anybody who has not seen it, and don't watch it, um, <laughs> the, the story is um, designated survivor apparently exists. Uh, it's like um, this one politician who has like stayed it is, secure when it is all real. the politicians yeah. meet in Washington. And then the capital gets blown up. And then Kiefer Sutherland is the only guy who survives, like from the head politicians. Like he's minister of something. And here's the interesting part. He's not part of Democrats or Republicans. Like he's 
bipartisan mm -hmm. yeah. or nonpartisan. And slowly he's bringing everybody in and it's a big family. And this is complete bullshit. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is um, <laughs> the end of politics. It's like the opposite of post politics. But that's what people want. Some people are like, oh, can't we just go together and sing Kumbaya? But I mean, come yeah. on, where are you going? it's not <laughs> happening. It's a struggle. And, and, as, and, as someone who lives in DC, like really, yeah. that I was going to say, as somebody who lives in Washington DC, the area, that idea, yeah. they they do do that. They they do hold one actual member of the cabinet back every time mm -hmm. when they meet for that very reason. I think even Tom Clancy's broached that in one of his books. I think at one point. Okay. I think that's how mm -hmm. um, Jack Ryan at some point becomes president. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. So okay. some of, of our listeners know. So so the, the idea is interesting. Show is not even a fresh idea. It's yeah, like, probably not. <laughs> and the I mean, it's an interesting idea, that... but it bottoms it out is. fast. It is, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't really hold longer than no. like three or four episodes, and then at some point it's really getting annoying because also Kiva Southern and well, I mean, I, I kind of like the guy, but it's he, he talks like in this ASMR videos, like you have to bring everybody. In. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so to follow up, with, I mean, to follow what Matt said, you need like to watch. An you need yeah. to watch Twenty Four <clears throat> first, then you so, get it. <laughs> yeah. So okay. are you, the premise of it is like. Every season is 24 episodes, so each episode is basically an hour of his life, and so oh, the whole season yeah, yeah. is the whole season is basically a day of or a, a week of one, his life. No, one day. And I heard he's one day. beating sorry, up yeah. people for no reason. Is that true? Maybe he's beating up a lot of people. Oh for yeah, he's just he's kicking ass and shooting. He's part of the right? counter, he's part of the counterterrorism unit. You're like, there's yeah. oh my god, we got to get on that, you know. And yeah. just... Send it to my Blackberry. <laughs> so a lot of growly yeah. whispering. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. But, but if you go into it with low expectations, you'll love it. Okay, yeah, I guess that's a show for me. When, and, uh, you know, definitely, you'll be, yes. enter you'll be entertained. <laughs> you know, it's hard to see him like that after watching a movie like Dark City, where I yes. thought he was awesome. Same. You know, as this kind of creepy doctor and that. Even, I think flat, even the original Flatliners. Yes. yes. But more so. I also watched the remake, not so good. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. The remake is never remake as good. Uh, actually, I read somewhere that, somewhere that there's a t Titanic 2 movie. It what? exists. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me give you a hint. They probably don't live. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From the iceberg's perspective. Hold, is it a horror film? Hold on. There, there's been, there has been a Titanic too. It's been, what's his name? The director going back constantly to rehash his footage oh, as he does, Cameron. dives a little deeper the next time. So we'll see the, we'll see the Titanic and Avatar too. I, I, I hope there's a cephalopod in it. That's all I can say. Yeah. I like that, Matt. I refuse to watch Avatar because I thought it, no. I just like, this is bullshit. Um, mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, kind of. But still, there's never been made a really great um, uh, Lovecraft movie. No, like, it's, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Agreed. It didn't really manage it, to do it. I don't know. Um, yeah, they've had elements in television shows and movies, but you have never really seen like a straight Lovecraft interpretation that done well no. ever. No, I, I wonder who could do it. I have no idea. Actually, David Lynch would be a good candidate, but he's really old. Um, <laughs> yeah. But he it, yeah, mm -hmm. might not be his thing with monsters, like obvious monsters. So I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong here. But I mean, I, I just think maybe a guy like that, like out of the box, like completely weird. Maybe I, Lars from Trier, maybe a guy like that who could do it. I actually think a Guillermo del Toro would do a good job of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's good. Yeah, he's yes. a little yes. weird. Yeah. Just a tad. Maybe it needs to be like a collaboration, like David Lynch, Guillermo, and Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> All right, M. Night Shyamalan. He can yeah. write the book and then have no say in what in it <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> yes. Whenever he's hosting, like uh, one, like he's oh, uh, he, a lot of the time he's sitting in the back and you know tells what it's going on. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, His ideas guy... of movies is kind of stuck in the 50s, I think. Agreed. Yeah. The movies he grew up with, he likes that. but And I get why he doesn't like Shining. But from, um, yeah, it's well, it's not the book, but that's the point. Yeah, you know, right, films right. are not books. So. Well, Stand By Me is, is my one of my favorite movies of all time. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Same. 
but yeah. wasn't the the remake of the shining was like a like a six hour tv miniseries and yeah to me it almost felt really watered down you know yeah, when you it. have when you have like like when stanley kubrick makes it just leave it alone you know at that point you know don't worry Jeez. about those things the one the one modern modern horror that i really dug that we haven't talked about um did you see get out no nope. yeah, i saw it okay yeah. jordan peele who was on like key and peel which is a completely like it's like a um like a sketch comedy show and then all of a sudden he writes this horror film get out and it's actually it's it's pretty decent i like it actually um, Matt, i know he, you need to go back one story he wrote and starred in keanu oh gosh that, come on how could you not bring up yes <laughs> i totally forgot that if i didn't bring up keanu mm-hmm. my better half would literally kick me out of the house she loves that movie has anyone no. seen keanu is that about a dog or something no it's about a cat, cat. yeah cat. Mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. uh no if you Marcus, I know you, you love cats. You need to go watch this. There, there's just one scene in this. Get that bitch. Do you remember that, Matt? About get that bitch? <laughs> yes. We still say that to our cat all the time. <laughs> okay. It is, it's, the, it's really funny, actually. It's it's not horror. I'll, I'll check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a comedy. I've seen it. Is the cat able to talk? No. So, no. It's long story short, <laughs> he just, you have to see it. I don't want to ruin it because the whole idea of this, this little cat becomes like the center of this whole movie and it's him and his buddy who's been in a ton of stuff too but they play multiple characters in the film and somehow drugs get involved there's a cat involved and it just mm-hmm. de-escalates really fast uh and it but it's it's fun to watch it's silly okay. but fun you'll enjoy it okay and if you I'll like cats you'll enjoy is he it named after keanu yeah. reeves yeah. i don't know but the cat's called keanu yeah interesting yeah i thought the same thing too mm-hmm. so yeah if anybody likes really trashy movies, mm-hmm. like completely trash okay. movies, like oh, Troll Man. Yeah. Troll yes. Man? I have never heard of that. But Troll yeah, Man. I like I like really oh, like C level movies. I feel like sure. I've seen Troll Man. Does he come no, out? No, no, no. Like I'm, the... I'm talking about that production um 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 company, Troma. Oh, oh Troma. Like, Tra- I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, they did uh, this wonderful movie, The Toxic Avenger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. 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 <laughs> I love that. One, unfortunately, I have to add this to one of to the favorite film list. <laughs> yeah. Because it is. It's totally. so fun. Totally. It, it's, oh, yeah. We know, watch, we watch a lot of those. Okay, yeah, I like those uh, super cheap horror movies. Like I don't know. Try a movie. Um, I love this movie. My wife loves it too. Called Black Sheep. It's not the one, the yeah. comedy. Yes. The one where they turn into sheep. You've seen it. It's freaking great. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, I thought it was good. It's from. It's you in New a Zealand. Player in Germany who looks like one of those sheep. Oh, and oh, really? A little bit, and we always oh the sheep is on TV and yeah, <laughs> common sports now, but uh, whatever um but uh yeah yeah i like i like movies like that it's yeah. fun and have you seen a, have you seen dead snow no i don't think so it's a, it's kind of a wacky i can't remember where it's said it might be norway i can't remember okay. now but it, it's like a it's a zombie movie where <laughs> Or like Nazi soldiers who rise, and mm-hmm. it's absolutely freaking ridiculous. And there's the second one too, Dead Snow Two, which is even more that. ridiculous. Oh, nice! So there, you would oh. like those, I think, Hannes. That makes me think of the film with the Nazis where they go to the moon and they're they hide and waiting for like fifty years and then yes. they come back. That's a good one too. And I can't, I can't remember what it's called, but it was way I, over the top like that too. It's called Iron Sky. That's it. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So you like that, you're going to like Dead Snow. I have not seen Iron Sky. I've heard the story and I think like it's intriguing, but uh, I didn't make it long. I'm I'm afraid to watch it. It's like whiplash. I'm just, Mm. I don't want to watch it. um, Because I'm kind of sure I will not like it for some reason. Because here's the thing. when Machete came out um, and everybody was like, oh, this movie is so over the top, so ridiculous. And I knew Toxic Adventure already. And I was really disappointed. Hmm. Because actually, compared to Toxic Adventure, it's kind of believable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it's not over the top at all. And with that Iron Sky thing, it sets, you know, Nazis living on 
the dark side of the moon and yeah. coming with spaceships. I like the idea, but mm, I'm skeptical if if they really played it out well. I'm not sure. Well, I have some reservations. Yeah, but there's only so much you I can do with that I will, story. I know I will have to watch it at some point. <laughs> and maybe, I hope I'm wrong, and none of my um, yeah fears become true. The, it's, but it's with uh, Whiplash. That movie came out, you know, the drummer movie. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Or jazz drumming, and I love jazz drumming. I actually got reason, like... In, during the pandemic, I got uh, back into jazz drumming on, you know, just doing something else because all these shows didn't happen. And uh, but then at some point, OK, this movie is out five years now. And I I always thought like there's something about this thing. I'm probably not going to like it. And but I could not pinpoint it why. And I thought like, OK, now is the time I have to watch Whiplash. And well, the drumming is great. Um, and I hated the movie. It's well done. The actors are amazing. The drumming is amazing, but I hate everything about it. It's um, this. This. It's based on the idea that everything in life is a huge competition, especially music, and you have to achieve greatness and greatness at any level and become, you know, this immortal guy. And the teacher guy, he's abusing also sometimes physically, but also mentally abusing um, his students. And they even like are suggesting that he might have driven that former student into suicide by psychoterror. And you, then at a certain point, he, you know, get gets ditched by the university. And at the end, at the final scene, um, when you see like his former drum student become achieve this level of greatness, become some great drummer, then they justify all these actions. They justify all the things, he, all the abuse, all the mental, all the bullshit. Right. And it's like this, this big, I don't know, almost Iron Rand kind of thing. You have to achieve greatness to, you know. I don't buy that. I don't like it. I think it's, it's, uh, yeah. It, it, at some point, he even has like a car accident and comes out bleeding, and yeah. he still goes on there and plays his thing and think like. This is bullshit. Well, what's the point? I mean, what are you trying to say? Um, the message well, is I, wrong. Because in it, yeah. I thought like it's going to be okay. He's sacrificing everything in life for something that doesn't work out. But in the end, it worked out, and was it was worth all of that? And it was worth the abuse, and it was worth all that because you can now play these chess jobs. And I think this is completely stupid. So, yeah. list of worst films. Probably that's my most hated movie. And that's why I have reservations against Iron Sky because I thought like maybe it maybe they wanted it to be too much of a joke, right? You know the what on, I mean? the yeah, only thing true. I'll say with, to that, Hannes, is that the way it plays out and the way that that character feels because he's gone through that psychological trauma, he might actually feel that way in real life. So as a yeah. movie, it doesn't work because the message is not a positive one. It's not a good message to reinforce. But in real life, that's something that people might go through. Mm, yes, yes, but it's true. But um, then I also think like, but what the movie clearly says to me is, um, if the con if, if if the goal can be reached, then the um, the, con the 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 measures they don't matter. Right. That's really what they tell you. Like. No matter what you what the ends justify, ends justify the means. The, means. the yeah. result counts. The result and for greatness, there has to be made fact sacrifices or victims. Doesn't matter. Right. As long as greatness is achieved, and I think that's and yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think this is not because the message is not positive. Because the other day I watched um, Million Dollar Baby. Oh, I love that movie. Where I'm like, okay, it's it's like rocky with a woman no it's not she yeah she gets disabled and dies <laughs> what yeah it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a the balls at the end yeah. yeah yeah it's like oh your big american dream is not turning out the way you wanted it to be well that's probably the case for most people yeah. you know it, it's, this is closer to reality and i think um but because uh whiplash is kind of whiplash also could be with any kind of thing it could be with bowling or mm -hmm. no it doesn't have to be drumming drumming is just a vehicle to 
to insert some some of this um i don't know life training uh, 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 ideology. I don't like it. I, I, I really think it's it's manipulating through this emotion. Um, that Absolutely. The, that, the, that is really well done by by the actors and uh, like that the teacher guy is amazing um, as an actor. I think yes. I, I, as far as I, I have no idea about acting, but I think it's really good and it it sticks in your head. But I think what they're selling is uh, like a rotten fruit. That's what I'm saying. And I mean. You can totally disagree with me on that, but oh I no, I was playing devil's advocate. Just yeah, <laughs> yeah, I felt that way. And there's only, uh, different ways to interpret movies. Yep, yep. You can also um, say like, this guy is a douche. He, he like ditched his girlfriend, and then he went through all that just to play a couple of swing patterns. Like, yeah, he was a douche. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was kind of yeah. So you know. Well, but should we uh, should we uh, wrap this up, or do you want to keep talking about? Uh, no, movies? we can we can wrap this yeah. up. Actually, we've been talking. I mean, this is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was a movie heads podcast, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We really went off road here. Yeah, so, we do yeah. we do what we want. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, so do we want to get Hannes' uh, Thunderdome? Jay's not coming, obviously. Yeah, then. but first, got to ask one question. Yeah. Is there going to be new Trypticon? I think so. Okay. I, I mean, um, pandemic. We're you know we're apart two countries because we are rehearsed in Switzerland, so we really lost this year because um, uh, we couldn't get over over the border, like or right. with the castle and then rehearsals. Eh. And yeah, it wasn't that easy and. Um, so we really lost that year in yeah, doing right. nothing, the band. Okay. <laughs> but I, I don't see a reason why there shouldn't be new Dropticon stuff. I mean, uh, I'm totally psyched for it. So Yeah, well, we would be too. So yeah. definitely. All right. So we're going to do what three albums would help people get to know you better as a person, Hannes? I have to, I really thought about that and... Again, I I can maybe only maybe only name albums that I worked on. That that works too. Mm -hmm. Because I I, I thought about what um, as a person that would mean which album represents my personality, Mm -hmm. and that's very different from what represents my musical activity or me as a player or my I don't know. mood or state of mind because mm-hmm. I, don't know, I have a lot of things that i like that not do not really represent my character or my i, I don't know if that's even possible with music um hard to tell um because with other albums i i like a lot of stuff but that, that doesn't mean that this had, had anything to do with the way i feel outside of that album right so um I don't know if it tells you something if some let's say if somebody likes this album by the Beatles, isn't that like a common denominator or does it really tell you something about that person? I don't know. I guess it depends on how that album would have affected the person. If it had like a something seminal in their life, do they identify with that album some part of it? But yeah, but it works too on albums that you worked on because clearly you put everything into those albums. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I have to say, of course, uh, the Necrophages album, Epitaph, because it mm-hmm. opened all the doors for me musically. And, and, you know, yeah, I played on that album, and then I joined Obscura. The band was not signed, but two guys of Necrophages were in the band, so we got a deal and then everything else. I really think that is really... I, I was very young. This was my first professional recording. I worked my ass off to make it happen, and that's really something that was like a game changer for me right um, so that's an important album um for me um i have to say um for me as a musician everything i like and everything that i always wanted to do and didn't have the means to do it i would say that all comes together in uh, liquid anatomy by alkaloid at some point i just feel that way i i don't know i did not write everything on that album but um it doesn't matter because the whole thing somehow is um, 
Yeah, that's the album I really wanted to do, um, always. But it, yeah, it's always just a step towards that so far. Mm -hmm. And maybe then some other album I do will change the perspective or that thing I want to do as a musician just changes and has different shapes. But um, right now I have to say like from being a 14 year old kid listening to Rush or Iron Maiden, and have like these epic albums and you know all of that and all the different influences from super brutal death metal to yes and i don't know tori angus and it's everything in there right so that's really like uh yeah fantastic one album i would say and let's say send anger right now um, <laughs> <laughs> um um, the Downton Abbey soundtrack. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they have yes. A soundtrack? That would be interesting. I have to look that up. You know, Hannes is going to listen to that right after this. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not bad. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah. The intro melody, I always liked it, though. What yeah. To say? <laughs> Some good soundscapes. I like it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what else? Um, third album, because um, it has to have the number three. Uh, um, I have to say at some, well, from my own albums, I would say then um, the most important one to understand what I'm doing. I have to say this is a split decision between Omnivium by Obscura and um, my first solo record, I would say. Probably I'm tending towards Omnivium because it's mm. it was more important in my personal development. And this was a time where we we're on tour constantly and somehow I I this is where I kinda managed to create a style in some sense. Where I thought like, okay, this is shaping up as something that is not relating to all the material I listen to. This is a, like a culmination of music I ingested through various channels up to this point. Right. So, and that, that I would say, so I would say these so, three albums. So really, is that like the album you feel like you became the, the drummer that you wanted to be? Not necessarily the drummer. As a right. drummer, I mean, the parts on Epitaph are way more crazy, I would say. Some of them, at least. Right. And, um, but it's not really my personality the way I play on Epitaph. It's it's influenced me, but it's not uh, who I am. But right. it's who I am now would have not been able without that album. So that's you know it's connected, yeah. Um, so that's why I would always name Epitaph as a one key album. Right. Then probably Omnivium too, because it did the same way, but with, with my own comp compositions. But it's like, again, I played on many albums and they were all, all important at some kind of, on some kind of level because you learn and develop new styles step by step. But I see these three have been really milestones on what am I doing in general as a musician. And of course you cannot um, take that away from my personality. We These days we're talking a lot about identity and identity politics and all of that. And as much as I'm open to these ideas, I, it kind of creeps me out because you're taking a random thing and make that your identity. And I think like, um, first of all, I'm a musician and then all the other stuff. Right. You know, or uh, many, many things. And a musician is definitely, and what I do every day is really, really more important to me than any any gender or race thing that I'm involved, but I'm, it's easy to say for me in my position, but still um, that sometimes it creeps me out that um, it, we talk a lot about identities when there's multiple identities and we don't accept the real diversity as humans and fr uh, frame it to one set thing that's obvious that you either see or can relate to it in the group. Mm -hmm. um, not saying I'm against any of that by, you know. Right. Uh, but it's just, um, I think, um, I would say my, when the, when the sentence, you cannot 
exclude my identity from how I am, who I feel or whatever, then I would say, uh, first of all, you cannot take, I'm not, I'm never not a musician. I'm always a musician. And this is not just like some mental thing. I'm Even when I'm going hiking in the, Hima, in the Himalayas, I'm still a musician doing that. Right. And I might look at the mountains and then I'm like, no, little, 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 little. there's a pattern going on. I can never shut this off. I can never turn it up, it, it off. Um, and this is also, yeah, this is a thing. It's um, again saying that some, you know, that's why I understand. On the other hand, um, some of the discussions there because uh, you know, black person they can never sh- change their appearance. Right. They can never change. It. They're always like that. I'm always a musician. It's, it's. Um, but it's well. That's really part of my identity. So I cannot um, deduct the music I do from who I am. And if that makes any sense at all, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think with the the gender discussion, I think it's more about raising awareness and acceptance for all the different types that are out there. You know. So. Yes. Yeah, that's great always a musician i feel that same way i'm always a writer i can't turn it off i'm always going to have ideas for stories constantly wherever i am i had ideas for stories just talking to you so yeah cool great (laughs) so do you want to do the uh thunderdome then john like get how how do since jay's not here to explain it do we want to just get Hannes's your opinion on these albums and we could do all ours with the rest of the guys I mean it's up to you maybe if you if you're not mad at me I would like to wrap this up a little yeah let's do that we can wrap it up and let you go because we've kept you for a long time so I think it's Hannes's fault he wanted to talk about all the television yeah. don't well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we got up we had to talk about <laughs> shitty movies and I was like I'm in that's totally on Hannes yeah yeah so what is your opinion on these uh, two albums which is uh, Iron Maiden, I, Seventh Son of the Seventh Son, and Queen's Reich's Rage for Order. I have to say, with Queen, uh, so let's start with Queen's Reich because they did not. Uh, how do you say Queen's Reich? Yeah, yeah. Queen, Queen's Reich. Okay, um, I don't know if you have seen on it's on YouTube the Chuff Tate um, digital. Um, what is it? like his digital card or something like that. It's a video about where, which he recorded and produced. And I think it's on his channel, but you can find it. I have to look it up and send it to you guys. You will love your ass off putting this out first. Okay. Um, yeah. um, it starts with, you know, Joff Tate being Joff Tate and descri- talking about Joff Tate. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, great thing, mm-hmm. the great thing here is um, it, it starts like, my name is Joff Tate. I'm a writer, tr- father, traveler. <laughs> yeah, I love my life. <laughs> and he really Sounds says fantastic. That this kind of, and you see him ride a motorcycle and drinking wines. I'm, I'm enjoying, I am trying traveling. I'm enjoying good wine once in a while and stuff like that. It's fucking ridiculous. And so, uh, I have to say, with the thing is with Queen Trek, this. Doesn't, it's always in my head when I listen to Queen's and this is such a shame because he's such a great singer. Oh, yeah. But apparently he's a complete idiot. Happens. <laughs> yes. But we have to, this is something in general, we have to separate the pe- persons that make the music and the music itself. And the music itself is good. It's a really, uh, I would say, a good hard rock album. I have to say... Um, Maybe, maybe I like what was the previous album, Operation Mindcrime? I uh, kind of like this one a little better. Yeah, that one came afterwards. Yeah, Operation Mindcrime. It, it came afterwards. Yeah, yeah. The cool. warning was the first one. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, yeah. That's here's the thing. I have a blind spot when it comes to to Queen's Reich because I'm not super familiar. I really like the first EP really a lot. Oh yeah, first EP is great. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And I mean, yeah, the, the vo- vocals are awesome. Um, the arrangements are awesome. Sound is really good. Um, and for me, I would say it's it's a good hard rock album, or classic rock. It's for me, it's almost not really metal. I have to say. Whereas as Iron Maiden, this is for me hard to compare these albums. How can you compare so different albums? Because 
Iron Maiden was really a very important band for me. And especially the 80s records, and especially Seven Son of a Seven Son. I love this record. At first, it was one of these records where I, at first, the first albums I bought were um, Number of the Beast, Peace of Mind, Power Slave. Yeah. And back then, uh, I had to go to a store, and they didn't have all the albums. So I picked the next one they had, which was Seven Son. And no, it was Fear of the Dark. That one I liked too, but not as much as the other 80s records. But I still liked it. And then Seven Sun, I listened to that. And that was a, like a keyboard album. And that's not one of the one, what I wanted to hear at all. Like, right. Keyboard. <laughs> 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 I expected the same stuff. And, you know, again, I'm like, hmm, no, I don't like this. So it's, nah, this is not good. No, no, I'm not buying this. Next day went back and like, uh, I don't know. Listen to it again. I, I don't know. It's got something. And then listening to it to the third time, I'm like, oh my god, it's the best album ever done. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's how they get you. But uh, I think those albums are the most rewarding albums because yes. challenging to get into it because they crash your um, expectation. But you get something different once you accept that it's different. It can be great. And uh, that's exactly the case. I think it has great material. I have to say, um, still, I would say I like Peace of Mind. No, not Peace of Mind. Um, Somewhere in Time, which is the other keyboard album. I like that better. I think it even has better songs. But um, I don't know. Seven Son of a Seven Son is maybe one of their best songs, in my opinion. It's a good one. Yeah, the whole vibe is it's, it's like, uh, I don't know. It was... Like it was recorded in Antarctica. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> fascinating. I really. So for me, I maybe I can even say that Seven Sun definitely is in my top twenty or something. And Rage for oh. Order is not. I, it's a great record to listen to once in a while. But yeah, it's not maybe not so much my cup of tea. So it's a really unfair comparison, I would say. Right. Yeah. I mean that's the whole point of the exercise is yep. we pick these albums that you might not yeah. think of putting together. And um, we were hoping to get Jay's idea for it. I think we think we know what it is, but nonetheless, I think it's interesting because there are two mm-hmm. keyboard driven albums for that, that time for hard rock metal playing that yeah. kind of music was not yeah. common. That was yeah. new. Well, so. there's two albums where they go into very progressive but, territory for both of those bands, yes. I think. It was the first was, concept album for Maiden, too, I think. Yes, but there was Turbo. <laughs> yeah. We don't Actually, talk about I, that album. <laughs> <laughs> we so, See how we got real quiet there, Hannes? So, yeah. As Actually, someone, I kind of like Turbo. It's okay. Uh, yeah, the it's neck is getting good, tight. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so we've come to the end of the cast then i guess <laughs> yes yeah on that note <laughs> okay. no this has been great uh we appreciate yeah. you taking the time we really appreciate very much it. very much we appreciate uh both the music and the television and movie uh views and yeah. likes and dislikes uh we enjoyed all of that so thank you for taking time to to spend with us we know it's late on your end uh so we appreciate that sure and so, we love all your music. Can't wait yes. for all the new projects. And yeah, while we, we only spent a few seconds on New Alkaloid and Trypticon, those few seconds will uh, be the light on the mountain that we look towards in the future. That, okay. uh, we'll be excited for those. Thank you very <laughs> much I for that. I won't disappoint you. So. No, thank you. Yeah. So we have one thing we wouldn't mind asking. If you wouldn't mind doing for us, uh, would you mind doing a bumper for us for the podcast? Which would be That's, just you saying, this is Hannes Grossman and you're oh, yeah. the Metalheads podcast. That'd be great if you could do that for us. Metalheads podcast. Am I pronouncing this right? That is correct. Yes. The. The. Metalhead. Yes. No, I'm Hannes Grossman and you're listening to the Metalhead podcast. Okay. Yes. I think I can do that. Um, okay. Do we need uh, like a countdown or something? We can, yeah. we can do a countdown. Drum beat for me, drums. <laughs> <laughs> drum roll. I can't drum. <laughs> yeah, fine. Okay. And action. What, is, what am I supposed to say again? <laughs> like, Your name. I'm Hannes Grossman, and, and you're I, listening. I want to say, 
I am, and I am sounds like he man. So no, ah, you can do that. <laughs> this is is way better. This yes. is yeah. okay. And action. This is Hannes Grossman, and you're listening to the Metalheads podcast. Perfect. Perfect. Hey, now, can you. you can you do it in a Kiefer Sutherland growly whisper? <laughs> I can. <laughs> Uh, you're gonna do it, I'm in. The sun is, and you're listening to the Metal Apps podcast. <laughs> that was epic. That is epic. And also, I love the close up. That was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. List, listen on your Blackberry, <laughs> patch it through to your Blackberry. You're doing it really well. We're out of you're time. Yes, like that. Exactly like that. We're out That's of time. <laughs> That's really good. You can open up in him anytime. It's Yes. Yeah. So we're hoping that you go back and watch 24 so you could see why we're joking so much about yeah. this. So yeah. I will. I will. Anyway, right. thank, thank you, you again for, for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank yeah. you, Hannes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yes, um, have a good week. You too. You as well. Thanks, you Hannes. Well. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Metalheads podcast, and just want to say you are by far my favorite podcast, and I don't even like metal. And it's because of episodes like this last one with Justin and the ones previous with artists, record shop owners, etc., that you elevate beyond a review show, and you have turned into just a great interview show. Well done. Love the last episode. You guys are great. Keep it up.